Hello, I'm Svetlin Naku from the Software University, SoftUni, and I'm here again for the second part of my Java Foundations full course. I'm very excited to introduce you this second part of my free full Java Foundation course, which teaches important concepts from Java programming, such as data types, arrays, list, methods, strings, sets, and maps, lambda and strings, classes, and objects, object-oriented programming, OP principles, exception handling, and common Java APIs, and prepares you for the Java Foundation's official exam from Oracle, exam number 10811. I'm Svetlin Nakov, PhD, and a famous software engineer, trainer, book author, conference speaker and tech entrepreneur. Just Google my name and you learn more about me and my job as a trainer. And I will teach this course together with my colleague, George Gurgiev, who is a senior Java developer, our winner and experienced programming instructor. In the previous part one from the Java Foundations course, you discovered many interesting programming concepts such as data types in Java, primitive and reference types and type conversion, working with arrays and lists to process sequences of elements, and defining and invoking methods together with method parameters and returning results from methods. Now, in this part two of three from the Java Foundations course, we shall cover the next few course topics. Maps, which holds key-to-value uh, mappings, uh, which are also famous and known as associative arrays in some languages, and sets, which look like maps, but they have only keys. Strings and text processing, uh, and the Java 1 string class, and using String Builder to build uh, dynamically strings uh, in Java, and objects and classes, defining simple classes using constructors with parameters, constructor chaining instance and static members, uh, invoking and defining methods and properties, the getters and setters. Finally, in the last third part of this course, you will learn about, in my next lesson, uh, about the principles of object-oriented programming, OP, encapsulation, inheritance and interfaces, abstraction, polymorphism, and also about exception handling in Java, the try catch finally uh, construct Java exceptions hierarchy and throwing exceptions, and some basic Java APIs, the mat class, random class arrays, formatter, big integer, big decimal, and Java time API. All these topics are essential to your further development as a software engineer, so make sure to solve the hands on exercises in addition to this video. Yes, to learn coding, you should code. That's it. Exercises are more important than the videos, so solve the exercise problems, submit them in the judge, and you'll get practical skills and experience with these course topics, not just knowledge. In case you have a question or difficulty solving some of the exercise problems, or you have a bug and you don't know how to fix this or how to proceed, we are here to help. Join the SoftUni community at softuni.org and ask for free help from our mentors. Yes, you can ask anything about this training and programming in general and you'll get a free answer. Now it's time to go ahead with the course lessons. Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the Soft Unit Judge system where you can get an instant feedback for your exercise solutions. Soft Unit Judge is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or, or wrong. I'm sure you will love the judge system once you start using it. Thousands of students are using the judge every day and I'll show you how um, useful is it for, uh, for you as a beginner in the software development with Java. So you can test your code at the judge system uh, using the link provided in the code lessons and it, uh, it looks like this and you put your code in this field here and you click the submit button and you'll get uh, an answer. I'll get, I'll make a demonstration for you. So you open the judge system and there is a contest, this is called contest, which consists of set of problems. And these problems are uh, here, so you click practice and you choose a problem, for example, this one or this one, and you write your code. And 
in, in IntelliJ IDEA, you paste it here and click Submit. And once the submission is sent, you wait a bit, you click here Refresh, and the result comes here. So your code could be either correct or not. And if it's not correct, you can see what are the mistakes. For example, here the mistakes are that you have one zero in addition, uh, which is not required in the output. So looks like it is correct, but you have one zero exceeding zero that is not needed and you should check, uh, change, change something. So for each problem we give you as a hands-on exercise, we have one separate uh, problem and you paste your code and you submit uh, it to, to check your solution. So the judge system is very, very helpful for you. This is something which obviously doesn't work. So use the judge system because practice is very, very, very important. In fact, people were coding by coding, not by watching videos. So you are highly encouraged to solve your hands-on exercises and submit them in the judge to check them for correctness. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain and demonstrate how to use lists in Java. How to allocate the list using the array list generic class, how to access list elements by index, how to add, modify, insert and delete elements from a list, and how to read, traverse and print a list. Lists in Java are like arrays. They hold an indexed sequence of elements of the same type. But unlike arrays, lists can resize. In this tutorial on Java arrays, along with the live coding examples, your instructor George will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Are you ready? Let's start! Hello everyone, my name is George and I'll be happy to introduce you to the topic of lists in today's lesson. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, as I said already, we're going to talk about lists. Now, what are lists? By this point, you already know what arrays are. So, lists are just a variation of arrays, which allow us to do some neat stuff. And I'll show you how we can do that stuff. First off, we will see what lists are as an overview. We will see their functions. We will see uh, how we can modify them. We will see what they have in common with arrays and how we can use them the same way as we do arrays, but with some additional features. Then we will talk about how we can manipulate those lists, remove elements from them, resize them and so on. Then we will start talking about how we can read lists from the console and how we can print them on the console, just like we have done with arrays. And a new topic, which will be somewhat different than what we've seen already, will be what sorting is and how we can do that to lists and how we can do it to arrays also. So, the topic of lists. First off, before we start with uh, what we need to study itself, let's talk a bit about what we already know. So, let's get an IntelliJ uh, ID here and see what we have currently in our knowledge base. So, by this point, we have created arrays. What is an array array? An array is a sequence of elements which have indices and which have a size, a number, a length. So, how do we create an array? We say what data type we want and then we write the identifier of the array. So, let's say we have an array of words here. We will create the array words. And I'll say that this array is initialized by a string array which contains the elements hello, hello, and world. Okay, and let's format this with control alt l. And I've got this words array here now initialized. Okay, so what we know we can do with these arrays is get elements of them, set elements of them, and also we can iterate the elements given the length of the array. Otherwise set, we can say, do a for loop starting from i equals zero to words dot length. Okay, so these are the properties we have of arrays. We have their length and we have access to their elements using this operator with the square brackets. We can say words square brackets 
i and we can tell this element to get uh, a value set to it or we can use the value of this element and for example print it to the console okay well since we can do these things how can we tell this words array to increase its size for example we want to add another word to it like the word uh, by how would we do this well if we just add it to the initializer that's okay the array will become three elements but what if we want to get this words array to three elements after we've initialized it so let's say uh, we've done something with this array like the code we had here let's say we just printed it to the console here system dot out dot print line will print each of the elements of this array due to the for loop on the console and let's say after we initialize this code we want after the print step to change the size of this array let's say we want to add one element to it how would we do that can we do that in java well, the answer is no, and the answer is no not only in Java, but in pretty much any other programming language that has the concept of arrays. Arrays are sequential bytes of memory. They always will contain sequential bytes of memory in the RAM of the operating system. So if, we, if you have an array, you can't really extend it. Why can't you extend it? Well, let's say we have, uh, let's say this blue rectangle represents our uh, array. Uh, I mean our uh, RAM memory, our operating memory, and let's say we want to uh, create an array in it, like we have now, which has the words hello and wrote in it, and let's say we want to take up some additional space here, let's say we want to take up space for an, an, an additional string, how would we do that? Well, we can't, even though we know which, the, which byte is directly after our array, we can't be sure that some other program hasn't taken up this space already. Meaning that, for example, uh, PowerPoint at this po moment could be hogging up this part of memory and we can't just extend our array into that part of memory because we would eat up PowerPoint's memory or whatever other program could be executing there. And even if no program is executing there, that's not something our program can know. Consequently, we can't afford to uh, optimistically take up memory right after our array. So programming languages don't have the ability to resize arrays. They can't extend them and they can't uh, reduce them because what would happen if we uh, have a sequence of memory, uh, an array in the RAM memory of our system and we decide to delete the element in the middle. Well, the array won't be consecutive anymore unless we do an operation in which we move each of the following elements one index to the left or reduce their index by one. Uh, the, the, the array won't be consecutive. So you can't really resize an array. Now what you can do, since you can do anything with programming, if you know what arrays are and what loops are and what uh, conditional statements are, what you can do is create a new array and copy the elements from words into that new array. So what I mean is you can create a new string array, let's call it string extended, and create it with a size that is one larger than the size of words, i.e. we can say words.length plus one. Okay, and then what I do is I'd start a for loop starting from zero and continuing on to words.length not to extended dot length because I want to access all of the elements of words. And I'd say extended at position i, set words at position i. Now what happens at this point? Well, we have an extended array that contains three elements. Well, four if we don't delete this by we added to the initializer in words. Okay, so we have this extended array. It has three elements, whereas uh, the words array has two elements. So this is our words array and this is our extended array. So extended array will now have the elements of words copied into it. And it will have an additional empty space which will contain the no string, i.e. it won't contain anything. And we can use that space to add the value we want. For example, if uh, the task we have is read a string from the console and add it to your array. This, this is how we do it. So we'd read a, 
string from the console, for example, let's call it input, and we'd say uh, create a scanner and tell the scanner to read the next line and tell the scanner to read from system.in. And I'd say extended, uh, set the last element. How would we set the last element of extended? Well, we will get extended.length minus one and set that to input. Okay, and once we've done this, extended contains a copy of words and its last element is what we've read from the console. And now, after we have this extended array, we can simply say words equals extended. What will this do? Well, that will say the words variable will now point to the memory that was allocated for extended. So both extended and words will point to the same memory. And effectively, we've increased the size of words. Although we haven't really increased it, we've just created a new array and copied elements into it. And that array is one element larger. So that's how you add elements to an array. If you want to add an element to an array, you have to create a new array, copy each element of the old array into the new array, and then uh, add whatever element you want to the end of the array, and then tell the array, the original array, i.e. rewrite the original array, uh, to point to the memory of the extended array. And now if you want to uh, add create a method for this, let's say uh, this will be a parameter here, the input, and we'll call it uh, item to add. We can now come over here, mark this code, press Alt R, invoking the refactor menu, press X, invoking the extract menu, and press M, invoking the extract method function, and say um, add item. Now what happened here, we didn't, yeah, I didn't mark the part which adds the item, hence that wouldn't have been the full code I wanted. So let's do this again. Uh, I'll say add item. The first parameter of add item will be the array to which we want to add an item. And the second parameter will be the item which we want added. Okay, so what will IntelliJ generate from this? Well, we'll have an add item method which will return a string array. And we can now just simply say, ex instead of creating an extended array, we can simply say words equals add item of words item to add. Or we can simply copy this uh, item to add, copy this code directly into the method. So what we did now was create an array, initialize it with two items, and then create a method which takes the array, generates new memory for it, copies all of its items into the new memory, and then adds a single item to it, and returns the array that was created. Okay, so this is how you add an item to an array in one line of code. Of course, it isn't exactly one line of code, it's a method which we had to implement. Okay, in addition to the fact that we had to implement it, there's another problem here. Uh, say that you want to add a lot of items. You don't know how many. You, you will, for example, the, the task will be uh, read items from the console, read strings from the console, until you reach the string end. Well, what would we do in that case? Well, we would do a while loop. While what? Well, we will need to read the input. So we'll get the scanner we create it over here. And we'll, instead of reading directly from it, we'll save it into an into a variable. We'll just say scanner equals new scanner reading from system.in. And with the scanner, we'll read a new line, save it into a line string variable, and, and we will say until line becomes uh, end, the string end, so until line dot equals the string end, but we don't want it to be equals. We want the while loop to continue until we have a mismatch here, meaning that um, uh, meaning we want while to execute if the string isn't end. So the, the task, let's reiterate the task. We will have input, which looks like this. We will have lines, which will contain words, for example, word one, then hello, then goodbye, then uh, what's up, 
and then we will have end. Our task is to read all of these words. We don't know how many of them there will be. We just need to read all of them and let's say reverse them, print them to the console reversed. How would we do that? Well, let's see. We have a line here, which we're reading from the console, and we're going to say until like until the line equals end, meaning continue if the line doesn't equal end. So if we read a line and that line is worth one, that doesn't equal end. So we need to get into the while loop. Okay, so what will we do now? We will say words equals add item words and the line we just read. So what this loop will do, it will read line by line. Oh, and we'd also need to say line here again equals scanner dot next line, meaning read the line, read the next line, and then read the next line, and then read the read the next line until line becomes equal to end. Okay, so read line by line and add item to add items to words. Okay, and what we also said is we want these words printed uh, in reverse. Reverse. And let's remove this initialization of words which we used for the example. We will just uh, have uh, words become a new string array of zero elements. This is also possible. You can create arrays of zero elements. Usually you wouldn't do that because you can't write any elements in them. But in our case, where we don't know how many elements we're going to be adding, we can create an array of zero elements and start extending it through the addItem method. Okay, so we have the code that reads item by item from the console, i.e. line by line from the console. And now we have to just print our words array onto the console. So we start a for loop or we can just say words out and enter iterate. And this will generate a for loop for us a for each loop in Java, which will pass through each word of the words array. And now we can print this word on the console. And now you'd say, OK, but George, you said we want them printed in reverse. OK, so it won't be a for loop. Uh, it won't be a, uh, for each loop. We will just replace this with an indexed for loop. You can do that from IntelliJ. You can say out and enter on the for loop and then select replaced for each loop with indexed for loop. And this will generate an indexed for loop. And we want not to iterate the array from start to finish. We want to iterate the array from finish, meaning from the last element, which set index length minus one, to the first element, which is at index zero. OK, so here we get the word. And now we want to print the word. And let's say we want to print it on the same line with the space after it. OK, so what will this code do? Well, this code will execute as many times as there are lines that don't contain the string end in them, meaning that aren't equal to end, not just contain. So if we have friend, this will continue to execute. Let's zoom the console a bit. This will continue to execute. Now we can say number. Now we can say hello. Now we can say uh, how long is this going to go on. And then we can say end. And now once we've printed end, we, ah, oh, what did we get? We got an index out of bounds exception. Okay, so something was wrong here. What was wrong in our code? Well, we can use the stack trace we just got. We can click it and that would navigate us to the line that failed. Now, what you should have noticed by this point is the for loop I just wrote doesn't reduce its value, it increases its value. And since our check is if i is larger than zero, larger or equals to zero, well, what would happen here on the second iteration of the loop, on the first iteration, i would be words.length minus one. That's OK. And we'd print the word. OK, but after that, what will, and you see that the string we got here, what's how long is this going to go on, which is the last string in the input besides end. OK, but on the next iteration, what happened? Well, I became words.length because previously it was words.length minus one. OK, and this generated an index out of bounds exception. And we're going to fix that by doing what we initially wanted to do, which was start from the end and reduce the index until we reach zero. So that was our issue. And this is how we found it. We used the stack trace to see where the problem occurred and just 
we will now start the code again and execute the same same input friend number how long is this going to go on and end and what happened now oh uh, we got yes this this is what we should have gotten how long is this going to go on then we got number then we got friend these are the inputs which which we added uh, you can ignore this error up to this point this is a problem in my environment settings it, it isn't related to the execution of our program it is related to the um, after the execution of the program program so it's not uh, an error caused by our code this is the output we which we wanted to see by the way if, if i start it in run mode instead of debug mode it won't get give us this error okay so we learned how we can add an item to an array is this what we wanted well no we want to learn about lists but what why did i show you this example i showed it because i wanted to illustrate how um non-optimal adding items to arrays is notice what would happen on each execution of this for loop we would read a read a line and then we would increase the size of the array by one meaning we would copy all of the elements which we currently have and write them to a new part of memory and then use that memory as our words array and then we'd repeat it again and again and again meaning that how many items we add each time we have that many items being copied or that many items minus one being copied each time we have to execute n, uh, n operation operations where n is the size of our array currently so this is pretty slow since we, each time we uh, spin up a for loop to copy items on each adding of an item we need to copy all other items instead of just adding a single item okay so to save us from this problem and, so, and to save us from writing code this way, what we can use are lists. Now, lists are a concept from uh, data, structure, data structures, which are a subset of computer science. And a list in Java is initialized in the following way. It's pretty much the same as what we have for arrays, with the exception that you don't begin with the type, you just say list which is the data structure and then in this these less than and greater than brackets and we will begin calling them brackets even though they're mathematical signs in programming these are called template brackets or generic brackets so inside these brackets we will say what things we want our list to contain the same way when we create an array we say what type the elements of this array need to be well here we just mark the uh, type of the elements inside the list and we initialize it with this phrase we say new the same way we say for an array initialization and we say array list now don't worry about this it will become become clear in a few moments what this means why why this is array list and the variable is a list i will explain this in this part of the lecture but let's see how we initialize them first and then we will explain what each part of this means okay so we initialize a list of names in my example it was words by saying new array list these brackets again although we can keep them empty or you can write string here it's okay if you do but it's not necessary since we've already told java that our list contains strings okay so uh what can we do with this list? Well, let's see it in code. We have an example in the PowerPoint slides, but we can use the code as well. So instead of creating an array of words like we have here, we would create a list of strings. So this list of string, uh, not of strings, list of string, the data type is string, and we will place that data type inside the list. Okay, so how would we create them? You remember what you saw on the slide, a new array list. We are creating a new array list. And now instead of doing this complicated add item routine, we can just say words.add and add whatever we want to add to this list. For example, this will be line in our case. So words.add line does pretty much what we did in this add item method 
However, it does it faster, it does it with somewhat different code, but the effect is the same. Words will have an item added to its end. Notice that I haven't given any size here. So this words list doesn't care what size it needs to be. It determines its size by the number of elements you add to it. So you don't need to uh, provide the size before initializing the list. That's the whole point of the list, actually. It's a data structure that allows you to add items optimally to its end uh, without needing to know how many items there will be in the input. OK, so uh, continuing on from here, how would we print these items? We've already added them to this list. And we have a for loop here that tries to print these items. But as you see, the list doesn't have a length. And it can't do this operation. However, it actually can, but the syntax is a bit different. So lists are the same thing as arrays. Lists internally are represented by arrays. They're not something magical uh, that uh, you can't implement on your own. And we will study how we can do stuff like that. But for now, we just need to learn the syntax of these lists and how we can use them the same way as arrays. So everything you've seen in arrays, you can do to lists. You can get the length of a list. However, the method you need to call is size instead of length. And it's a method you call it. You place uh, brackets after it. OK? And everything else remains the same on this line. The for loop is the same as you would have a for loop in a normal array. OK, and how do you get items from it? Well, you don't use these brackets. You use dot get. And again, you have to provide an index the same way as you would for arrays. OK, so this is all the change. These are all the changes we need to do to our program. And it already does whatever it could do with words, with, uh, with arrays but it does it more optimally and it does it, does it with less code. We aren't using this method here right now. We don't need it. OK, so let's start the code again. So you can see that the execution is the same. And I can input friend like I had before. I can input number and I can input uh, something shorter than how long is this going to go on. Lists. And then I'll input end. OK. Here is my output, the same output which we had previously, the same output as an idea. Of course, this value is different. OK, so the same output, but uh, using a data structure which provides an automatic add operation. So what we have to know by this point is that lists are initialized in this way. You mention the data type you want to store in the list in this type of brackets after the list uh, name, and meaning after writing the name of the list class, which is list. So you say list, then you open brackets, you choose a data type you want to put in that list. In this case, it's strings. OK, you write an, an identifier for the variable, the same way you would do for an array. And then you say new array list and these brackets and these brackets after that. Now, this syntax may be a bit weird, and I'll explain the differences between array list and just list in a, in a few moments. But this is the initialization. And from then on, you use it as a normal variable, the same way you would use a string variable, the same way you would use um, an integer variable, and so on. You can uh, assign values to it. You can get, get, get values from it. And you have the list functionality, which is adding items. You have the size of the list, which is words.size, and you have a getter which returns the value of an index, i.e. it returns the element at that index. OK, so let's see what other functionality the list has for us. So we already saw the add method. This allows us to add items to our list. And there are also functions like remove. So we can tell a list to remove an element, meaning that if we've added these three items and then say remove from this string, well, this string will not be present in the list after the execution of this method. So this removes an element and reduces the size of the list, another thing we couldn't do with arrays. OK, and we can iterate a list the same way we can iterate an array with the for each loop i.e. the same way we did a for loop, we can also do 
a for each loop. So you can say words out and enter iterate, and this would create an iteration of the words. Only this will be uh, sequ sequential access to the elements, whereas our for loop here is in reverse. But the concept is the same. Okay, so you can iterate words, uh, you can iterate lists the same way you can iterate arrays. Okay, so continue, continuing on from here, what uh, else can we do with lists? We can use integers in lists or doubles or chars or booleans and so on. Now, before we study this code, let's uh, give some attention to the concept of using integers in lists. So, when we want strings and lists, nothing special happens. We just uh, use the name string. If we want integers, however, we don't say int like we do when we create variables. There are reasons for this, but Java basically doesn't support these so-called primitive types, int, double char, float, uh, byte, and so on. It doesn't support them as this type of parameter, which appears between these angled brackets, between these template parameters. It doesn't accept them as template parameters. Okay, so how would we use them? Can't we create a list of numbers? Well, we can, but we need to use the full type name, i.e. we need to write integer with a capital I. The same goes for double, i.e. you wouldn't write double like this, you would write it with a capital D, and so on. Any type you want, which is a primitive type, you need to write the corresponding full type name, the, the, the class name of that uh, primitive type. So for char or char, this would be character, character. Now, this is how you create them. How do you add items to them? Well, the same way you add items to a list of strings. Whatever the data type is, the lists behave the same way. They don't care what you place in them, the same way that arrays don't care what you place in them. Okay, so let's call this numbers, and if we want to add, un add numbers to this list, we'd say just numbers.add of the number you want to add, for example, 42, or numbers.add 13, and so on. And the logic remains the same. You can iterate them the same way, you can get the size the same way, and so on, and so on. Okay, now what do we have here? We have initialization of an array list with syntax similar to how we can initialize an array. And before we actually see uh, this syntax, let's talk about how we can create an array, i.e. create an array from some uh, fixed set of elements and convert it into a list. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can create an int array, uh, int array numbers, numbers array, and we can say that this array is a new int array containing the elements 1, 2, and 3. And we can do a for loop. We can then create the numbers list. And we can create a for loop which iterates the numbers array. And for each number in the numbers array, we can add it to the numbers list at number. So this is how you copy elements from an array into a list. Okay, so that's one way. Let's say we have our string array like we did before. So we have a string um, array words array, and it contains the words hello and goodbye. Okay, and Let's say we want to set these values to the list directly. So this list of it will be strings, list of strings words equals new array list. But let's say we don't want to use this uh, for loop. We want to do this directly. Now you can do that for strings. You just say this array, this is an array and this is a list. So to convert this array into a list, you say you pass it as a parameter to the array list as an arrays dot as list of words array. So what we say here is create a list from the words array. And this creates a list and this list gets copied. This new array list function um, creates a new portion of memory 
and this portion on, of memory gets assigned with the values from the words array. This is the syntax you need to use. You can't just pass in a words array because array list can't process arrays, but it can process other lists. So basically what we're doing here is copying a list, which is the words array converted to a list, copying that list into a new part of memory, which will, will equate to our words. So our words will contain a copy of the words array in a part of memory. Okay, so can we iterate them? Of course, we can do words dot iterate and print them the same way we did before. So this is just part of the initialization. Now you could do this thing. You could ignore the new array list part. And this would work the same way. We could still iterate the words and we can still print them. However, if you decide to add elements and you've initialized words with an array list, with, an, uh, with a list that, is, that covers an array, if you use a converted array as a list, adding items won't work. Why won't it work? Uh, let's say this is word. Why won't it work? Well, because this is still an array. It acts like a list. That's why we say arrays.asList. It makes it act like, an, like a list. But it isn't really a list in the sense that it can't add items, it can't remove items. It can access items, it can um, get values and set values of items, but it can't uh, change its size the same way an array can't change its size. So that's why we write new array list around this arrays.asList so we can get a copy which is an actual array list and that array list can add items and can remove items. You can des test this at home or wherever you're programming uh, to see what happens in the different uh, variations of this initialization. Okay, so this is how you convert an array to a list. Now, what you can also do is instead of creating the array, you can just say arrays.asList and list the items of that array here. So you can say hello and goodbye and remove this array. This has the exact same effect on words, which it would have had if we had the words array and converted that. So arrays.asList works if you just pass it the sequence of parameters and it also works if you create an array and pass it that array. This is pretty much equivalent for our purposes. Okay, so this is what we have in the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so removing elements always accepts an index. So if you want to remove an element from a list, you say words dot remove, and you can say which index you want to be removed. In addition to indices, so the default position is removing indices. So in this case, if we now print the list, if we say words dot iterate, what we have here is just the goodbye string. So system system dot out don't print line of word. Let's print the word. What would we have on the console? We'd see just goodbye. Why? Because we removed index zero from the list. Here we have only goodbye, even though we've added hello and goodbye. Why? Well, because hello is the index zero and goodbye is index one. So when we say remove index zero, index one becomes index zero and index zero is no longer there. And the size of the list is now one, not two, like it was before. Okay, you can also say words dot remove and pass in a parameter which equals a value in the list. So you can say remove goodbye instead of removing zero. Now this would search in the list and find where goodbye is located and remove that index. So now when I start the code, you would see uh, only hello printed on the console. Here we go. Okay, so we've got that covered. And if you have, now what happens if we have a list of integers instead of a list of strings. Well, let's say this is a list of integers and these are shift and F6 allows us to rename. These are numbers. And let's say these numbers, numbers are one, two, and three. 
Okay, so now when we say remove one, what does that mean? Does that mean remove uh, the index or remove the number? Let's just complete the code in number in numbers print line this number. Okay, so what does remove mean when you provided an integer parameter and your list contains integers? How do you how does Java know if it's supposed to remove that index or that value? Well, Java defaults to the index. That's why in the beginning of the remove description, I said you always supply an index. So the default behavior, if you supply an integer, is for that to be an index. Now, if you want to remove the element, what you need to say is numbers.remove integer.value of, and here you place one. Now, the reason for this is this is a different signature than the signature of remove with just an integer because inter integer dot value of returns an integer object and when the list of integer objects sees remove by an integer object it knows that that means remove the element that has that value not remove that index so the signature of remove there are two signatures of remove one signature of remove is the type you've written the Okay, so first signature of remove, remove is just int index. So this removes by index. The other signature of remove, we've talked about uh, signatures before. The other signature of remove is, in this case, it would be integer element or value, or let's say value, that would be uh, a bit more clear. So this is the other signature of remove. So this removes by value. And notice what we are, we're doing here. We're saying integer dot value of one. This will create an integer object meaning that when that integer object is passed to remove, the version of remove which will be called is the version that accepts a value, not an index. Okay, so I hope that's clear. If not, just remember that if you want to remove a value, you need to say value of, of the value. If you're using integers, anything else, you can just remove the value by providing the value. And if you just provide an integer, that's always the index which you want to remove. So what will this remove? Well, this will remove index one. So this is index one here. It will remove the value two. Whereas remove integer dot value of one will remove index zero because value of one means this element, the element that has a value of one. And Java will go find where this element is allocated and remove that. Okay. And this removes the first occurrence of this element. So if this element appears again, you would have to remove it again if you want all of the items to be removed. How you do that? Well, here's a hint. Remove returns a Boolean value, which says whether remove found something to remove. So how would you remove all items of this value? Well, pretty simple. You see if remove found something, and if it did, then there's pro there could be something more which needs to be removed. If remove didn't find anything, well, you don't need to continue on. But if it did, you have to run the remove again. And then guess what? You do it again and again and again until found becomes false. So what's that? That's a while loop. So pretty much while numbers dot remove this value, execute. You can decipher what this code does. Uh, at home, but I just explained it before writing it, so you should be able to do it on your own. Okay, so this is the remove function. We have the add function, which we already saw. You, al you also have a function which is add that accepts an index. This just inserts the item at that index instead of inserting it at the end. So basically what you'd have happen and we have examples here, which I'll show you in a while. If you say add at index 0 minus 100, minus 100 will become the first element in the list. Okay, and it will push all other items to the right. So if you have, if you have the list 1, 2, and 3, and let's say this list is named just list, and you say list.add at index 0 minus 100, what would happen is that 1, 2, 3 would become minus 100, 1, 2, 3. 
So add just pushes everything to the right. This index, it pushes it to the right. You know, this was index zero. Now it's index one. And in its place, it places the number which you provide here. Okay, so this is how you use the add function if you want to insert at a certain position. This is how you use the remove function if you want to remove an element. And this is how you use the remove function if you want to remove a value. You use value of. Okay, so lists are pretty much data structures from computer science. A list has this functionality which we already saw. It also has the contains method which answers the question is an element contained in the list by its value. Sorry, so if you have hello and goodbye if in a list, if you say uh, list.contains goodbye, it will return true. Okay? And we also have set. This is the only method which we haven't uh, seen yet. This just changes the value of an index. This is the equivalent of setting an element in an array. So if you have an int array numbers array, which is a new int array of 1, 2, and 3, just like we have on the line before that. If you say numbers array position 0 set value 42, this is the same as saying numbers, the list, dot set at position 0 the value 42. This is what set does. It changes the value and it is the absolute equivalent of accessing an element by index in an array and setting its value through the equals sign. Okay, so that, that's what a list supports. That, these are the primary operations of a list. And there are different variations of lists. What we're studying now is the array list. This is the uh, type that can automatically and optimally add elements to its end. Now, array list is a type of list. So you can have list, which is your variable, but this list can be an array list. It can also be a linked list and a lot of other options in Java. So what we write to the right of the equals operator, the assignment operator, what we write here after the new keyword is the type of list we want. Whereas we just say this is a list for the variable and use the type of list we want when initializing it. You can study, you can play around with the other list types, although we won't be needing them yet for this uh, lesson. Okay, so uh, this is the difference between array list and just list. Array list is a specific type of list, whereas just saying list means that you want something here in this variable that is guaranteed to have this functionality. Anything else the array list adds, you don't care about that if you just say list here. By the way, you can also say array list here, but in general terms, it's better to use the more, um, the more abstract version of the type you're creating. So for array list, linked list, and so on, you would mostly use a list unless you have some specific reason for accessing additional functionality that array list provides but we won't be using that for this lesson, so we will study it further on. Okay, so this is the data structure, and here we have some examples of how it works. So adding an element just increases the size of the list, the dot size of this list of integers, and appends always to the end. If you just say add, it adds to the end of the list. Okay, what does remove do? Well, it searches for an element, if you say remove value of value of 10, it will search for this element, find it here, and then pop it out of the list, which would reduce its size. And all items to the right of the list, or upward from, um, not from the list, from the position which you removed, will be shifted to that position. So uh, elements to the right will be shifted left. Okay. And if you're adding at a certain index, in this case, if we're doing add at position one, the value minus five, like we're be, we'd be doing in this animation, what would happen is minus five would go here. Why would it go here? Well, because this is index zero, this is index one, and adding pushes all indexes to the right or upwards. So this will go here. 
push the element 2 to index 2 and we'll insert minus 5 in this position. So let's see it in action. It pushes it up and inserts the minus 5. And again, the size increases. Okay, so we've covered the basics of lists. From here on out, we just have to cover how we can read them from the console, write them to, to the console, and that will be pretty much similar to what we're doing with arrays. So let's have a break and we'll continue with reading and writing afterwards. And now we're going to talk about how we can read lists from the console and how we can write them to the console. Now we already actually did parts of this, but let's uh, do it in a more consistent manner and study the various ways in which we can do these operations. Okay, so one option you would have when reading lists from the console is doing it the same way you do it with arrays. So if we have an int array called numbers, what we do for this int array is we usually read a number of elements, let's call it n, and say this uh, number n, first we need a scanner of course, a new scanner that reads from system system.in Okay, so this scanner is a new scanner that reads from system.in and we'd say the number of elements is equal to scanner dot give me the next integer in the input. Okay, and then we'd initialize an array which contains that many elements, a new int array which contains n elements, and then we do a for loop starting from i equals zero, continuing to i less than n, and we'd read each item of the, the int array. So we'd say numbers at position i receive the value of what? Scanner dot give me the next integer from the input. Okay, so this is how we read an array and this should hopefully be clear up until this point of the course. So uh, what do we do if we have a list? Well, something similar. We wouldn't create a numbers array, we'd create a uh, list out of, you remember that we need to use the capital I integer class here instead of just int, numbers, which is a new array list. And that's pretty much it for the initialization. We continue n times in this for loop and we do numbers.add scanner give me the next integer. Notice that we don't care about the index here because add automatically adds at the last index. So this gives us the same result for the list that it would give us for the array. Okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well, one optimization which we can do is since we already know the size, we can provide a hint here in the array list constructor. This initializes an array list we can provide a hint of how many elements there are going to be in our list. Now, this doesn't limit the list to that number of elements. It doesn't mean that we can't resize it further on. It doesn't even have to be anything. It, it can be zero here. No problem. The list will resize itself. But if you add a number here, which is close to the number of elements that you will actually have, this adding of numbers in the integer list will be a bit faster. Not by much, but it's still an optimization, which if you can do it, why not do it? But it isn't uh, necessary at all. So this is one way of reading a list of numbers from the console. It's the same thing as you would do with uh, an array. So we won't talk about that anymore. So the interesting stuff is when you want to read a list from a single line. So you have an input like so. You want this input to be uh, added inside the list. How would you do that? Well, we've done that for arrays already, so let's do it for lists. Shouldn't be that hard. Lists seem a bit easier to use than arrays, aren't they? Because you can always add elements into them. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we just say um, we have a numbers list. Let's not read the number of items because we won't have them in the input. We will have something of this sort and I'll even copy it so I can reuse it and I'll place it in a comment in the code so I can easily copy it around. Okay, so I have a scanner here that's going to do the reading for me and I have a numbers list. 
Now, what I do know about this line is exactly that, that it's a line. It ends with the new line symbol. Well, what functionality can we use in Java to read an entire line? Well, the scanner dot next line or yeah, the, the scanner dot next line function reads the scanner dot next line method is the more appropriate term reads until it reaches a new line symbol. So when we reach this end of the line, we will have a string which contains all of the symbols from this line. So let's have the line here. Okay, so now we have a line of numbers. How do we convert them into a list, into a list of integers at that? Well, what we do is we want to convert this line into pieces that are separated by spaces. We've already done this for arrays. What uh, does it look like? Well, it's line.split and here you provide what you want to split by. Uh, this regular expression here which we provide can be just a symbol simple space by which we split or it can be a more complex uh, description of how we want to separate the items in this line but for now we will just use the split by spaces because that's we want that's what we want so what does split create well if i don't know i can just say um, split line this is the split line a line that is split into parts and i can say out and enter and this will allow me to create a local variable and IntelliJ will automatically uh, describe what the data type of this variable is. Okay, so it's a string array. How do we con convert a string array to an integer list? Well, I already showed you how you can copy items from an array to a list. You just use a for loop. So you say split line, iterate, out and enter after split line, we'll iterate them. And these, this will iterate each item in this split line. Okay, so what do we do to add it to the list of numbers? Well, I just need to say numbers dot add item. However, item isn't a number, it's a string. But it's a string that represents a number. So I have, for example, quotes 2 or quotes 30 or quotes 40 or, and so on. Okay, how do we convert such a thing into a uh, number? Well, I just use the integer dot parse int method in the integer class. Okay, so this will convert our string two or, or our string 30 or our string eight and so on into an integer number and that integer number I add to numbers. And then I can do something with numbers. For example, I can uh, print them to the, to the console. So I can say uh, numbers, out and enter, iterate. And for each number in numbers, just system.out.println this number. Now notice, by the way, that IntelliJ generated the full class name. Let's say that the full class name isn't the exact term we should be using here. But for the purposes of this lecture, when I say full class name for primitive types, I mean this capital case, um, capital first letter, full word uh, descriptions of the types. Uh, once we've talked about classes and objects, full class name will, will mean something different. Okay, so this integer number, we can convert it to an int. This conversion happens automatically in Java. So wherever you're uh, getting an integer, you can change it to an int. And if you have an int integer somewhere, you can provide an int there and Java automatically converts them. The only restriction is inside these brackets, you need the capital case thing. Okay, so this is our printing and this is our reading. Let's say if it works, we can start the code here and see what it does. We'll wait a bit and now I'll copy this input which I got from the slide and I'll paste it into the console. Now, when I hit enter, we will do the split operation. First off, the scanner.nextLine operation will finish because it has reached a new line symbol. It will generate the line string and then this line string will be split by spaces, i.e. we will get a split line array which contains the string 2, the string 8, the string 3, 0, the string 2, 5, the string 4, 0 and so on. And then for each item in this split line we uh, get the item, parse it into an integer and add that to the numbers list. Okay, and then we print that. Now, instead of writing this whole thing every time you need to 
parse a, a string into a multiple of integers, what we can do is extract a method over here. So I can mark this code and I say alt and r refactor, then x extract, then method. I want a method. And now it says, okay, I will, I will create the numbers parameter and the line parameter. I don't need the numbers parameter. The reason it creates it is because I've created the numbers list over here and it doesn't have it in the code I just marked. But I actually want the numbers per, the numbers object initialized inside the method so that the method will then return that numbers list. So I'd mark this alt r x m and say parse uh, numbers parse numbers from a string line of numbers the same way we have integers dot parse int from a string well I have parse numbers accepting a string and will it will return a list of integers that's not completely visible here, but if you open this drop down here, you would see that it would be a list of integers. And actually you can see the um, definition of the method over here. Okay, so let's create this thing. And now we have a function that simply parses a number from a line of strings, uh, from a string line. And now we can inline this line string. So we don't have uh, a special variable for it since we're using its value directly. Okay, so we broke down that code into just parse numbers accepting the next line from the scanner. And now you have code that, ring, that reads integers from a string on one line. You don't need to write the loops again and again, you just need this code co copied somewhere inside your program. Okay, so that's one way to read a line of integers from uh, the input using only one line of code. It's not exactly one line of code, but from the point of view of the main method, it is a single line of code. Okay, so what did we uh, have in the slides? We have another option for parsing items from a single line, and that is using the stream API in Java, the stream API if you want to Google that. We haven't studied it officially, but we're showing you bits and pieces of it because it will be useful for later on. So the stream API allows us to convert this splitting of the line into a stream and on streams you can do some special multiple uh, operations using single um, invocations of methods. So what we're saying here is convert this line into a stream and collect it as a list. So convert this array of strings into a list. Okay, and then we're saying iterate each element of the string list and add it as an integer to our numbers. It's pretty much the same code which we had uh, in my example I showed you, but you can make it even shorter than that. You can say arrays.stream like before and then before collect it as a list of strings we can say map it how do you map it well by using integer percent so this line here th this part of code here does the for loop which we wrote manually so if you want to do it uh, in a shorter way what you're saying here is for each map means for each item in the stream for each string in this split of strings for each item in the string, convert it to an integer. How? Well, using the integer parseInt method. So it's basically calling this code. For each item, get that item and parse it into an integer. And then we're saying collect those integers which you got by mapping into a list. Now, if you don't understand what if you don't understand this completely and if it's not intuitive to you my suggestion is just use the methods which we implemented implement your own methods this thing here is just a complex description of a method and we will learn to use uh, such code and write such code ourselves even but that would be further on so the reason we're showing you these things right now is because that's one additional way of reading strings uh, reading numbers from a line of strings and it would 
speed up your coding process. But it doesn't mean that you always have to use this approach. It's completely fine to use the for loop which we implemented ourselves. And actually, confession time here, I most most of the time I use my own methods for parsing such types of data instead of using the built-in stream API. I, I use the stream API only if I have uh, some complex sequence of operations I need to execute on large amounts of data. It's completely fine using uh, a parse line of numbers method like the one we implemented. Okay, so how do we print on the console? Well, the same way we do it for arrays and actually I showed you one way of printing to the console which is using uh, for each loop. Another way would be using a normal, normal for loop. So I'd say for i, enter, Start i from zero, continue until i reaches numbers dot size. Again, this is dot size, not dot length. Dot length is for arrays, dot size is for lists. Okay, until we reach dot size and system dot out dot print. Let's do it with printf so we can print the index. Uh, and we can say uh, the value here is at index d. What are we doing here? We're saying print digits at this position, then print at index, and then print digits again. What digits? Well, the first set of digits will be the number from the numbers list, meaning the element at position, which position? Position i. Okay, and we're saying that the number at position i is at position i. So what will this print? It will print something of the sort um, 13 at index 0. Then it will print um, 20 or 42 at index 1 and so on and so forth. That's another way to print a list. Okay, so let's see that actually. Let's input some numbers and see them printed. Now what am I missing here? I'm missing the new line. How do I write a new line in a printf statement? Percent %n. That means use the new line symbol for the current operating system and place that at the end of the line. So I'll stop this code again, I'll start it again, and I'll input some numbers. For example, 13, 42, 4,213. 4, Why not? Okay, let's pl print them. Okay, so what happened? We got 13 and 42 on separate lines and then 4,000... 213. Why? Well, because I have a for loop printing that data previously on the previous part of the code. So if I remove this, this first printing will not be here. Okay, so here's the next printing. 13 at index 0, 42 at index 1, 4213 at index 2. So this is how we print lists onto the console. Same thing as we do for arrays. Okay. So let's continue on. What else can we do b with printing? We can use string.join. Now, if you have a list of strings instead of a list of numbers, the same way uh, you can do string.join for an array of strings, you can do it for a list of strings. So if we have, um, if we have a list of strings, of a list of string words like we had before, and this list of strings is initialized by a new array list. And let's place val values directly here. How, how did we do that? We use the arrays as list and list the values here. So let's place the values, hello and goodbye. Okay? No. Oh. <laughs> Change to Bulgarian, sorry about that. So uh, we're using the list of strings a list of string words which contains hello and goodbye and we want to join them into a single string which we can print on the console. How do we do that? We just use string.join, pass in the words, pass in the separator we want to use, for example a comma and a space and this will create a string which is our list of words joined together and let's call that joint. So now we have a list of strings, uh, a string which has these strings joined with the separator comma. And if we just want a separator space, well, we'd say a separator, separator space here. 
Okay, so how do we print this to the console? The same way we print any normal string. We just use system.out.print or print line or printf or whatever we wish to happen. Okay, so this would print hello, comma, space, goodbye. Oh, it didn't print that. Why didn't it print comma space? Because I removed the comma from here. Let's place the comma again, start it again, and we will see the comma space uh, separation and printing. Here's it. Okay, so we have hello, comma space, goodbye. So, uh, this is how we would print a list of strings if we wanted a shortcut instead of using the for loop. And again, if you're not using uh, strings you'd have to do the for loop. So in that case I would advise you, well, implement a method which prints a list of things, for example integers, on the console. And you can even include a parameter which is a separator by which those uh, items should be printed. Okay, so this is how you print to the console pretty much the same thing you would do for arrays. So from here on out we have some tasks we need to implement and the first of those is how can we sum a sequence of numbers into a list which contains no equal numbers side by side. So what do we have here? We have 3 and then 3 and then 6 and then 1. And the task is keep summing the items until there are no two items which have equal value next to each other. So we have 3 and 3 here, they have equal values, so these 3 and 3 need to become 6. But then we're having 6 and 6 next to each other, so we uh, sum these 6 and 6 together and receive 12, remove these from the list, and when we reach the point when we have 12 and 1 in the list, there's nothing else we can do, so we print the list. That's our task. And here's another example. We have 8, 2, 2, 4, 8, 16. What would happen here? Well, here's a pair of equal values which are next to each other. So what happens here? Well, this 2 gets summed up in this 2. So this 2 becomes 4. This 2 gets removed from the list. But now we have 4 and 4 next to each other. So we repeat the same operation. So we sum 4 and 4 and we receive 8 here at this position and remove this 4 which was at the next position. Okay, but now we have, what do we have? We have 8 and 8 and 8 again and 16. Now there's an additional um, thing we have to keep in mind here is that we should do it we should do this summing from left to right. So in this case where we're uh, getting left with, let's edit it directly, in this case in which we're getting left with uh, three equal values, we should sum the leftmost two values. So from left to right, when we see 8 and 8, we need to convert it to 16, and now we have 16, 8, 16. There are no values that are next to each other now that are equal, and we print the list. And same thing for the example over here. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we'll be removing elements. We will also be calculating sums and changing values. So since we'll be changing values and we will be printing some subset of those values, you, we probably need some sort of collection an array or a list or something, something which can contain many elements. Okay, well, would it be an array? Well, it won't be an array because we need to remove elements. It could be an array, but it would make our lives quite harder if we're trying to uh, remove elements using arrays. So we will just use a list. Lists have built-in functionality which allows us to remove elements. Okay, so let's do that. Let's uh, write the code which will execute these instructions. What do we need? First off, we need a list of numbers read from the console. Hey, guess what? I have a function that does that, a method that does that. Okay, so here's the scanner. How do we use it? Well, I'll just say uh, parse numbers and parse what numbers? Well, the numbers that are on the next line of the scanner. Okay, let's get a result from this. This result will be a list of integer numbers 
and this list of integer numbers, by the way, this task could be decimal numbers or any other type of uh, data type. We don't really care about the type here. Uh, we care about the logic of removing items and setting items. I'll leave the details of data types to you to try out at home. So a list of integer numbers, which is the numbers we've read from the console. Okay, so this code here does all the reading we need. From here on out, we just have calculation and we have printing to the output. And actually, let's print to the output. Let's do a for loop. Let's write numbers, press Alt and then press Enter and ask IntelliJ to generate uh, for each loop for our numbers. I'll convert this to a simple int because I prefer simple ints when I can use simple ints. And say system.out.print this number with the space after it. Now, these are again details which may need tweaking if the task doesn't uh, require a space after the last number. Well, then I need to do some modifications here. But again, those I'll leave up to you. We've done stuff like that already. So how do we handle this task? Actually, this part of the code should do the summing. Now, what you'll see in the slides from here on out will be a for loop that traverses these numbers and does the sums. My suggestion is we don't use a for loop. What we will use is a while loop. Why will we use a while loop? Well, because I would have to be moving forward and backward when doing uh, this iteration. So a for loop typically just steps on items in a sequence. That's fine, but once you've had a change in this sequence, you might need to rerun the for loop on it and then rerun it again and rerun it again. That would require you to reset the index of the for loop. I personally prefer my for loops to be always sequential. And in cases where I have to move the index forward and backward, I use while loops. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, to sum these numbers correctly, what I'd need to do is start from index zero. So I'll create an integer index zero. And then I'll say while index is less than numbers.size, and this might need editing, but let's just implement the code that iterates. And then I'll think about how I can iterate, how I can change it to fit my specific task. Okay, so let's just iterate these numbers. Let's say index plus plus. So this iterates the numbers in the numbers list. Okay, how can I use this to my advantage and do the sums I need to do for my task? Well, the check is pretty simple. If I'm at index zero, do I need to do something? Well, I would need to do something if index one contains an item that is equal to the index which I'm at at the current point. So I have index zero and I'm checking for equality with index one, with the element at index one. So I have the current index and I have the next index. So the next index is index plus one. Okay, so when do I need, when do I need to do something? When well, when the item at index is the same as the item at next index. So I need to do if numbers dot get of the current index equals numbers dot get the next index. So if these two are equal, I need to sum them, correct? So I need to do get this index again and sum it with the next index. So this is the sum. Okay, so you're seeing a repetition of code. If you're seeing a repetition of code, you should be thinking about how can I make this code not repeat? So what I do is control alt V can extract a variable and I want all occurrences of this string to be replaced. And I'd say this is the um, current item. And the other thing is the next item. And again, I'd convert them to simple integers 
when I know I can convert them to simple integers. By the way, if you're seeing integer with capital I, this means that this integer could also, except the values for an integer, it could also con contain no, the value no, which we've seen for strings and which we've seen for, for arrays actually and for lists and for any other type of object, but we will discuss objects later on. So, to simplify for now, if you see a capital case integer, you can, in most cases, convert it to a simple integer. So, the current item and the next item, if they are equal, we need to find their sum. What else do we need to do? Well, we need to get that sum and change the current item, which is an index 0, change it to the sum. In this case, 3 plus 3 equals 6, so this index 0 will become 6. Okay, let's do that. We need to uh, numbers dot change the value set at which index? Well, the current index, no, the, uh, the index, we've called it index. The current index is index. And what value do we need to set on this index? Well, we need to set the sum. Okay, so now what we did is change this tree, oops, change this tree to a six. What else do we need to do? Well, the other tree over here needs to be changed, needs to be removed actually. We don't want it. It already participates in the sum, so we don't want it in our list. We want to remove it. We, this way, we change the current value, we remove the next value, and that's as if we've merged these two values together into a single value using their sum. Okay, so I need to numbers.remove which index? Well, the next index on which next item is located. Okay, so this removes the other value of 3 over here. Now, from here on out, what do I do? Well, uh, I've removed the index, and what now? I've done the sum, made these two values, I'm still at index equals 0. So I'm still here. However, index 0 is now 6, and index 1, since I've removed 3, becomes what? It becomes 6 again, right? So any values after the index I've removed are shifted into its position. So 6 becomes index 0, index 1, and 1 goes to index 2. So I typically I would need to iterate forward to iterate the entire list. However, since each deletion moves all the items from the right of that deleted position, moves them to the left. That means that at this position, which I just deleted, I now have a new value. Since I have a new value, that, and that value could, could be another equality with my current item, I don't want to move forward because I, if I move forward, if I say i, if I say i equals 1, what would happen? Well, after I've done the sum, well, I'd come here at index 1, but at index 1, we now have 6, correct? Because I've moved, and, I, and at index 2, I have 1, because this has moved, and this is no longer the last item. There is no such item at the end of... The list size isn't that big as it once was. Okay, so now I'm at index 1, and I'd miss this sum of 6 plus 6, because I'm always looking from the current index to the next index. So I don't want to go to index 1 if I've done a deletion. I don't want to step on the index which I just deleted, because that index is now a different value. That index contains a different value. So, in this situation, I don't want to increase my index. So I would only increase my index if nothing changes. So I continue on with iterating my list only if nothing changes. Only if, for example, um, in this situation, if I'm at position, uh, maybe this situation isn't very good. Okay, let's use another example. Let's say we have one, two, three, four. When do I change the index? Well, I get to index zero, this is index zero. I compare it with index one. There is no equality, so nothing happens. And then, if nothing has happened, if I haven't deleted items, I go to the next index. So, I go to index 1. And then I check for equality again. I check for equality between index 1 and index 2. Again, no equality, so I go to index 2. And so on and so forth. So, I only increase my index if nothing happened. However, if I find an equality, 
I keep my index the same so that the deleted position, I can check it again for an equality with the current position because if I have uh, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, now this case is more interesting. Why? Well, because I'm at index 0, I'm here, I see an equality, these two are equal. In that case, I'm making their sum, I'm assigning position 0 to 2, I'm removing this item and now position 1 becomes what? Well, position 1 becomes this number 2 over here because all of the uh, elements to the right of the one I deleted here are shifted to the left. So this is now the new index 1 and this is the new index 2 and this is the new index 3. So now I have to check again because at index, index 1 I might have another equal item and I do. I remain at index 0 and I check the 2 from index 0 with the 2 from index 1 again and I see again another opportunity for creating a sum and I do that sum and I receive 4 here, 2 plus 2 is 4 and I remove this item, okay, so what happened now, this index is no longer index 1, index 1 becomes this thing over here, the number 3, and index 2 becomes the number 4, and now I check again, I'm still at index 0, I check at index 0, is the 4 at in e index 0 equal to the 3 at index 1, well, it isn't, and in that case, I move on, I change my index to the new index 1, I go over here, I do I++ plus plus or index++. Plus plus. Okay, so this is what we have in this situation. One thing I'm missing from my code currently is that I'm not doing a second loop around over the numbers. So in this situation, I'd go over here and I check, okay, no sum. I'd get over here, okay, here's a sum. So this, is, this becomes 4. And, okay, here's a sum again, and this becomes 4. Okay, so here's a sum again here, and this becomes 16. Okay, and this thing also is a sum, so I'd get 8 and 32. But that's not what we want. We want each time we get a sum, each time we get a sum, we want to start from the beginning. Why? Well, because we need to do the sums from left to right. Whereas my code always does the sums from where it is located. So it can miss if there's an equality between the current element and the previous element. So what I want to do is just when I do a change here, I want my index to become zero. I want to start over. The moment I see uh, a change, I start over from the beginning of the list as if that's what, that, that's what my initial input was. Because this, this task is just each iteration, each change just generates a new list, as in the input, which we need to make sums for. Okay, so this code over here will do what we are expecting it to do. It will sum the items, sum any two equal items which um, appear in the list next to each other, and uh, it will print the output. Okay, let's see. Testing with this uh, example, oh, I got an error. Surprise, surprise. Remember when I said that I need to tweak something on the while loop? What do I need to tweak? Well, I'm saying continue until index is less than numbers dot size, meaning that the last val value of index would be, for this case, the last value of index would be 0, 1, 2, 3. For four items, it would be 3. However, I'm trying to access each time I'm trying to access the next index. Next index is index plus 1. So for this case, when I reach index 3, I would try to access index 4, but there's no such thing as index 4, and because there's no such thing as index 4, I get an error. Okay, so where do I need to continue to? Do we need to reach the last item? Do we need to reach index 3? Well, no, we don't, because there's no sum to be had here. Since we're always making the sum from the current item and the next item, we just need to reach the second to last item. So we need to in reach index 2, so we can check with 1. But we don't need to reach 1 and check with whatever's after 1, because there's nothing after 1. Okay, so we don't need to continue to numbers.size, we need to continue to numbers.size minus 1. So we need to continue to less than numbers.size minus 1, meaning that numbers.size here is 4, 
the last index is 3, so 4 minus 1 is 3, and we want to be less than 3. Less than 3, we have the indexes 0, 1, and 2. Okay, so that's our issue with this code. Let's start it again. We did some pretty quick debugging, but I think you got the gist of it. Let's enter our input again. 3, 3, 6, and 1. 12 and 1 is my output, as exactly as it was in the slides. Now, ignore again this error. If you see this JWW, JDWP error here, it, you can ignore it for now. This is a uh, setting in my environment. It's not related to the task we're solving. Okay, let's, let's use this example and see what it prints out. 16, 8, and 16. That's what we wanted, and we can test this example and so on. I won't test the last one. I'll leave it to you. I suggest that each task we uh, solve here, you do at home. Even though you've seen the solution, it's good to have the practice of just having these things intuitively in your mind. The reason I found my error so quickly is because I've written code like this a lot of times. So writing code a lot of times saves you time when you need to be quick. It's like practicing any, any other activity. Okay, so we got the solution to this task and here's another way to solve it. Uh, we can read it using a stream from the line, from a line of the input, map it. Again, I said the types I'm using in my sol solution aren't the correct ones. The actual task uses double, uh, uh, the double data type. So here we'd have map mapping by the double parse double function, collecting into a list. And here we're using a for loop to iterate the items. We reach the item before, I, uh, before index minus one, size minus one, for the reasons we just described. And we pretty much do the same, th same thing. However, we need to set our current index to minus one instead of to zero, like we did in our for loop, because the for loop always does an I++ at the end of its execu execution. So if we set it to zero, the I++ will change it to one, but we want to start from zero. So we set it to minus one and increase that minus one to zero and start over. See why I suggest we use while loops, which in which we fully control the iteration. Okay. So, uh, again, this is part of the same task. The, the solution here is separated into separate methods. Uh, you can uh, check this type of uh, solution and Im implement that if you want, uh, whichever you prefer. The reason I'm implementing a different solution to the one in the slides is so that you can have two uh, viewpoints on solving this task. Most programming, pro programming problems have multiple solutions uh, which you can use to solve them. Okay, so here's uh, a task for Gauss's trick. Uh, we will skip that one in favor of another task we have ahead of us. But in short, what do you need to do here? Well, you would have a list and your task is to sum the first item and the last item, the second item and the second to last item and so on, and do nothing with the middle item if there's such a thing as a middle item. So this would give you 663 and remove the items you've just sum. Well, this is pretty much a simple task. You need a for loop. You need it to start from index 0 and you need it to reach, in this case, index 2. What is index 2? Index 2 is the size divided by 2. So you have an i loop starting from 0 to i less than size divided by 2. For size 4, it's the same thing, right? So for size 4, you have 0, 1, and you don't want to reach this index. You don't want to reach index 2. So less than index 2 and less than index 2 in both cases. So even or odd number of items, it's the same thing. It's still a division by two. Okay, so that's because of integer division losing uh, accuracy when uh, you have a remainder. Okay, so in both cases, you're going to size divided by two. And what, you, what would you be doing? Well, you're calculating the sum of the, you're calculating uh, the sum of i plus the sum of size minus one minus i. Why is it size minus one minus i? Well, because if i is zero, we, we would get uh, size minus one minus zero. So size minus one. So index zero will match index size minus one, which is what we want. And index one, we want to match 
size minus 1 minus 1, i.e. size minus 2, and so on and so forth. And you just need to remove this index after that. And this is what we have here in the for loop. We're just setting the current number to the sum of the numbers I just mentioned, uh, and then removing that last number. Okay, so uh, from here on out, what uh, I wanted to solve with you is the merging lists problem. So what we have here, and that will uh, connect nicely to the next topic which we have to discuss, what we have here is two lists with randomly uh, distributed sizes, meaning that they won't be of equal size, or they could be of equal size, but most test cases will not uh, contain lists of equal size. And we want to merge position 0 and position 0 of the first and second list, then position 1 and position 1 of the uh, second list, and so on. So what we want to do is if we have uh, one two, three, and four, five here, what we want to do is get the list one from the first list, four from the second list, two from the first list, five from the second list, three from the first list, and that's it. If we had more numbers here, for example, 42, 42 would come right after three. So we take from the first, we take from the second, and then we repeat. We take from the first, we take from the second, and then we repeat. We take from the first and, oops, there's nothing here, there's no item in the second. So we would need a check. We would start and we would walk the entire list, the larger of the two lists, and while walking the larger of the two lists, we will just check which of the lists has an item. If the first list has an item, use it. If the second list has an item, use it. If not, don't use it. Okay, that's a simple for loop, and it might seem like a simple task, but I'll um, do a modification of this task so we can link it to the ne next subject, which is starting. Okay, so what, I'm, what I'll be doing is reading two lists of numbers. Now, whenever I have two similar things which I need to read, like in this case, numbers one and numbers two, or list one and list two, I'd like, I like to use alphabeticals, so numbers A and numbers B. Why? Because A and B are a bit easier to distinguish from one and two. That's a personal preference. Uh, it's not something you are obliged to use every time, but here's you know a view into how my mind works. If your mind works differently, fine by me whatever floats your boat. So, let's uh, do the thing we wanted to do. We want to read two lines of numbers, okay? We, we read two lines, we, re we read a single line, then parse it into numbers, and we read another line and parse it into numbers. Let's start a for loop now. How many iterations does this for loop need to have? Well, I'd say this for loop needs to have as many iterations as there will be maximally items in one of the two lists. So, my idea is the following. Go through the two lists, I don't care which of them has the larger number of items, and try to pick from the first, from the second, from the first, from the second, from the first, from the second, and so on. Okay, so what, uh, what do I do? Well, I do the following thing. I start a for loop, starting from zero, and continuing to math.maximum of numbers A and numbers B. So, what I... Uh, so, so that wouldn't be numbers A and numbers B because those are lists, right? We want not the, the maximum of the lists, we want the maximum of their sizes. So we either continue to numbers A dot size or to numbers B dot size depending on which of these two has the larger number of items. Okay, so from here on out what do we do? Well, we just start pulling items from the respective lists and placing them into a new list. I'd create a new list of integers, which I'd call merged equals new array list. I initialize it in this way. And before I construct the list, let's print it so I don't forget printing. Okay, so I do merged alt enter iterate for each integer in merged, print it system dot out dot print a line or just print that integer integer and add a space after it okay so i have my printing i just need to create my merged list how do i do that well 
I already told you. Since we're continuing to, to the maximum of the sizes of both lists, that's, that means that if the lists are equal, let, let's assume the lists are equal, then we'll handle the case in which they aren't equal in size. Okay, so what do we do? We add to merged from numbers A, give me the index at position, uh, the item at position I, and then from numbers B, get me the item at position I again. Okay, so that gives me the merged list. Now, this is only if my two lists are of equal size. If they aren't of equal size, what would happen? Well, let's say numbers A is, um, let's say numbers A is 1, 2, 2, and 3, whereas numbers B is 4 and 5, like we had in the example before. I'd get 1 and 4, so my merged list would become 1, 4, then it would become 2, 5, and then, since we're continuing to the maximum of their sizes, we would reach index 2. So, this is index 2, since we're going to less than uh, maximum of size of the first and size of the second, which is less than 3, because this is the larger list with size 3. Okay, so we're continuing to less than 3, and we'd get to 2, 5, we'd add the 3, we're on this line now, We'd add the tree from the first list, but for the second list we'll get an error because the second list has no such item as uh, numbers b dot get index two. There's no index two in numbers b. Index uh, numbers b only has index zero and index one. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, we only take an item from the list if it has such an item. So what our check is. If numbers a dot size is larger than i, then use from numbers a because we could have the same situation in reverse. Okay, and again, if numbers b dot size is larger than i, then get from numbers b. Notice that this isn't an else if. This is two separate ifs for two separate lists. We, they don't have anything in common except that the fact that we're adding both of their items into the merged list. So we're checking, can I add from A? If I can, then I do. Can I add from B? If I can, then I do. And that's it. Okay, so let's uh, test this with the input I just made up. One, two, three on the first line, four and five on the second line. One, two, three, enter. Four and five, enter. Let's see what happened. 1, 4, 2, 5, 3. 1, 4, 2, 5, 3. That's exactly what I wanted to happen. Okay, and that's for different size lists. Okay, let's test with the input data that we have as an example here. Let's start this code again. I'll just run it this time. Pasting this code 1, 6, 2, 7, 3, 8, 4, 5. Is that the input I wanted? The output I wanted? Yes, 1, 6, 2, 7, 3, 0, 3, 8, 4, 5. 3845. Yes, it, it seems like the same output. Now, if I had more time, I'd give more examples. I'd uh, test different cases. I'd test an empty list with another empty list. I, I should get an empty result. I'd test an empty list with a single item list. I'd test an empty list with a multiple item list, and so on and so forth. You have to test out different combinations of inputs, different conceptual combinations. You have you shouldn't test 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and then 1, 2, 3, and 6, 5. It's the, it's the same type of uh, input in regards to our algorithm. But different sizes now have an effect on our algorithm. Okay, so before we go into the break and before we uh, continue with sorting, Let's uh, talk about something, by the way, this is the solution, which d another type of solution you can um, use to merge the lists. Um, it, depending on which list is larger, it uses the, the prefix of the numbers, appends them to, to the merged list, and then if the first list is larger, it adds the remaining elements from that, Otherwise, it adds the remaining elements from the other list. Okay, and here's uh, an interesting trick you can do. In Java, you can print an array converted to string directly on the console. So, array.toString in Java would generate, if you have the array123, it would generate something of the type 
um, 1, 2, 2, comma, 3, or something like that. Uh, we need to test it actually to see what exactly it generates, but to string of an array generates something similar to this string over here. So what we're doing here is uh, very neatly uh, telling Java to replace any bracket, any opening bracket, any closing bracket, and any comma with an empty string. We're calling that over the string that J Java generates for an array. So what we will have remaining is just the number. So if you replace every such symbol, every such symbol and every such symbol in the string 1, 2, 3, closing bracket, if you replace these three symbols with emptiness, what you'd get is 1, space 2, space 3. Now, this is what you call a regular expression. This is something for another topic, for another lesson, so we won't discuss it in details here, but you can play around with it and see what it does. Okay, so uh, before we go into a break and before we move in on to the sorting lists and arrays topic, a slight modification of this task. Now, what you would usually do when merging lists isn't just merging them uh, item by item, what is often found in computer science is merging two sorted lists. So you have the lists one, two, three, let's comment this line out, one, two, three, and four, five. And merging them, you'd want to create one, two, three, four, five. I.e., during the merging operation, you take items from the lists, but you only take the smaller of the two fronts of the list. So this is the frontmost item of the first list. This is the frontmost item of the second list. You don't take both of them. You check which one is smaller. And if one, if the first list, the first list's front item is smaller, then you use that and you place it in a list and you remove it from the original list. And then you do the same check again. If the first item is smaller, uh, if the front item of the first list is smaller than the front item of the second list, you use the front item again and you get this number two over here. And you repeat this operation. Here we do it for three. We place three here and then we do it for four here because there, there are no items in the first list. And then we do it for five again because again there are no items in the first list. So let's add some other uh, example input. So let's say we have uh, 1, 7, and 10 here, while we have 1, 8, and 11 over here. So 8 and 11 over here. What would happen? Well, we do, which of, the, which of these two is smaller? Well, 1 is smaller than 8, so we place 1, and we remove that 1 from the list. And then, which of, which of these two is smaller? Well, 7 is smaller, and we remove that from the list. And then, which of these two is smaller? Well, 8 is smaller, and we remove that from the list. And here, 10 is smaller, so we remove that from the list and place it in the second list. And here we have only one item remaining, so we place that in the list. This is called merging sorted lists. Merging sorted lists. And it's a good idea to try and implement this. What would the code be? Well, while... Uh, a, how long did we execute? We executed until both lists are empty, correct? So it would be something like, here's our merged list. It would be while uh, number say is empty, uh, while this isn't empty, or while the others, the other list isn't empty. So while at least one of these lists has items in it, then if, um, and you'd need some additional checks here. Now, it is possible that one of these lists is empty while the other isn't. So you need to check if numbers A is empty, then just add to merged the first item of numbers B. Add numbers B dot remove the first item. Remove, in addition to removing the item, returns it as a value. So you remove it and you place the value into merged. So same thing for if numbers B is empty, then you'd add from numbers A into merge. And if none of them are empty, if both have still have items in them, then you'd add 
if numbers a is if numbers a get item zero is less than numbers b get item zero then you'd add which one of them you'd add number a so you'd get number a dot remove index zero and you'd add it to the merged list no merged dot add numbers a and in the other case you'd add which well the item in numbers b okay so if a is less than b you'd get the a item and if a is larger than or equal to b you'd get uh, the the b item okay so uh, what would we get in this case well exactly this output exactly this uh op this merge operation on this list now they have to be sorted lists sorted meaning ordered from smaller to larger elements so the first elements are smaller than the last elements and this is true for each uh, consecutive pair of numbers in the list so this is called a merge operation and it's part of the merge sort algorithm now this isn't the most optimal way to implement it since each of these remove operations will have to shift items uh, at least not for array lists. If these were linked lists, this would be completely fine. Uh, but it is one way to implement it and it's part of an optimal algorithm for sorting. But algorithms for sorting we will discuss after the break. Okay, let's continue with the last part of this lesson. We're going to talk about sorting, how we do it for lists, how we do it for arrays, how we can use that for solving different tasks and so on. So what is sorting? When you have a sequence of elements, like we have in lists and arrays and so on, you can have these elements in multiple different orders, but what you can do with them, for example, if you have the items 1, 3, 2, 5, 10, minus 1, uh, this is what we'd call an, a non-sorted array, at least not sorted according to the natural order of the elements inside this array or list or whatever collection it is. A sorted version of this collection would be the items ordered according to some comparison and the natural comparison for numbers is the numbers ordered by their positions on the numerical axis. So you'd have minus 1, 1, 2, 3, 5 and 10 in a sorted array or list. This one is sorted by the value of the element in the the appropriate position so this is an ascending sort meaning that the first items are less than the last items we ascend up in value when we're traversing this list so this is a sorted list how would how would we do that in, in a normal uh, situation if if we had to implement a sorting of a list without uh, having any knowledge of how to do it in uh, Java. Let's try to do it. Let's try to implement a sorting function of, by ourselves so we can exp so we can know what the Java code which we'll see afterwards actually does. So let's have a list of integer which will contain our numbers. And these numbers let's instead of reading them from the console just initialize them with some values so i'd say a new array list containing integers and to set its value directly i would need to pass in an array which acts like a list here so i'd say array as list and i'd set some items let's use the items i just uh, thought up one two one three two five ten minus one Okay, so this is an unsorted list. At least it's not sorted according to the natural order of these elements. There, You could order items by a bunch of different characteristics, but for now we will just use the natural order of the items which we have, meaning that if we have integers, we would like to order them by their uh, integer value. If we have um, strings, we would order them, order them lexicographically i.e. according to how they would appear in a dictionary. Okay, so here are our numbers and we want to sort them. How do we do that? Well, we need to shuffle them around in such a way that there are 
no positions in which uh, an item at the current index is less than the item at the next index. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually, sorry, it's, a, it's larger than the item at the next index. So we want for each two indices in this list, for example, for index zero and index one, we want it to be true that getting the item at index zero gives a value that is less than getting the item at index one. And we want the same thing for getting the item at index one and getting the item at index two and so on and so forth until we reach the end of the list. How do we do that? Well, how did I do it when I wrote the example uh, when I was explaining what sorting is? Well, I kind of don't know what I exactly did, but let's think about it. If, if one way to think about how an algorithm works, how to implement it on a machine is think of each item individually. Only think of a single item at a time because computers see lists as single items at a time. They don't see them like we do the entire list at once. And even we don't actually see the entire list at once, although our mind tricks us into thinking we do. So what did we actually do? If I have to do it step by step, and I have to think of each item at a time, I know that I'll have a sequence of items and I can access them anytime I want. Uh, what do I do to find the sorted variation of this list? Well, to start, what I do is find the minimum item, find the least item in this list and place it at the first position. So I would go item by item and search for the minimum of this list. In this case, the minimum would be minus one. I take that minus one, I'd remove it from the list and I'd place it at the first position in the new list. Then guess what? I do the exact same thing again and again and again. So I'd go over here and search for the next least item. So the next smallest item after the one I removed. So basically I do the same thing. I search for the smallest item. So I say, okay, in this list, which is the smallest item? Well, is this one? Well, this seems to be small for now. Compare it with three. Yeah, it's still smaller. Compare it with two. Yeah, it's still smaller. Compare it with five. Yeah, it's still smaller. Compare it with 10. Still smaller. No more items. So this one's the smallest. And guess what? I removed that one. And in my list, which contains up to this point minus one, I'd add one. And I'd repeat again from the start of the list to the end of the list, search for the smallest item and add it to the new list. Okay, let's do that. We uh, will implement an algorithm which traverses the numbers list. How many times would it need to traverse it? How many times would it need to visit each item and check which is the smallest? Well, it would need to do it as much uh, as many times as there are items in numbers or if we're going to be removing items each time, well, the simplest thing would be to continue until the list becomes empty. So while numbers dot is empty is false, while there are still there are still items, do a loop, uh, do the body of this while loop. What will this body do? Well, we'll be searching for the minimum value and minimum, and we'll say that uh, We'll, tr we'll set the minimum to the first number and then we will just try to find another minimum. So we'll say numbers.get of index zero. So we'll get index zero and say this is the minimum. And from here on out, we will try to change it. We will see if any other element changes this, um, this, this condition, if anything changes the current minimum. How? Well, we will start from index one, since index zero, we already have here, and we will continue to numbers dot size. Okay. So what will we do while, uh, walking these numbers? Well, I'll say, uh, if, uh, numbers dot get the current position is less than the minimum, then the minimum would become equal to the current position. We would become equal to numbers dot get of the current position. And I'd save this in a variable and I'd call it current value. So, and I'd change this to a simple end. 
So, I found the minimum, and let's create another list which will contain the elements sorted, which is a new array list. Okay, so when I found the minimum once, I want to add it to the sorted list. So I'd say sorted.add minimum. And I'll repeat this as many times as necessary for the numbers to become empty. So I will move each item from numbers into sorted, but I will move them in such a way that I preserve the natural order of numbers. So each time I will place the minimum number from numbers. Now I'm missing some things here. First of all, I'm not removing the minimum from numbers. Now what I do here is I'd save the index of the minimum, min index. Why am I saving the index of the minimum? Well, because I want to uh, to be able to delete this index later on. I'd say min index is equal to i. Why? Well, because the minimum here becomes the current value. So the minimum index should become the current index. Okay, so what will I add here? Well, instead of using min, I can just use the remove function to remove to remove the value from the original list and then use the return value of the remove function to get the value added into sorted. So I'd say sorted.add and I place numbers.remove the min index here. So remove the item at the minimum index, at the index which contains the minimum item and use the item you get from this remove operation to be added to the sorted list. So I'll get a list which each time gets the minimum of the, the original added to its end. For initially, the sorted list will contain just one item, the minimum of numbers. Then on the second position, the sorted list will contain the next minimum of the remaining numbers because we've just removed the minimum. So we'll get the next minimum and then the next minimum and then the next minimum. Each of these will be larger than the previous, larger or at least equal. So each time at sorted, we will be adding something that is larger than the last item we have added to it. Okay, so let's see if this works. There could be, mi there could be mistakes here. Let's say uh, we want to print this sorted list and I'll use a range uh, um, uh, for each loop for this. I'll say sorted out and enter iterate and I'll say for each number in sorted system dot out dot print this number and print a space after it. Okay, let's start this. No, we don't want code coverage here. Let's start it in debugging mode so that if there are errors, we can see where these errors are as in errors, I mean, uh, index, uh, wrong index access and so on. Now there's no input for this test because I already initialized my values. I nowhere do I read input from the console. So I directly received the answer to the question, what is the sorted version, the sorted version of this list and the sorted version seems correct to me. Now, a few things about this sorting algorithm. It's definitely not optimal, especially since we're removing items each time. Removing an item takes time because all other items after it have to be shifted left to cover the empty spot that appears. That's one thing. And another thing is that each time I iterate this list to find the minimum, I walk through all items. What does this mean? That if I have this number of items, to remove the first, the first element, I have to do six operations at least to find the minimum, to find this one. Okay. And then I have to do another five operations. So six operations here, then five operations to get this one, then four operations to get this one, then three operations to get this one and so on and so forth. You get the idea as uh, we, we, we get the number of operations equal to the sum of uh, one, the, the, the sum from the numbers from one to n, where n is the size of our list. So that's approximately the size of our list to the power of two, n squared. That's not optimal. That takes a lot of time. So this is not an optimal algorithm, but it's one algorithm you can implement when you want to sort something. 
So it's important for you for you to understand what sorting does. It always does some operation which resembles finding a minimum and placing it in the appropriate position, or at least comparing values and placing them depending on the com on the result of the comparison. So. Um, what can we do instead of using this non-optimal solution? Well, we can use the Java methods which are integrated into the Java language. And instead of, instead of modifying our original numbers and adding to another list and so on, what we can do is use collections.sort. This will do a natural order sorting of whatever we have in our list of uh, list of integers in this case, but we could have a list of strings, a list of doubles, a list of bytes, of, a list of whatever. As long as the items in the list can be compared with one another, like strings and numbers can, this collections.sort method will order them in the, appro the appropriate order for, uh, in this case, numbers. F for the appropriate order of the data type which the list contains. So depending on what is contained in this integer list, we will get a sorting which matches that data type. Okay, so calling this sort method will give us the same result we received uh, a few moments ago. Uh, if I add the minus one, which I deleted, let's add it and start this code again. We we'll wait a while and here are our values. Minus one, one, two, three, five, ten. These values are now sorted in ascending order. Now, you might wonder how can we get them in descending order? Well, there's a pretty easy way to do that and a not so easy way to do that. The easy way is, well, we've already sorted them. We, we want them in reverse. And guess what? There's collections.reverse and you supply the numbers which need to be reversed. Both of these methods change the original list the same way that any method that works on an array can edit the original items in the array because it has access to the memory of the array. Well, the same way sort and reverse affect the original array which we are uh, providing as a parameter to them. So what we did now was sort the numbers and then just reverse them so that when we print them, they will appear in reverse order. Of course, instead of reverse, you can just do a for loop starting from the last element and continuing to the first element and printing like that. But if you want the collection uh, reversed without having to write loops, this is one way you can do it. Okay, so this is how you sort lists and how you reverse them. Now, if you want to play around with the sorting logic, with the, I told you that you can sort by very, um, a very large amount of characteristics for each object. For example, let's say we want to order these items by their, not by their value, but we'd want to order these items by their, um, hmm, it would be weird to, let's say they are two digit numbers. Let's say they are 11, 33, 22, 55, um, tennis a two-digit number and minus 11. Okay, so let's say we don't want to order them by their value, we want to order them by their last digit. So we want to order them here by this one, by this three, by this two, by this five, by this zero, and by this one, and we'll ignore the sign. How, how would we do that? Well, the sort function can accept a comparison function, and this is going to be a bit weird, but I'll show you so you, you know that these things exist. So what you can provide here is a way to compare two values. In order to compare two values, you have to have two values. So let's say these values are A and B, and you need to cover them in brackets like this. And these A and B, you say they go into, this arrow means they go into, and here you can write the comparison you want. So what is the comparison we want? We want an integer comparison between two values and writing it like this would just do the default sorting of the numbers. So if you say for each two numbers, th this is how you'd read this line of code, sort the numbers by 
comparing them that for by using this comparison function that for each two numbers returns the comparison of the first to the second this is the default this is what java uses by default if you don't provide anything it just compares the two values in this order how does how does it compare them you don't care it, it, you just use the comparison function and provide the two values that need to be compared meaning that if these two values are anywhere near each other in the array, they should be ordered in this way. A should be before B. So for any two consecutive values in the list or array, you say that A should be before B by providing them like this in the comparison. So if you want to compare them by their last digit, you do compare them by A% percent 10, meaning get the remainder from deleting a by 10 and get the remainder of deleting b by 10 so i'm saying a and b have to be ordered like this if their last digit last digits are ordered by this so ordered this way so this would compare our numbers by their last digit so now if we change these to 21 23 22 or, or like, let's say 42 or 72 i'm mixing up the order of the values so that you see that we're ordering them by the last uh the last digit okay um 100 uh and minus let's leave minus 11 by itself so now what we'd have here is what we're comparing by the number its last digit the remainder when we divide it by 10 and let's put in an absolute value here just in case mat.absolute value so that we don't uh, get affected by the minus sign on the 11 on the minus 11 number here okay so to, uh, these um, suggestions which we get are uh, a way to um, compress this um, th this way of writing a comparator but we, we don't care about the suggestion we're getting right now, but j just so you know why this is uh, in faded text, because there's an, a, a shorter way to, to write uh, this, this comparison. But I'm writing the longer route so I can describe it component by component how it works. Okay, so let's remove the reverse sync and let's see what's going to appear here. We're waiting a bit. We expect them to be ordered Okay, so what did we get? 100 is on the first position. Why? Because its last digit is 0. And then we have 21 because its last digit is zero uh, is 1. And then we have 11 because its last digit is 1. By the way, you'd say, okay, so 21 and 11 are the same when, when looking at the comparator. Why is 21 before 11? Since they have the same value when comparing them. Well, the reason is that... 21 appears before minus 11 in the input. So these sorting algorithms are the so-called stable sorting algorithms, meaning that if two values are considered uh, equal in the comparison, like in this case, because we're taking their last digit only in the comparison, so the comparison is equal. If they're considered equal, order them as they were ordered in the input. So that's why we get minus uh, that's why we get minus 11 after 21 because minus 11 is after 21 in the original data okay and so on we have 100 because it ends in 0 we have 21 because it ends in 1 and 11 we have 42 after that because it ends in 2 which is larger than the 1 in which minus 11 ends then 23 because it ends in 3 which is larger than the 2 in which 42 ends and 75 for the same reason because 5 is larger than 3 and 23 ends in 3. Okay, so this is a bit more complex and really isn't um, supposed to be part of this lesson, but I like to show additional stuff when I'm uh, showing you a lesson, so this is one of the additional things you can do. If you didn't understand this, relax, it's completely normal. We haven't reached this part of your, uh, let's say, career in which you will easily understand such expressions, but in, in not much more time you will uh, learn to understand them and seeing them now will probably help you further on. Okay, so this is how you sort a list and we have examples here of sorting like that. Uh, in this case we have 
a list of strings and sorting a list of strings happens in the exact same way in which we can sort a list of number numbers. So the method is the same, the list construction is the same, the only difference is we initialize with strings, not with numbers. Okay, so joining these strings together, uh, sorting these strings together and joining them will print them in their lexicographical order, which is pretty much their alphabetical order with some differences uh, based on uh, character casing and punctuation ordering and so on. So basically, if you hear lexicographical order, it means um, alphabetical order. Okay, so if you want to reverse them, again, you can use the reverse function the same way we did for numbers. So a list doesn't care what you store inside it. It really doesn't, it, it, it doesn't really know what you store inside it. It just knows it has items and it returns or sets these items when you tell it to. Okay, so uh, we have a task here and let's solve that task. The task is we have a list of products and they will be entered uh, on n lines. So we know the number of products initially and we have to print them ordered by their name. Pretty simple task. We just have to read this into a list and then we have to sort them because we have these items in an unsorted fashion delivered to our input. We need to get them out sorted by their name. How would we do that? Well, let's, let's try to implement the, a solution for this task. So first we would need an integer number, which is the number of items. Since in the task they, talk, they call it n, I will use the business terminology which they use in the task to to name my variables. That's one way to figure out how to name your variables. Use the terminology you have in the task you're solving. Okay, so scanner dot give me the next integer from the input and then start a for loop starting from zero, continuing until we reach n. And what do we do with this? Well, we will need to enter products. Products are strings. And since we will have many of them, we will add them to a list. Now we do know how many of them there are, so we can optimize the list initialization by saying this is a list of strings and this list is the products. Again, I'm using the terminology used in the task to ease my naming of the variable. So I know what, what this corresponds to from the task description. And I'll say this is a new array list which contains n items or prepare it to contain n items. It, it's not necessary for me to add exactly n items, nor is it necessary to add less than n items. I can then add any number of items, but uh, the array list will optimize for this amount of items initially. So uh, what am I uh, going to do here? Well, I need to read the next line, which will contain the product, which I'm reading from the console. So product will be equal to the next line. I'm getting that in the variable product and I'm adding it to the products list as a product. Okay, so now I have the products added and I have to print them numbered. Let's print them numbered, even though we don't have them ordered yet. Let's see if printing them works. So let's solve this task part by part and then we'll implement the sorting procedure. Okay, so I need to since I'm going to be writing prefix, numbered prefixes here, what I do is uh, start a normal for, e uh, for each loop. So I'd say products, alt and enter, iterate, for each string product and product. And I'll initialize a number, current number, or current position or whatever. And that will start with one. So why does it start with one? Because in the output I've been given, the output starts with one. Okay, so I'll start with one and I'll print using system.out.print formatted output and the formatted output will contain the number followed by a dot followed by a string. So the number digits followed by a dot followed by a string. Okay, and what parameters do I need to provide? I need to provide the current number and I need to provide the, the product which I'm printing. And what else do I need to do? Well, the current number is currently one, but after I've printed the first product, I need to increase it so that when I'm printing the second product, when this 
for each loop continuous on to the second product, current number will be two to print two before the next product. And then it will become three and then it will print three before the next product and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's see if this works. I haven't implemented the whole task, but I, it, it's a good idea to test your task in stages. What works, what doesn't. If, if you have an error somewhere, better to catch it early than to catch it late when you have to debug an entire program. Okay, so let's say there are four items and one of them is um, water, the other is um, pumpkins, and the other one is uh, carrots, and the other one is dogs. Oops, something failed over here. What failed? Now we got one dot, one dot is empty. Two is water, three is pumpkins, four is carrots. Why did we uh, get such an error? Now, if you've been uh, careful with how we read the input, right over here we did a next int. But next int reads up to where? It reads up to the end of this line, but it doesn't read the end line character. And since from here on out we're reading with next line, well, since we're at the end of the four digit and we say next line, what, ha what do we get from this next line? Well, we get zero symbols because exactly after this symbol four, there is a new line character in the input, which is not rendered at least not not rendered as this symbol, it's rendered as a new line simply, but we're in between this digit four and the new line symbol. So if we say next line, that just reads up to the, the end of this line. So it reads this empty string and that's why we only had the option of adding four items here, uh, three items here, even though we said we want to add four items because Actually, the first item we added is this empty string over here. So if you're reading with next int and you know your next input is going to be on the next line, what you're going to do is say scanner.nextLine, just so you can read out this empty string at the end and go to the next line. The entire point of this next line we're calling now is to go to the next line. You don't care about the empty string here because you know that, all, that it's only one number here followed by nothing. So you proceed to the next line using scanner.nextLine. Okay, so now if we start this, see how um, testing your program early can help you catch bugs. If I already had the sorting or some uh, more complicated uh, logic added here, I would have had to spend more time searching for where the problem was. And now I know that the problem has to be either in the input or in the output, which are relatively short parts of code, which I need to read and analyze. Okay, so let's see. For water, uh, pumpkins, carrots, and dogs. Okay, so what do I have printed? Well, I have water, pumpkins, carrots, and dogs printed correctly, as in correctly as they were in the input. However, I have forgotten to add the new line at the end. Another thing which is nice to find in the beginning of your code, not when you have a, mi a million other things to debug. Okay, so this adding the new line here will help us pr print correctly. And now we just have to handle the sorting. So how do we do the sorting? Well, you use collections.sort and you provide what needs to be sorted. In this case, the products need to be sorted. So we call collections.sort over the products. They will be ordered alphabetically. And after they get ordered alphabetically, we will iterate them one by one and print their index, uh, the index of each one before it. And after that, that product itself. And that will give us the products numbered and ordered alphabetically. Let's see this input now. I'll copy the input I provided a few moments ago and I'll start the code again so I so I can paste that input on it again. So I paste that input, I press enter, let's see what happened. Carrots is first, dogs is second, pumpkins is third, water is last. That seems correct alphabetical ordering to me, so that's our task. Or that's some subset of our task, we might have some other detail we need to implement, but that's the gist of the task, that's the main part you need to solve. Okay, 
Another task we have, and then we'll be finishing up, we have a list of integers. And for these integers, we have to remove the negative ones and print the remaining elements in reverse order. So we will have to use the reverse method we just saw. And we will have to, in some way, remove the negative values. Now, how would we do that? Well, we already had a similar task where we had to remove items. Now, since we're removing items, and since we'll be pr playing around with indexes, again, I will be using the while loop, not the for loop, because using the while loop gives me more control over the uh, index which I'm accessing. Okay, so what do we have? We have a line of numbers. Guess what? I have a function, a method, which reads a line of numbers. I just have to say scanner.nextLine, read the next line, and pass that on to the parse numbers method, and get the result from this. These are my numbers. I get them in this list of integer numbers, and now I just have to clear the negative numbers from them. Now, of course, I can just iterate the numbers and print them on the console, but that won't give them reversed. I need to first remove the negative numbers, then reverse what's left of these numbers, and then print them on the console. How would I do that? Well, I'll create another index variable, and I'll say, while wow, this index is less than numbers.size. Again, you remember, as, as with the first task where we had to use a while loop, I just create a loop which uh, iterates up to the end of the list I have to iterate, and then I figure out how to modify it to, uh, imp to implement the task at hand. So this is how I would iterate the numbers list. This is how I would pass through all the items of the numbers list. And now, if the current item is less than zero, if numbers dot get dot uh, out of i, so numbers dot give me the element at position i, if this thing is less than zero, then I'd have to do something. What do I have to do? Well, I have to remove that item. Okay, so I have an I++ here. Should I or should I not do I++ every time? Let's think of an example. Let's have 1 minus 2 minus 2, 3. Okay, if I is 0, so I equals 0, Position 0 is the one here. So I come here, I see that this isn't uh, negative, and I do i++, plus plus. i becomes 1. Okay, so I see that this element now I is equal to 1. I see that this element is negative. So I need to remove it. So removing it, what happens? 3 comes over here at index 1. And what will I do? I would increase the index by 1. In the current code, that's what I do. I always increase the index by 1. And I'd get the index 2. But since 2 is now larger than the number of items in the list, and larger than numbers.size in my code, I will not execute the loop anymore. So I will have in numbers 1 and 3, which seems correct. However, let's think of another example. What would be another example in this case? Well, another example would be what happens if there are two negative numbers next to each other. So I have 1, minus 2, minus 3, 4. What would ha happen in this case? Again, I go to index 0, nothing happens. I go to index 1, I remove this number, I move minus, which moves minus 3 to index 1 and 4 to the uh, index of my, the, the previous index of minus 3, which is index 2. And what happens? Since I'm, I was at index 0, now I'm at index 1, and I'm removing index 1, meaning that at index 1, there is new data, which I'm not seeing, because I'm always doing plus plus, meaning that I'd go to index 2, which is now the value 4, because it moved, and I'd miss the new value at index 1, which is the value minus 3. So whenever you're iterating a list, just like in the previous task, and you're removing items from it, keep in mind that if you're removing the current index, you probably shouldn't continue to the next index because there is new data at the current index. And you need to process that data too, if you're intending on processing every item in the list. Okay, so we will only increase the index if we haven't removed an item. So if we remove an item, 
we stay at that position because a new item has arrived in that position and that item might be negative also. And in all other cases, we just increase the index. And of course, we need to print these numbers. We'd say numbers, alt and enter. We'd iterate these numbers and for each number, we'd uh, system.out.printf and say print a number here with a space following it. Which number? This number from the for each loop. Okay, so this prints our numbers on the console and we can test this code and see how it works. I won't play around with this now. Uh, for several reasons. First, I haven't reversed these numbers, right? In our task, we had to not only remove the negatives, but also reverse these numbers. So from this input, we need to remove minus two, remove minus 10, and then reverse one and seven, giving us one seven instead of seven one. Okay. And also if this list was empty, I'd have to print empty instead of just uh, an empty line. So this I'm leaving to you, but just as a reminder, how, how would we reverse them? Well, I, you, we'd use collections.reverse and pass in the numbers list. So this would reverse them. And what's left for you is to add a condition which checks, well, if these numbers are empty, then print empty as a string. And in the other case, just do this for loop printing. Or you could solve it a million other ways as in most programs, but this is probably the tightest way you can do it. Okay, so that's uh, this task. And here's another solution of this task. Note that most of these tasks are uh, single line read from the console using the stream API. But again, if the stream API is weird for you for now, you can just use the methods which we implemented. Okay, so here the solution is done by using for loops. The for loop just iterates the numbers and if it finds that it needs to remove something, it moves the index back because each time we reach the end of the loop body, the index will move forward. So moving it back and forward will leave it in the same spot where we removed. So again, this is, I prefer the while loop because there's no jumping around of the control index of the control variable of the loop. But if you prefer the for loop, that's fine too. Okay, so uh, what we talked about today was that lists are a variation of arrays which hold sequences of elements, but in addition to that can change their size by using the add, remove and insertion, although insertion is called add with the parameter index and value. So adding, inserting is just adding at a certain index. We saw that in one of the examples in the start of the lecture. So lists are basically your go-to collection for most cases. There are very little um, situations in which you'd prefer a race. The reason you'd prefer a race is because they are, they are slightly faster and they're slightly less memory intensive than lists. So if you know the exact number of items in your input, and you know that you won't be needing to remove items or um, add new items, then you can use a, an array. But in all other cases, you'd probably be best off using a list. Okay, so how do we create a list? The list type we are using currently is the array list. And this array list is created by just typing in new array list and assigning that to either a list of something or uh, an array list of something. Both of these would work, but I'd suggest you uh, get used to the syntax list out of some data type, then add your list name, and then say equals to new array list and close the brackets. This isn't exactly very visible, but you get the idea. Okay, so this is how you create the list. And every other operation which you can you have an, in an array can be done in a list. In a list, so when you have the array operation, uh, give me the index at i. That's equivalent to the list operation get from i. If you want to say uh, i, the the element at index i is equal to something. Well, that is the equivalent of saying set at index i the element, for example, 42, if this was 
assign it to 42. Well, this code matches this code for lists. Okay, and you can join string lists into a sequence of in, into a string sequence by using string dot join. You can't do this for numeric lists in Java, but there are ways to implement methods which can do it for any type of list. We will study them further on. Okay, let I have to remind you that you can ask your questions in all the channels you have been provided, Facebook group, Slido, and so on. Uh, we'd be happy to answer them and. Thanks for listening, I hope this was useful for you, and see you next time! In this lesson, your instructor George will demonstrate how to use strings to process text in Java, and working with text data in Java, which involves the use of the string data type, which contains an immutable sequence of te text characters, and the string builder type, which allows efficiently creating large text. The string class in Java allows searching in a string, inserting and deleting substrings from a string, splitting a string by certain delimiter, joining several strings into a large, larger uh, string together, and many other text processing operations. Let's learn them through live coding examples and later solve some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Are you ready? Let's start. Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer, and in today's lesson we'll be talking about text processing. So we will be talking about how we can manipulate text with Java, which basically means we're going to be covering the string class which we've already seen, uh, but we'll be uh, talking about uh, its functionality more and more, and we will cover some specifics which we haven't really talked about yet. And then we're going to be talking about not just how we can manipulate those strings, but using the string builder class to efficiently manipulate strings and build them and modify their elements and so on. Okay, so today's le lesson is going to be somewhat of a feature uh, documentary. So we're going to be talking about the features uh, in the string class in Java, but along with that, we're going to be talking about some concepts of um, text processing, which are general for all programming languages. So this lesson should be really useful for you, whether you're using Java or something else. Uh, we're going to be talking more specifically about why string concatenation is a slow operation when we get to the string builder class. But first off, we're going to just cover the basic operations which strings uh, support, and then we'll see how we can do them efficiently. So let's first cover what a string is. Now, strings are just sequences of symbols. They're sequences uh, of bytes which represent text. Now, we've talked about this before. Any type of data in a computer is always ones and zeros. So whether you're storing numbers or you're storing characters or you're storing information about people enrolled in a university, for example, it's always going to be ones and zeros. So all data inside computers is just ones and zeros. And what matters is how you interpret those ones and zeros. So uh, one sequence of ones and zeros interpreted as an integer may be the number 97, but that same sequence of uh, bytes interpreted, uh, the same sequence of ones and zeros interpreted as a character will be the uh, lowercase English letter A. So it really only matters uh, how you treat the, the ones and zeros you have inside a computer. It doesn't really, uh, there really aren't data types on the low level of the hardware of the computer. It's just ones and zeros, and we just treat them in different ways. So strings are sequences of characters, meaning that strings are essentially character arrays. So you have a char array, a character array, and that character array is wrapped inside a class, and that class has some added functionality which treats that character array in such a way that it can easily represent text from a human point of view. But it's still just bytes inside the computer. Now, you could use just character arrays, like I just mentioned, if you want to represent text, that's completely fine. If you just need to store that text, if you don't need to do any special operations like searching for uh, words inside it or concatenation or removing words and so on or replacing information. And even in that case, you can also use character arrays. But 
instead of you having to write that on your own, all of these operations on a character array, there's the data type string, the class string in Java, which allows you to do these operations with built-in functionality instead of having to write it on your own, which is always good because you always want to use the built-in stuff if it's uh, available and if it's useful enough for your uh, specific task because the built-in stuff has been tested out, it uh, has been working for a long time, so you're certain that it doesn't really have any bugs in it, whereas if you're using something you just wrote, well, you can't be completely sure that you haven't made a mistake somewhere, and, uh, and that mistake could lead you to losing a lot of time while, while programming. So whenever you can use the built-in stuff, use that built-in stuff, and if for some reason your uh, that built-in stuff isn't available or doesn't really suit your use case, well then you could use a character array to replace the string class. But for most of the stuff we're going to be doing in this uh, lesson, the string class will suffice. So whenever you want to initialize a string variable, you use the so-called string literal in Java, which is enclosed in quotes so this these quote characters enclose whatever contents the string uh, you want to enter in on uh, in the uh, java code which you're writing whatever contents you want the string to be inside your java code well you place that inside quotes now this only uh, applies whenever you're uh, writing literal. So whenever you're literally typing in a string, which is going to be part of your program's memory when it runs inside your Java code. Now, this isn't really extremely common. You might use it for some specific non-changing values, but typically you're going to be reading strings from the console or some other data source, for example, a file, a text file, or reading from the network or reading from uh, a web page or whatever. So, uh, this is the way you initialize it, but you won't really be using this too much. Okay, and if you want to enter a quote character inside the string literal, well, you need to escape it. We've seen that already, but let's cover it again. So if you want to uh, make a string, so let's say this is the string text, and we want to initialize that text with hello world. Uh, if we wanted world to be in quotes, well, the way we do that, one of the ways we do that actually, is by escaping the quote characters like so. Now, you can't simply write a quote character over here because Java thinks that this quote character indicates the end of the literal. So instead of writing a simple quote, which would indicate the end of the literal, you escape that quote with a backslash, which indicates, okay, so this backslash you don't treat as a character, but you use whatever character is after that backslash inside the actual string data. So this isn't a symbol in the Java code, which this isn't a symbol in the Java code anymore, which represents the end of a literal. It gets treated like a part of the string data, which we're initializing. And the same thing over here. Now we've covered this already, but I thought I'd mention it uh, because it's a, a good to rehearse that part of our knowledge. Okay, so uh, what about single quotes? So these quotes over here. Well, it doesn't matter whether uh, you escape or actually you can't really escape a quote character. Well, you can. You can write a quote character escaped. It's going to compile and work uh, as you expect. Uh, however, it, you don't really need to do that. Why? Well, because these quote single quote characters are for character uh, initializations, character literals. And in this case, we have a string literal and the, they are the contents of that string literal. And they don't really break Java's logic of parsing that string literal because it sees the first double quote and then searches for the second double quote. And in which case, if we had a double quote over here, that would break it. But since we've escaped it, it doesn't consider that one. So it's going to find this one, and then it's going to treat all of these uh, values, th this entire uh, literal, as the string literal. Whereas these characters over here, it doesn't really um, treat them as anything important for the Java code itself. They're just contents of the string, just how, uh, just like any symbol inside the string is a content of the string. Meaning that because Java looks for a quote character or for a second quote character whenever it. Uh, finds the first double quote character, it won't really find these single quote characters because, it, again, it doesn't search for them. Okay, so that's uh, escaping. We've uh, covered it before, but I thought uh, you could use a reminder. So 
This is how you initialize a string with this text. And all this really does is initialize a character array and let's call it text array and initializes that character array with the first symbol of in this case okay let's remove these quotes so they don't confuse us the first symbol is going to be h and then the next symbol is going to be e and then the next symbol is going to be l and so on and so on i won't uh, write down all of it but you get the idea this is actually a character array which gets stored in a string object so this text thing is an object of the string class and the string class simply has a character array inside it okay so that's what a string is it's just a character array wrapped in uh, a class which defines some operations over that character array which uh, allow us easier access to the to more text processing like logic okay so whenever you create a string, unlike the character array, now they do use a character array underneath, but unlike the character array, the strings you create are immutable, meaning that this character array, I can tell it, text array uh, set position, for example, one to the symbol, let's say, O. So in this case, case I'm going to be changing this E character into the O character. I can do that with a character array, but I have no such operation on the string object. So I can't say, I can't say text set position zero to the symbol, let's say B. That won't compile because there's no such functionality inside the string class. And there's also no method like in the list where we have set the uh, value at index, some index with a certain value we can't change values inside a string so there's no set something okay so strings are immutable that's what immutability means they can't be mutated they can't be changed their value can't be changed once you create a string it keeps that value and that value it can't be changed you can change the entire string so Currently, text points to this object over here. This is a string object, which is uh, created. Text is just a variable, which is which points to that string object. And we can tell it to point to another string object. So we can say text now equals, for example, ducks. Now, what happens is we're not changing the contents of this object. We're just telling text that it now points to something else. It references another string object and the string object gets discarded from memory at some point and uh, the garbage collector of Java collects it and frees up the memory it used to occupy. It used to occupy. Okay, so that's what immutability means. An immutable string, all strings in Java are immutable, cannot be changed. Now, you can access values at an index, meaning you can say, give me the character at index one, you just can't change it. So if I want to print out all the letters of this text variable, what I can do is say run a for loop starting from zero, continuing until you reach text dot length and until you reach less than that. So when you reach it, stop executing and then s out, s out, uh, not capital case. So s out tap that uh, writes out the system dot out dot print line line. OK, and now if we want to print each character on a separate line, what we need to do is just say text dot character at char at and provide the index. In this case, it's going to be the index i. And this is similar to an iteration of an array because, again, strings are just arrays wrapped inside a class. OK, and when we start this, we're going to see each of the characters inside the string on a separate line. Here they are. OK, now you might say, OK, can't I get that character? So this is my character. Let's call it X. And can't I change that X character? Well, you can, let's say, uh, initialize it to P, but you're actually not accessing the data of this Hello World object over here. You're just accessing a copy of a character you received. Remember that whenever you're uh, passing around primitive data types like characters, integers, longs, doubles, and so on. What you're passing around are actually copies of those variables. So when you have a character <coughs> gotten from a string over here, well, that string returns a copy of the character, not the character itself. So when it returns, for example, this O character, it's going to create a new character, assign it with O, and give that to your X variable. So you're changing your x variable and yes when you're printing that x variable it's going to be the p symbol but if you then start a printing again 
and remove this assignment over here and just print the value at that index, the character at that index, it's still going to be the same string. So this doesn't change the string itself. The same way that a for each loop, if you try to edit the um, iterating variable, if you say for each um, element i in a list of integers, if you edit that i element, it's not really editing the element of the list, it's just editing a variable uh, which you have at your code, which is just a copy of the element of the list. Okay, so that's immutability and even though there is immutability, you still have a right to access a value at an index. So that's how you access the values at that index. Okay. Now strings in Java use the Unicode standard. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> simply put, it means that you can represent pretty much any alphabet you can think of inside the Java string. So you can store uh, Cyrillic, you can store Japanese, Chinese, Mandarin, um, you can store, um, of course, English, because that's uh, the initial language which was used for computers when they were uh, starting, uh, Arabic and any other language you can think of. So Unicode is a standard which uh, covers all languages in uh, pretty much all languages in the world, even if we meet up with aliens at some point, it's, it has enough spare room in it to uh, put in more symbols if, if necessary. Um, and actually, web pages typically use Unicode, so that's why you can open them in any uh, place in the world, if they're coded properly, of course, and still see correct, uh, correctly displaying text. So Java strings are Unicode and you can rely on that, meaning that you can store any type of string in it. So you can even say, okay, so let's, um, let's initialize this string with the Cyrillic of Banitsa. And that is going to be a correct uh, initialization of a string. Now, when you print it to the console, that might, um, that might not render very well because the uh, because some consoles don't really support Unicode. So the Java code supports Unicode and it handles it correctly. However, the console might not support Unicode. Let's actually test that and see what uh, what gets printed. Now I, I expect IntelliJ to handle it correctly. Like, yes, it did. So it printed the elements of that uh, string correctly because it's inside the IntelliJ development environment, which probably has proper Unicode support for its console. Whereas, for example, the Windows console, which is the command prompt, doesn't really have Unicode support and you have to uh, make some specific settings in order to print non-ASCII uh, characters. But that's not something we're covering right now. What you need to remember is that Java actually with this uh, uh, Unicode support, supports any type of language, meaning that you can do text processing on any type of language in Java. And it handles, for example, to capital, uh, what you can do over here, one of the functions, it's a bit soon to show all of them, but one of the functions you can, uh, one of the features which string has is changing itself to a capital case representation. So this is a lowercase representation of the word banitsa uh, in Bulgarian. Uh, it's a type of food, let's say. Um, and this thing over here is lowercase. So you can change it to uh, uppercase. So to make all the letters capital. Now remember that any operation, since the string is immutable, any operation you do on a string actually doesn't change the string itself. Again, the string is immutable. What it does is produces a new string. So any operation that is a change of the data doesn't change the data itself. It creates a copy of the data, changes that copy and returns that copy. So what we can say now is replace text with the version of text copied, changed to uppercase, and then assigned back to text. So now what I'm going to see is this Banitsa text printed in capital case. So each of the uh, letters is going to be capitalized. Now, notice that Java handled this capitalization correctly. So it knows what 
the capital letter in Cyrillic for the letter B, the letter B in Cyrillic, uh, it knows what that looks like as a capital letter. And it knows it for English and it knows it for any other uh, language which supports, su supports such a distinction between capital case and lowercase. Now, what it uh, does when it sees something that doesn't have a capital case, for example, the numbers 1, 2, and 3, if you say to uppercase to one, two, three, well, what's going to happen is they won't change. So to uppercase changes to the uppercase of the appropriate character only if that character has such a thing as an uppercase. Now, because one, two, three don't have an upper, uh, uppercase, they will, they will simply remain the same. So over here we have one, two, three, which remain the same. Okay, so uh, we mentioned that, we mentioned uh, the to uppercase functionality, but what was more important is that Java has full-fledged Unicode support. So what does full Unicode support mean? Well, non-full Unicode support means that you can just store the data and you can do that in any type of character array because Unicode is again just ones and zeros. Um, however, Java has full Unicode support because it, in addition to storing the information, it can also manipulate that information in a reasonable way. So if I'm searching for the word Banitsa in some text uh, in Cyrillic, it will successfully find it. Whereas languages which don't have full Unicode support will not be able to find it or will not be able to capitalize um, the letters and so on. So full Unicode support means that you can do any operation on, uh, on characters uh, in any language, any operation you can do on English characters, you can do it in any other language. That's what full Unicode support means. Okay, so we already showed you how you conditionalize a string from a literal. Now, how you read it from the console, we've already done it a, a couple hundred times already probably, is using the next line function or simply the next function. Just, how, ju just like you have next int which reads an integer and reads it from where the white spaces stop and until the white spaces start so if you have uh if you have for some reason space then space then space then a new line then space then space again then the text hello then space then for example tab a tab symbol you know the tab key which inserts let's say four spaces for simplicity if you say if your console cursor is over here at the start of all of uh, all the stuff i typed in if you say dot next what you're going to get is this hello word so it's going to ignore anything that's a white space a white space character white space characters are uh, spaces new lines tabs and other non-visual characters so it's going to ignore everything until it reaches the first actual visible character in this case the character h and it's going to start reading the string until it reaches the next um, non-visual character in this case the tab and it's going to return the word hello to after this code so next will return hello in this case and next line simply reads an entire line so that means it reads any white spaces and any tab spaces whatever until it reaches a new line characters okay so that's how you read an entire line from the console. Now, what we haven't really discussed up until now in uh, lessons past is how you convert a string to a character array and back. Now, I already said that a string is essentially a character array. Well, if you already have a character array, so let's say, let's get something shorter over here. So let's say you have a character array, character array letters. And let's initialize it with a new character array containing the letters A, B, and C. If you want to convert that into a string, because you can't really, I can't really print these letters out now in a single uh, line of code. I can't say print letters. Uh, well, I can, but they're going to be get printed out in a special way, which is reserved reserved for arrays in Java. Uh, instead, what I can do is say get a string and call that string text for example and initialize it as a new string now notice that i'm using the keyword new the same way i'm using the keyword new for lists for maps uh for other data structures well the same way i can use the keyword new with the string class 
every class has, well, not really every class, but most classes have a so-called constructor. We've discussed constructors already. And the string class also has a constructor. Now, this call over here is equivalent to just typing in two quotes uh, without any spaces between them. So this is an empty string. However, if you pass in a character array over here, so if you pass in letters over here, it's going to initialize the string's internal character array with the character, character array you've passed in. So it's going to copy this data and initialize the string with it. Now, if I remove this for loop over here, what's going to happen is we're going to ha have the characters A, B, and C printed next to each other on a single line. Here they are. Okay, so that's how you convert a string into, uh, that's how you convert a character array into a string. But how do we get the character array back, back from the string? Well, we say text dot to character array, to char array. Now you might, this, what this does, it's this returns a character array, array which is contained, in, contained inside the text. So it's going to return an equivalent, an array equivalent to letters. So let's see, let's say this is a character array text characters equals text dot two character array. And this is the character array inside the uh, text. So if you want to convert it back into a character array, this is how you do it. Okay. So you might have noticed that there are other functions over here. For example, you have get characters. And what this does is it gets a uh, starting index and an ending index inside this text variable and then it gets a destination character array and a position from which to start so it moves this range of characters it copies this range of characters into this destination character array from the beginning index now this isn't really something you're going to be using that often but you could uh, try it out if you would like okay so Let's, once we've covered what strings are, essentially, let's co cover how we can manipulate them. And then we're going to have a short break. So how do you manipulate strings? We've already seen the plus and plus equals operators on strings. This is called concatenation. So concatenation means joining up strings one after the other in a sequence. Okay, so what does the plus operator do for strings? It's a specially coded operation in Java, specially for strings. So this is the only non-primitive type in Java that supports the plus operation and consequently the plus equals operation, the assignment with increment operation. No other class can support these operators in Java. In other languages, it's possible to define these operators for other classes too. However, in Java, uh, the road that's been picked is for these operators to be explicitly explicitly reserved for primitive types, integers, characters, doubles, etc., and for the string data type to ease to make writing string concatenation easier. So what this does, it is it creates a new string on each plus operation. So what it's going to do is okay. So let's join up hello and this comma over here that creates a string and then. It does the same operation over this string and this string and it creates a bigger string containing all of the text. So concatenation simply appends to the end of the, the string. So it appends the left string with the right string, whatever the right string is. So whatever's left of the plus sign is uh, merged up with the whatever's right of the plus sign. I, I may have just uh, misspoken So let uh, about which gets concatenated where. So whatever is on the left remains on the left in the concatenated string. Whatever's on the right remains on the right on the, in the concatenated string and they become one string, they get joined. So in this case, what's going to happen is this plus operation is essentially going to join up these two literals. And then this plus operation is going to join up these two literals. So that's what the plus operation does. Okay, so getting back to the lecture, uh, you can concatenate literals like this. So you can contain, concatenate this literal with this literal and with this literal, but you can also concatenate on 
a variable. So once you have a string variable over here, if you concatenate the literal onto it, it gets appended, of course, to the end of the string contents. Again, this is something which we've probably uh, seen a, a lot of times by now. So let's not uh, hang on too much on it. Now, there's also a concat method. The concat method is just uh, the longer uh, expression of the plus sign. So concat and plus are the exact same thing. Whatever you write plus inside uh, Java, it gets translated into concat. That's how you can think about it. How does it look like? Well, you tell the thing you want to concatenate to dot concat, and then you provide a parameter what, get, what gets concatenated. So this is the exact same thing as saying greet plus name. And again, it doesn't modify this greet variable. It just creates a new variable containing the concatenation. So any operation on a string that looks like it's going to modify something, it's not going to modify the string itself. It's going to modify the a new variable, a new string, which is the copy of the string you're using, and it's going to do whatever operations you've requested. OK, so this will print hello John in this case. OK, so now we have a task and we're going to solve that and then we're going to see how uh, we can do more operations on string. So what we have is an array of strings read from somewhere. Uh, now, what we have to do is we have to re repeat each word, each string in these uh, strings, uh, n times where n is the length of the word that's been provided. So in this case, we have hi, abc and add add. And we want to repeat each of these. Hi is going to be repeated two times. ABC is going to be repeated three times. And add is going to be repeated again three times. And we want all of this concatenated into a single string. OK, so how do we do that? Well, there are a few, few ways we can achieve this. But since we now have sort of two parts of this task, task so one part is repeat a single string multiple times. And then the other part is concatenate all of these strings together. What we're going to do is write some methods which do this work for us. OK, so here we have some examples. Let's say work. So work is going to be repeated four times because it's four letters. So repeat it four times and we get work, 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 work. That sounds like one song that was popular at some point. Whatever. So let's do that. We are opening uh, an IntelliJ development environment. And now what we're going to do, well, we have a line of strings on the console. How uh, did we read a line of strings from the console? Well, we need a scanner first. So let's create a scanner and tell it to read from system dot in. OK, so this is our scanner. And this scanner, we're going to tell we want to read a line with it because we have a line of strings. And that line of strings contains uh, splits by spaces. So it's going to be split by spaces. So we want to split it by that space. We've done that already. And what we're going to get is a string array of words. Now, what we need to do from here on out is go onto each word and for each word, repeat it n times. So what we actually need is a method which returns a word repeated a string repeated n times where n is a parameter which we can provide so what i'm going to write over here is a static static string uh, repeat method and it's going to get a string s and it's going to get an integer um, times how many times we want to repeat it so we're, we'd be calling this repeat uh, method like so we we'd be saying repeat the word hello let's say five times if we're uh, if we want to achieve what the task says so we have five letters inside hello and saying repeat hello five times would yield a new string which is the result string uh, repeated let's say which is equal to repeat hello five times okay now, I'm going to remove this in a bit, but I'm going to leave it for now so we can remember what we want to achieve. OK, so we know how many times this string is going to be repeated. Now, how can we repeat the string? Well, there are, there are several ways, and uh, there's a way inside the slides which is shown, and I'm going to show it uh, uh, when, I, when we solve this task. But uh, we're going to solve this task in a different way from the one that's shown in the slides. And 
at the end of this lesson, you're going to learn why I did that, did that in that way. Okay, so what I'm going to do now uh, to repeat the string n times, of course, I can append to, to its end itself the number of times which has been specified, but I will not be doing that. Instead, I'll do the following thing. I'll create a string array which contains the repetitions of this string. And how long is this array going to be? Well, it's going to be as, as many elements as there are times, as there are repetitions of the string. So let's create a new string array which contains times elements, so this number of elements. And then I'm going to be doing some magic over here to fill in the string array. And then I'm going to be returning string.join join up this string array repetitions with no delimiter, with an empty delimiter. So this is string.empty. Uh, okay, so all I need to do now is fill in this string array with this string. Each element needs to be this string. So each of the elements in this times length string array is going to be the string which is received as a first parameter of this method. So starting from zero, continuing until I reach times, I need to set the index i to the string s of repetitions. Okay, and now what's going to happen? Well, if I provide hello with five times, what's going to happen is we're going to initialize an array of five elements. And then we're going to assign each of these elements to the word hello. And then I'm going to join these hello words with no delimiter and return that. So that gives me the word hello repeated five times. Okay, and now all I need to do is walk on each of these words, meaning that I need to access each of these words, create its repetitions, and then build a string which contains all of these repetitions. So. What am I going to produce at the end? Well, I'm going to produce, produce a single string. And that single string is going to contain all of the symbols which I'm, uh, which I'm going to be generating. So this is my string result. And that's an empty string initially. And then I'm going to walk on each of these words, meaning I'm going to visit each of these words. And then I'm going to say, okay, so append this word to the result, but not the word itself. I'm going to say result append. What do I need to append? Well, I need to append this word its length amount of times. So what I need to do is say append the repetition of this word, word dot length amount of times. So repeat this word this amount of times. And now I'm going to s out tab print this out on the console. So I'm going to print out result on the console. Now, this part I don't like. Why? Well, I'm appending to a single string. I intentionally avoided doing that over here, but I can't really do it. Well, I actually can. Uh, I actually can avoid appending to a single string multiple times. And we're going to talk about why I want to avoid this at the end of this lesson. So hold on tight. Until then, um, what, do, what actually do I want to achieve? Well, I essentially want to achieve the same thing, right? So. Uh, I want to have an array which contains each of these words uh, which I'm repeating. And then, so each of the repetitions is just a single string of that word repeated multiple times. So I'm going to actually create an array which is called result. So this is a string array result and that gets initialized with how many elements are there going to be? Well, as many as there are words. So words.length. Why as many as there are words? Well, because each of the words gets repeated n times, where n is its length. And what I get in the end is a single string. So for each word, I get a single string. So there's a direct correlation between the words over here and the strings over here. OK, so now instead of doing this type of loop, I'm going to create an index, index for loop. And I can tell IntelliJ to do that for me. OK, so I'm getting an index for loop and then I'm, I'll just be saying result at position i, assign that to the repetition of this word. And then I'm not going to be printing result, but I'm going to be printing what? This join uh, operation, right? So I'm going to be joining in the result without any spaces. So I avoided concatenating onto the same string. And now if I start this code, I assign each of the result elements to the repetition of the appropriate word. 
each one word at a time. And then I just join up all of these repeated words. So now if I open this code and I mark this high ABC and add and I enter it, I get the output that was expected. Okay, so one way of concatenating strings efficiently is just create an array with enough elements and then copy the strings which you want to concatenate. If there are multiple elements you want to concatenate, it's more efficient to create an array with, if you know the length which you need. If you don't know the, the length which you need, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to create a list, right? Because lists can be joined in the same way with string.join that arrays can be joined in. Okay, so you're going, you're going to create a list of, um, of strings if you don't know the length and an array of strings if you do know the length. And then you're going to assign each element of that array to the string which you want on that position in the result. So you're going, you're actually, uh, you're somewhat appending to an array and then you're joining up that array into a single string without delimiters. Or if the task requires some delimiter, well, then you'd provide the delimiter over here. And we did this, the, pretty much the same thing over here when we repeated a single string n times. Okay, so uh, we solved this task and here's another solution for that task, which uses string concatenation. Here, what we do is we just run a for loop on, a, on each of the words, and then we figure out how many times we need to repeat uh, the word, and then we run a for loop and just start, start appending to the string result. Now, this will solve the task, but it's very inefficient. It's very slow. And we will explain why it is very slow at the end of this lesson again. I showed you a more efficient way of doing it. And then I'll show you another efficient way of doing it when we reach the end of the lesson. But again, this is one other solution to this task. Okay, now up until this point, all we've been talking about is how we can create new strings from existing strings. We've been concatenating, we've been um, accessing the entire string object. After the break, we're going to be talking about how we can access parts of the data of the string. And now we're going to be talking about how we can work with the contents of a string. Up, up until this point, we've been using the entire contents of a string. But from here on out, we're going to be talking about how we can access parts of that, those contents of the string and what features Java has for doing that. So one common operation in programming when you're doing text, text processing is getting a substring of an existing string. So what's a substring? Let's open up IntelliJ. Well, let's say I have my uh, string text, which is equal to hello, what's up? And what a substring is, is just a part of a string. So hello is a substring of the hello, what's up string. And what's is a substring. And L O comma space W is also a substring of the text string and up is space U P is also a substring. So a substring is just a sequence of characters, a sequence of elements inside the string. There's also such a thing as a sub list or a sub array, which just, which is just a part of respectively a list or an array, the consecutive elements of a list or of an array. So a substring, is just consecutive elements of another string. Uh, also, the entire string is also a substring of itself because it's a substring which has the same length as the entire string. So this is also a substring. Okay, so let's get a substring of this text. It's very common for uh, text processing programs to get parts of a string and do something for them. Okay, so let's say we want to get this what's part. How do we get that? Well, since every element inside the string has an index, now this is index 0, and this is index 1, this is index 2, this is index 3, the second L, and index 4 is the O, uh, we got shifted a bit, and index 5 is the comma, and index 6 is the space, we're here, that means that what starts at index 7, right? So it starts at index 7 and it continues on to index 8, index 9, index 10, index 11, index 12. That's the last one. And the first symbol after the last one is at index, what, what, where did we get? We got to 13, I think. Let's count again. 7, H is 8, A is 9, T is 10, 
the apostrophe is 11, the S is 12, and this space over here is index 13. Okay, so how do I get a sub substring in Java? I say text.give me, uh, text.substring, and I provide a beginning index. In this case, it was 7, the start, start index, the first letter I want to get. And then I provide a second parameter, which is one past the last index. The same way you write a for loop by saying that i should be less than the length of the let's say array in the same way here we when the length of the array is one more than the last element well here we provide one more than the last element as an index so in this case we're providing index 13 so this gets a substring from 7 inclusive to 13 exclusive so it never reaches 13 it reaches the last index will be actually 12 so if you say uh, I want a substring from 7 to 13. That's going to give you the characters from 7 to 12 inclusive. 13 is the, the place where the for loop has to stop. That, that's how you can think about it. The same way you provide a length when you're iterating an array and you're, you say i is less than length. The same way you provide 13 here, which would mean that i is less than 13, which would mean that i, the index, is going to reach 12 inclusively, get that character and then stop. Okay, so this is, if we print this to the console, we say s out, we can print the text.substring from 7 to 13, and that's going to give us the what's word. Okay, so here we have it, the word what's, we got it as a substring from the string. So that's all a substring is. Now, there are other ways you can call substring. For example, you can say substring start from seven and you don't provide an end, in, end index. What it does in this case is just tape up all the symbols up until the end of the string. It doesn't matter how many of those symbols there are, wherever the string ends, that's where your substring is going to end. It's pretty common to do such operations. For example, if you're working on a Windows file system and you want to um, get the extension of a file, what, what do you do? Well, you find the last dot inside the file name. For example, you have hello.txt. You find the last dot and then you get a substring starting from the next index. And you don't really care how many indices there are, right? You, you just care that you get the entire substring. So it may be .txt or it may be .gz or it may be .something else, .bmp, .png and so on. They, they are different lengths. So what you do is you just say .substring from some point onward and you get the entire substring to the end. So printing this will yield us what's up on the next line after the line of just what's. That's what substring does. It's a pretty simple operation. Of course, you can implement it yourself. You just write a for loop and then you start appending inside the string, uh, the, each character of the string you're looking uh, at. So substring just starts a for loop at this index and continues up until the for loop reaches this index. When it reaches that index, it doesn't take the character. Or if you don't provide a character, uh, if you don't provide an end index, it just continues on until the end uh, of the string. Okay, so that's what substring does. In this case, getting a substring from the card 10c will just give you 1 and 0 because this is index 0, this is index 1, and this is index 2. And getting from 0 to 2 means get all the characters from 0 to 1 inclusive to exclusive, we don't reach 2, and that gives us the string 10. Okay, so if you do just provide a start index, in this case, the 11th index which we're providing here is this index we're just going to get uh, actually the 11th index is this one so we're going to get space john and that's what we have over uh, maybe space john maybe not i have to count the, the characters okay let's count them so zero one two no don't forget the spaces three four five six seven eight nine this one's going to be 10, and I'll mark it with a zero. So this one's going to be 10 over here. So John is 11. This is index 11 over here. So yeah, that means that we're just going to get John from John to the end of the string. Okay, so that's what substring does. It just gets, it starts a for loop from this index 
until the index is less than the second index or until the index is less than the length of the string. And it returns the characters that the index visited. Now, another thing you can do on strings is search their contents. So if you say index of, that's going to return the first match of a string you provide over here or the index minus one. So it's either going to return the, the first matches index, so the index at which it starts, or it's going to return minus one. So in this case, if I say um, text dot index of, and you can provide characters here, or you can provide strings, both work. So if I say uh, print the index of what's, so s out this thing, print this thing, What's going to get output is seven because that's the index of the W character inside uh, the sub inside the string text. So here we have seven. Now, if I say index of what's like this, so without the apostrophe, does uh, is what's contained inside the string? Well, no, it isn't. There's no such string which contains five characters which uh, contains W H A T S. There's a string that contains W, w H A T apostrophe S, but that's a different string, right? It's, it's a different sequence. It might contain the same characters plus one more, but it's a different sequence. So this one is in the middle of, uh, it's inside the string I'm looking for. So this will not be found. Now, if I start this, we're going to get the index minus one. So minus one indicates to us that there's no such index. There's no such uh, substring in our string. Now, if there was a, a string over here, which is, for example, what's up like this, it's going to find it. Why is it going to find it? Well, because here's the sequence, right? So if I search for this inside of IntelliJ, look, it, it finds it, right? It's this sequence, even though there are more things after it, IntelliJ doesn't, uh, Java doesn't really care what's after it. It just cares that it matches this sequence of elements. Whether there are spaces after it or other letters or uh, numbers or other or any type of other character, it's still going to find it if it's the same sequence. Okay, so this is going to yield, what would it be? Um, how many symbols are there up to here? There are 17 characters up to here. If you mark some text in IntelliJ, you can see how many characters it contains over here. Okay, so those are 17 characters. So this, this piece of code should print out 18, right? So because this is the um, index of what's in the string. Let's see. I might have miscalculated, but I think that's what it uh, actually starting from zero is going to print 17, right? Because there are 17 characters up until here. So this is, this means this is the 18th character, but since we're starting from zero, right? So this is the first character, but since indices start from zero, this is going to be zero, right? So since this is the 18th character, since this is the, let's keep the colors consistent. Since this is the 18th character, it means that it's the 17th index. Okay. So if there are 17 characters before a certain character in a string, its index is 17. Okay, so it printed out this one, not this one, because this sequence of characters is not the same as this sequence of characters. Okay, so it returns minus one if it doesn't find it, and it returns its index if it does find it. Okay, so in this case, if you use, in this example, if you initialize a string with banana, kiwi, apple, and so on, and you say, give me the index of banana is going to give you zero because banana starts at index zero. It doesn't matter how long it is. It matters where it starts. Okay. And orange is going to give you minus one because there's no such thing as an orange in our fruits string. So minus one is not a valid index for an array, right? That's why the result is minus one because you know that it can't be the, the, uh, a correct index. So this definitely uh, guarantees that it, there's no such thing inside the fruits array. And again, this is something you can code yourself. How do you do it? You run a for loop and you check for finding the first character. If the first character, uh, if the character at position I of the for loop um, equals the first character of the word you're searching for, 
then you check for the next character and the next character how do you do that well, with another for loop so one for loop for iterating the text and another for loop when you detect in, inside that inside the text iterating loop another nested loop which searches for um, the the next character so you if you find the first character matches then you check the next character of the string you're searching for with the next character inside the uh, inside the text and so on. But instead of writing that uh, uh, on your own, you can just use index of. And last index of does the same thing that index of does, but it starts from the back. So if you search for apple with index of, so how many characters are there? Well, it's going to find this apple. If you search for index of uh, for apple, but if you search for last index of, it's going to find the last apple. So it basically does the same thing, but it starts in reverse. So it starts looking for from the last item over here. So if, it, if you look for banana, it's going to find this banana instead of this banana. If you use last index of. If you search for orange, it's still going to return minus one. Okay. Now, one more thing you need to know about index of. Let's say you have uh, a letter... Uh, let's say you have a string twice like for example we have up over here how do i find oh, okay let's say you have it three times by the way uh, searching is case sensitive so if you uh, if you search for up capital case you will not find it you will have you will find this one but if you search for up capital case if there's no up capital case it will not find the lower case up okay so if we have up three times, how do I find the middle one? Or if I have it multiple times, how do I find the nth one? So I, I can find the first one with first index of, I can find the last one with last index of, how do I find the one in the middle? Well, I do, uh, let's say I want to find, um, I have an integer n, and I want to find the nth uh, occurrence. So if n is 1, I want to find the first one. If I'm searching for up, I, I want to find this one. If I'm searching for the sep second one, well, n is going to be 2, and so on. How do I do that? Well, I can say um, uh, int occurrence, which is the current occurrence for which I'm searching, and let's say that, that that's 0, so I haven't found one yet. And now I'm going to say while occurrence is less than n, so while I'm while there's search, something to be searching for, I'm going to say text.index of, and let's say it's up the thing I'm searching for. Otherwise, this would be just a string variable, which I provide as a parameter. So I say this is the index, uh, in the index at which I found it. Okay, so this is the index. And if the index is not minus one, then I found something. Since I found something, I need to increase the occurrence by one, right? So occurrence plus plus, I found one. Okay, so the moment that occurrence reaches n, I, I would have found at index, the last index of this uh, up thing. So what I do is move this index outside, call set it to minus one, because uh, in that case, I will just indicate I haven't found anything. Um, and then I'd say index equals text.index of up. And when this loop com completes, what's going to happen? Actually, let's cover the uh, let's cover the case in which I find minus one. If I uh, search for up and I get minus one, do I need to search anymore? No, because that means there aren't any other uh, occurrences of up. So actually, this loop is good. I'm going to change it a bit, and I'm going to do um, if index is equal to minus one, I have no uh, no job looking anymore, so I can just break the loop. Nothing to do here anymore. <coughs> However, if I don't break the loop, I need to indicate that I found something. So when I exit this loop, what's going to happen is that index will contain the index of that substring up for which I said I want to search. Now. This isn't really true at this point, that, that's my idea, but uh, it isn't really true because index of always starts from uh, the last place uh, where uh, I started search. Uh, uh, index of always starts searching from the start of the string. Now what I want to happen is I want this index to 
if I find, find the first step, then I want the second index of to start looking from after that index. So I want to start looking from index plus one and I can provide that as a parameter. So the second parameter of index of is the index from which to start, start searching. So if I provide zero over here, which is going to be the case for the first execution because minus one plus one is zero. So if I say search for up from index zero, it's going to find if there's an up at index zero, it's going to find that one or the next one after that. And if I find one up inside the string, then I assign that to the last index I found, I increase the occurrences, and then the next time I start searching, I start searching for index plus one. So when I find this up, I'm going to start searching from the P next time. So that will not find this up, if I want to continue searching, of course, it will find the next one, it will find this one. And then I'm going to start searching from the P of this one, and then I'm going to get this one at the, at the final part. So now if I print out S out, print out that index, what I'm going to get is, let's wait a bit, 14, which, uh, where's 14? Well, 14 is over here, right? So up until here, there are 14 characters. So this first step is at index 14, which is exactly what I indicated over here. Now, if I want to find the second up, I will just modify this N over here to two and start it and then I'm going to get what index well there are 23 characters up until here so this is index 23 and that's what I got so here you have a piece of code which finds the nth occurrence of a string in, of a string inside another string so what I wanted actually to show you is what the second parameter of index of does it tells index of to search from this index onwards so disregard anything before this index and start from this index onwards. Okay, now another, another thing that strings have is the contains method. What does the contains method do? Well, it does an index of, and then it checks whether that index is different than minus one, right? Because <coughs> that's how you check if a string is contained inside the text. <coughs> you just search for it, and if you can't find it, meaning you get the return value of minus one, then that means that uh, the answer of the Boolean question, is that string contained in that string? Well, it's either true or false, depending on whether you got minus one or not. Okay, so if I say I love fruits as a string, save that as a string, and then I search inside that I love fruits string for the word fruits, that's going to give an index that's different than minus one, right? Since the index is different than minus one, the result is going to be true. Otherwise, if I search for banana in the same string, I'm going to get the index minus one. And the since the check is minus one different than minus one is going to return false, well, that's why this method returns false. So this method returns either true or false based on whether a, cer a certain substring is contained inside a certain string. Now, it, it is sometimes useful because you don't, uh, sometimes you don't, really care about the item itself, but you care about whether it appears in the substring or not. But in most cases, I'd, I'd advise you to use index of, because in most cases, if you're searching for something, you're probably going to be doing something with it. Okay, so now we have a text and we have to remove all substrings of a word from that text. So for example, here we have ice and we have K, ice, G, ice, uh, ice, C. Now uh, this might be uh, this might be a bit wrong considering the output. So we have ice and we have k ice then g ice then uh, again ice then b. So what that what does that give us? Well, k g and b. We've removed all ices from here, and we got k g b. Okay, and if we want to return uh, uh, to remove ABC from here, what do we get? Well, we get T, T, Q, Q, double. This is also not exactly correct, right? Because we have a C over here and that has to be removed too. Let's see if this word, uh, if this example is correct. So we have word over here, word over here, and then word over here. And yeah, only ABC remains. So this example is also not exactly correct. So this is the proper output for this example. Okay, we fixed that up. 
hopefully you've been watching carefully, you need to watch carefully the, this sort of uh, example sometimes may be wrong. So you need to be vigilant and look for such errors. Okay, so uh, we have uh, these three examples. What we need to do is remove a certain word from a certain string. We need to leave the string containing only uh, the letters which are not part of that word. Now, there are a few ways you can do this, uh, a few interesting ways. One option, the obvious, op the obvious option based on what we know up until this point, is what? Well, we can uh, start from the beginning of the string and then search for the keyword which we've been provided with. So I search for the first occurrence of this ice and I get the substring from where I am currently to the first position of this ice. So I get a substring from, let's say I'm at position zero now, and I get a, a substring from position zero to the index of this thing. So index of this thing is one, right? So I get the substring from zero to one, and that gives me the letter K. And then I need to continue on I need to set my current index to the letter G, right? I need to skip this word. Well, I get its index, the index to which I, uh, which I reached. And then I jump as many characters as the keyword is long. So at index one, if I add three symbols, I get index four, right? So I'm getting over here. I'm positioning myself over here at index four. And then I repeat the same thing. I look for the next index uh, of the string and I get that substring from four to, in this case, five. Okay, so I get then G and I append it to my uh, string or I add it into a list which I'm going to join up at the end. Okay, and then what do I do? Well, I move from this position, three positions forward, because that's the length of my keyword, and I ref it position eight. Okay, so this is position eight. And here I immediately find ice, right? So there is no substring over here. I'm going to get the substring from index eight to index eight. And that's going to be the empty string. And I add it again into the list. I don't need to do any special handling. I mean, I might do special handling if I see that the sub string is empty, there's no point in adding it. But if I add an empty string into a string, that doesn't really change the string I'm constructing. So I can have the code do the same thing. And then eight is going to be summed up with three again, because that's the length of my keyword. And I'm going to get 11. And then I'm going to search for ice again. So from 11, I'm going to search for ice and I'm going to get minus one because there are no more occurrences of ice right from here on out. So I need to do special handling for minus one. If I see minus one, what do I need to do? Well, in this case, I need to get the string up until it's end, but I'm at its end, so I'm getting that string. So what's the logic? The logic is create a list of strings and then start at position zero. And each time search for the next occurrence of the keyword get that index, in this case one, get that index, get the substring from the posi position you are, at, you are at now. So this red thing I'm writing in, that's one of your variables. And the other variable is the search. Okay, so get the substring from the red variable to the blue variable, from the position you are at now to the position of the next ice occurrence. Uh, the next keyword occurrence. So get that substring, add it into the list of strings. And then change your current index to be equal to the search index plus, uh, plus the length of the search word. And that only if the search index is different than minus one. The moment the search index becomes minus one, you just get the substring from your position to without an end position, meaning to the length of the string, and you add that into the list of strings. And when that for loop, uh, when that while loop, that would be a while loop because you're changing the index. When that while loop finishes, what do you do? Well, you simply join up the list of strings into a single string and that's the result. Now you can do it a few other ways and I'm going to use um, another way to do it. Uh, well, no, actually the other way is in the slide. So let's do that. Let's do this solution using our index of knowledge, which we have up, up until this point. Okay, so instead of uh, reading input from the console, I'll, I'll just use the input I've generated over here. So let's say I want to remove all ups from this text. So how do I do that? Well, let's try. Now, what do what will I do? I say 
here's my current position in current position current index or current position and I'd start from zero because I want to start from the first symbols in my string okay and now while the current position is less than uh, the size of the string is less than the text less than the text dot length I'd say well current position first um, find the index in search index find the index of let's say this is the keyword string keyword and let's say it's up again you can modify it afterwards at home so that this task uh, this input gets read from the console and this keyword also gets read from the console but here we're not uh, learning about how we can read from the console we're focusing on the algorithm for uh, processing a string so the search index is text dot it's actually better to call it the keyword index okay so the keyword index is find inside the text the keyword right but since i'm doing this on each iteration and the current position is going to change i'm going to provide current position as a start index from which we're searching so i'm going to be searching from the current position onwards and first uh, the first time it's going to be from position zero onward so inclusively so that's okay and the next time when i change the current position well it's going to be searching from after the current position and actually yeah that yeah that seems okay for me okay so now let's get uh, the index so if the index is different than minus one if keyword index is different than minus one if i found something then I have some work to do. Now let's create our list of strings in which I'm going to be adding the part. So I want to add this part inside the list of strings and then I want to add this part inside the list of strings and then I want to add this part inside the list of strings. Okay, so what do I do? Well, this is my parts list, new array list. I don't know how many parts there are going to be so that's why I'm using a list, not an array, okay? So if the keyword index is not minus one, then I found something, then I need to get the next part. So the next part, this part, is the text, give me the substring. So I'm getting the substring from the text, which substring? Well, from the current position to the keyword index. I don't want to include the keyword, right? So that's why I'm providing the keyword index because this index over here is exclusive. Okay, so this is my part and I just need to add that part into the parts, parts.add part. And then I need to move my current position, right? How, for, how much further do I need to move that uh, current position? Well, I need to move it to the position after the keyword. So I need to say that current position is the keyword index where the keyword starts. So in this case, it's going to be index 14 because there are 14 symbols over here in the text I've marked. So index 14, and so this is index 14, this is index 15. So I want to avoid index 14 and 15 and I want to go to index 16, right? So I need to add 14 plus two, plus the size of the keyword. So keyword index becomes, uh, uh, position becomes keyword index plus keyword dot length, the length of the keyword. Okay, and this finds, uh, this is almost everything I need. Now, one additional thing I need to do if, is, is if the keyword index isn't minus one, uh, if, meaning if the keyword index is minus one, in this case, it isn't minus one, and in the else, it is minus one. So in this case, I do parts dot add everything that remains because there are no more keywords uh, of this kind so add everything that remains how do i add everything that remains well i'm at position current position so i need to add text dot substring starting from current position and that's it and then i need to just break the loop because i don't need to search anymore because i've added everything i need to add okay so let's print that out and see if it works correctly so print out string string dot join parts join that with no delimiter with an empty delimiter now i could assign this to a variable and i could actually make this entire thing into a method right but i'm just going to uh join it now and print it out into the call uh, onto the console okay so let's see what's going to happen i expect to see hello what then that up doesn't exist then two spaces then uh this what's again and then two commas because these ups need to be removed and that's exactly what i got
Okay, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do the same thing is to uh, use the replace method. Now, instead of getting what I need, I'm removing what I don't need. So what does replace do? We'll see it in a few slides. Replace gets a string which we need to, uh, we're calling it a key here or a keyword um, in, the pre in my example. So what replace does is it finds the string uh, which you want to replace and then re it replaces it with another string. So you can just replace each item. Now this replaces all of them. So a single re replace should actually do. So you can just say uh, text.replace the keyword with an empty string. Instead of doing this entire thing, you can just replace inside the string with the empty string and that's going to give you the result and then print out the result. Okay, we're going to see the replace in a bit. First, let's talk about splitting. So what does splitting do? Well, you give it a so-called pattern. In the next lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, regular expressions, and that's the pattern you're providing over here in the split part. So split gets a regular expression over here. A regular expression is just a rule that determines a pattern of strings which need to be found or replaced or so on. So in the split case, whatever you provide over here, uh, gets uh, the the string gets split by it. You've already done it by providing spaces. You can also provide comma and space. You can provide a word over here and so on. You can provide a lot of stuff. So this splits by spaces. Uh, but if you want to split by multiple things, you place these multiple things inside these square brackets. So you, you place square brackets and then you uh, mention all of the things you want split. So everything you want uh, that text to split by. So in this case, it's going to split by the comma, the space, uh, and the dot. So you're going to get this string, then this empty string over here because it's between a comma and a space. Uh, then you're going to get I, then you're going to get M, then you're going to get John, then you're going to get this empty string between John and the dot. And then you're going to get one more empty string after the dot. So that's what uh, this split by multiple separators does. Okay, so this is splitting. Splitting just uh, removes removes all of the occurrences of the symbols you've uh, enumerated here, the, the symbols which you've provided here, and leaves you with a list of what parts remain without those separators. And it gives you an array for that. So this is going to give you hello, I am, and John, and that's going to uh, contain the split text. Okay, so that's how you split by multiple separators. Again, we're going to have an entire lecture about regular expressions and what this text over here means and what this plus means and how it removes the empty strings I mentioned uh, while I was talking about this because I initially said if you split by this, you're going to get empty strings uh, in some position, but if you split by this, you're not. So again, um, this is something we're, which we're going to be talking about a lot in the next lesson. But for this lesson, all you need to know is that split simply removes these items from the string and converts everything else in the string into an array of strings which uh, start for, uh, which are between these items in the string. Okay, so we've done this a few times already, so I will not be um, uh, staying on this uh, much more. The more interesting subject is splitting by uh, multiple uh, uh, separators and by patterns, but we will not be discussing this right now. However, one thing you could do is for this substring task, which you, in which you had to replace everywhere you uh, encounter the keyword, well, what could you do here? Well, one option, although I wouldn't advise for it, would be to say uh, the text dot split, split that into, in this case, eyes, right? What will that do? Well, it will split it by this sequence of characters, meaning it will give you an array of strings, and that array of strings will contain the string K, it will contain the string G, and it will contain the string B, and that, uh, th that array of strings you can join up into a single string. So you can solve this task with splitting too. It essentially would do something similar to replacing, 
but it will give you an array of strings instead of a single string and you can join that array of strings into a single string so you can split this way uh, you can split the string this way and it's going to solve this task also so that's why i said there are a lot of ways to solve this task but i'd suggest uh, using the replace method it's probably going to be the most efficient of all of them okay so let's talk about that replace actually what replace does is it gets something for which to search and a, and a replacement with which to replace so you get again a new string anything that looks like it's going to modify a string well it will not modify the string it will just give you a new string containing the uh, result after the replacement the old string will will remain whatever it was so in this case we have hello john at soft uni dot uh, bg and if you replace that with if you say replace john at soft uni dot bg with john at soft uni dot com what you're going to get is the text with all positions containing john at soft uni bg replaced with john at soft uni dot com so replace replaces everything in java so replace simply replaces all the occurrences of a sequence of characters in java there's also replace all that it it depends what kind of parameters you're passing in so here we have a task which in which we have to do something similar to that so we have some band words in this case the band words are linux and windows and then we have a string this is a single line uh, we have a string of text and we need to replace each of these words uh, each of the occurrences of these words with asterisks and the asterisks need to be the length of the, uh, the the length of the word so each symbol over here needs to be replaced with an asterisk okay so how do we do that well we have a replace function so let's read the keywords now we're go getting the keyword separated by a comma and a space so we're going to get the text from the scanner dot next line but we're also going to read a scanner dot next line before that which contains the separators so the separators in this case uh, uh, not the separators the band words are these so we're going to get a line and we need to split that line by a comma and a space because that's what our separator is this is the separator so we have this entire string and we need to separate it into linux and windows so we need to split by comma and space okay and those are our band words okay so we need to replace each of these band words with asterisks how do we do that well let's try let's remove this code over here um, we'll remove this the text also so each of the band words we find we need to replace it with uh, asterisks as long as that band word is okay so what i'm going to do is I need to do this for each word, right? I could iterate the text and then for each position in the text check, uh, check whether from that position in the text there's one of the band words, but that's a bit more difficult. What I can do instead is just say for each of the band words, for each of the band words, uh, give me the text and replace what does replace do well replace accepts uh, a string which is a regular expression or a character sequence and a character replacement so if i say replace that's going to be so that's going to want a character sequence now you might be wondering what's a character sequence well a string is a character sequence and there are other things which are character sequences but a string is a character sequence and that's why there's replace without replace all and there's replace all which accepts a regular expression so replace all will ex accept a regular expression for uh, about which we're going to talk about further on and replace simply like this will expect just a sequence of symbols which it needs to find and replace so what do i need to find i need to find the band word and what do i need to replace it with well i need to replace it with with asterisks Aster, asterix i maybe not sure what the multiple of that word is so i need to replace it with this symbol i repeat it as many times as the word is long well how do i do that well 
I already have a method which does that, right? It repeats a string a certain amount of times. Sure, the string is just a single asterisk which I need to repeat, and I need to repeat it. Okay, let's say repeat, repeat this asterisk asterisks string with uh, what amount of times? Well, the band word amount of times. And replace replaces everything. So every occurrence of the band word is going to re be replaced with this thing over here. Okay. However, and notice that IntelliJ is warning me about this. However, this replace over here doesn't really do anything, right? Because the way I've written it now, I'm expecting, expecting it to modify text. But it isn't modifying text because, again, strings in Java are not mutable. They are immutable. So you can't replace, uh, you can't edit this text directly. What you need to do, this generates a new string and you need to replace the current text with the text with these modifications. The same way uh, uh, you do for a sum, right? You have an integer sum and then you're let's say iterating items in an array and then you're summing into the current sum. So you're saying the current sum equals the current sum plus the integer. So you're replacing the sum variable with the with itself plus the integer. So a sum plus an integer is just a new integer. It doesn't contain, it doesn't change the existing sum. It just creates a new sum and you assign it back to the sum which you had. So it, it, when you say sum plus equals integer, that's the same as saying sum equals sum plus integer. And in this case, we're saying text equals text dot replace because this is this generates a new string and we assign that new string to our old variable and we're getting rid of the old variable's value. So we're getting rid of the previous string which did which did contain that band word and assigning to our variable a string that doesn't contain that that uh, band word. Okay, so how do we print this out? Well, we just say s out and print out the text. And that's it. Let's start this code and copy the input. So we're getting Linux and Windows on the same line on the console, pasting them in, and then we're replacing Linux with five asterisks, asterisk i or whatever their multiple is. And if there was Windows in this input, we would have replaced that as well. Notice how replace replaces all occurrences. So there's Linux over here, Linux over here, uh, and Linux over here. And a single replace for that band word, because for Linux, when band word was Linux, this is only a single execution. We haven't done multiple replaces. So replace in Java replaces all of them. Okay, there's also a replace first, but that accepts not a character sequence, but rather a regular expression. And we're going to talk about that in the next lesson. Le next lesson. Okay, so that's how you replace all occurrences of a word inside a string. Now, how do you replace a single occurrence of a word in a string? Well, if you want to replace a single occurrence, what you do is you find the word, you get the substring starting from the start of the string until you reach the word, and then you get the substring after the word, and then you just uh, join those two strings with another string, which is the replacement. So instead of replacing, you just get the substring before the word, you get the strip substring after the word, <coughs> and you join them with the replacement. That's it. Okay. So we implemented this text filter uh, task. And from here on, we're going to be talking about efficiently building and modifying strings. Now this replace function is efficient. However, appending strings one after the other, like I said in the be beginning of the lesson, is not efficient. So we're going to be talking about how we can do that efficiently. And we're going to be talking about how we can use the string builder class, what it is, why it's efficient, and so on. So what is the string builder? The string builder is similar to a list actually, because notice this, a string builder is just an array which contains characters. And these characters have a bit of an unused buffer at their end usually. So a string builder, this should look like what the list does. A list is just an array, which actually has more elements than it needs so that it can efficiently add elements to its end. So a string builder is the same thing only for characters and it's optimized to work for strings. So it has specific fun functionality, which is string oriented. For example, it has a dot append method, which adds symbols to its end. 
add strings, for example, or integers or, or something else to it, and as sequences of symbols. So a string builder is actually a special class, which is a string which has more memory than it needs. And that more memory than it needs is used to add symbols into it. So since it has more additional memory, it doesn't really need to always, um, whenever you need to add symbols, it doesn't need to copy all of its items in a new place, uh, and so, which is bigger so it can accommodate all of the new symbols, because it already has some space in which it can put the new symbols. So that's what a string builder is. A string builder is created so you can modify strings. And let's actually see it before we see the slides. The string builder, is just you can treat it almost as a string so let's create a string builder over here let's say this is a string builder uh, builder which gets initialized by a new string builder okay so what can you do on the string builder well you can append symbols to it so you can append for example hello then you can append a space and then you can append the number 123 and then you can print this thing out on the console by saying builder dot to string that's how you convert it into a string representation and if we start this code we're going to see hello space 123 on the console okay so that's what we got hello space 123 on the console so unlike the string however this this builder over here doesn't uh, work as inefficiently when you're appending strings. So you could say, okay, it's, well, why do I need this? Since I can simply say a string s, which is an empty string or a new string or a string dot empty. Do we have that? No, we don't have that. Okay, so a new string or a empty string like so. And I can say s equals s plus hello, and then s equals s plus space, or and s equals s plus one, two, three, and that would yield the same result, right? So s will contain the same data that the string builder has. So if I print s on the console, that would give me the same result as printing builder dot to string. Well, yes, but notice what's happening here. Every time you're adding something to this string S, you're actually creating a new string and that new string gets assigned to this string. And in this step, again, you're creating a new string and that gets assigned to this string. And here you're creating a new string and you're reassigning it back to this string. Whereas notice what happens on the string builder. We simply call the append method on that string builder. That append method returns a string builder true but it also modifies this string builder so it modifies itself so the append method modifies the builder itself it doesn't uh, unlike the concat method on string or the plus operator it doesn't create a new object it modifies the existing object so it works with the same memory it works with the same object now Occasionally, the append operation will generate new memory and copy values from the old memory into the new memory when uh, the buffer runs out. But since it has a buffer, it uh, usually can add items without having to reallocate its memory. So this means that this string builder is actually much more efficient than string concatenation because it doesn't allocate a new object each time you allocate memory inside it. So this is one object, then a second object, then a third object, then a fourth object. Whereas this string builder over here will most likely use a single object and append inside it. It will allocate memory once, it will allocate more memory than this string, but since we know we're going to be adding multiple times inside it, that's why we're using the string builder because this would be more efficient. Now, you don't really do this if you have two or three operations like so. But you do this if you have concatenation inside the loop. So if you're doing something n times where n can be a large number, you're much better off using a string builder for concatenating your strings. And then you can simply say, for example, s equals builder dot to string. So this allows you to build efficiently, for example, in a for loop, and then just assign back into a string so you can do any string operation you like. 
So that's what a string builder is. A string builder optimizes appending operations. So it's fast at appending items to itself. And then you can convert it back into a simple string, which doesn't have an additional buffer. And let's say print it on the console or save it into a variable and so on. Okay, so uh, why, why do we need it? Again, because concatenating strings is a slow operation. Not that a single concatenation is slow, but multiple concatenations like this one is slow. Now not, notice this code that, and it's going to show you how you can benchmark your code. We're printing a new date. What does new date do? Well, it creates a so-called date object and that date object, when, no, when you haven't passed in any parameters to the constructor, initializes with the current time. So if you create a new date over here in your code, it uh, calculates up, it, it gets printed up on up to seconds, but you can uh, add some formatting strings, which can tell it to print out to milliseconds, or you can say, just say um, dot get time, and that will print the current times milliseconds from 19, the 1st of January, uh, zero, zero, uh, o'clock at, uh, on the year of 1970. So 1970, first of January, uh, zero, zero, uh, the number of milliseconds since then to now, why is that specific date? Well, there are reasons not going to cover them now, but you can Google that. Uh, so this is going to print you milliseconds and then you can do the same thing over here after you've done some piece of code for which you want to know how fast it runs. So you do first printing of the time and the second printing of the time and then you calculate the difference between these two. Or you can um, get the current time, save it into a variable, not print it, save it into a current variable and then get the new time after you've completed this code then subtract the two variables, the first, the first time and the second time, and you're going to get the number of milliseconds for which this thing ran. It's always a bit approximate. You, you're, you can't measure it exactly precisely, but it's close enough. So uh, when we ran this example some time ago, a lot of time ago, as you can notice, uh, what we got was for this string concatenation of uh, one million times adding the string a to a text what we got was more it's not more than a minute but it's almost a minute so almost a minute for one million operations why is this slow well because each of these operations creates a new object it doesn't work on the current text variable it creates a new object uh, migrates all of the memory from the old object to the new object meaning it copies all of the symbols inside this text to a new piece of memory which has one element more so if text was five characters, so let's say we have a, 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 a like this and we enter the, the loop, what happens is the uh, new memory gets allocated with six elements because here we were adding one element and this a gets copied over here. This a gets copied over here. This a gets copied over here. This one gets copied over here. The last one gets copied at index. What's this index? It's index four, right? Because there are zero, one, two, three, four is the last index. So we get these copied into these indexes and then we get this variable which we're adding and we append it to the end in the remaining symbols because we've allocated in this case five positions, uh, six positions and we set the new character A to the position at index five, which is the sixth position. Okay, so this is one we have five elements. And when we have six elements, we need to copy six elements, right? Here we've, we're copying five elements, then we need to copy six elements, then we need to copy seven elements, then we need to copy eight elements, ten, nine elements, 10, 11, 12, and so on. And those are a lot of operations. Uh, by the time we reach the, the length of 100, we've copied 5,050 elements. You can calculate that, you know, the sum of all numbers from one to 100. And from one to one million, well, it's a lot. Yeah, it's 5 billion and 500, whatever. It, it's, a, it's a very large number. So the, this doesn't really, it's not 5 billion, it's a lot more than 5 billion, uh, whatever. A lot of operations, because each time you're copying each of the items inside the text, each character inside the text to a new piece of memory. So that's very slow. Whereas doing that with a string builder, that it's the same code, those are the same operations, but you just do append. This does not create a new object. It occasionally does, 
it, it very rarely does. It, it creates a new string builder as often as a list creates a new array, right? Because the string builder actually works by using something equivalent to a list inside it. It has buffer space and it appends inside that buffer space. And whenever that buffer space runs out, it allocates a new string builder and it gives it even more buffer space. So uh, the more often you increase the space requirements for a string builder, the more often it's going, the, the, the larger amount of buffer space it's going to be adding. So that reduces the amount of times it gets copied. Well, yes, it copies more elements, but it copies much, uh, much less often. And that leads to very fast execution time because it's just 1 million operations. And that's not a lot for a computer. Whereas here, as I said, it's a lot more than 1 million operations because for the first operations, it's one copy. For the second, it's two copies. For the third, it's three copies and so on. So copy, copying of three items inside a string and then copying of four items inside the string where, where items are characters. Then that becomes slower and slower and slower with the more iterations that this loop does. So doing it with a string builder, you did about a second of time. Pretty pretty much uh, a large improvement right so this is this is really significantly faster than using a simple string so whenever you have a for loop like this one and like the one we had uh, somewhere in the beginning of the lesson where we were talking about concatenating so in this for loop in this solution this is slow this is not a good idea that's why i did it with a list of strings an array of strings which i joined that's faster because we're not copying elements right we're just um we're just adding into an array and we're doing the merge up the string dot join only once that's okay but if you're doing it like this each time you're adding a symbol for example you you want to repeat the word five times well if the, that would mean that the word has uh, five symbols, right? Because that's how we implemented that. So if we have A, B, C, D, E, that's five letters. So the first time you're adding it to itself, you're going over here and you're creating 10 elements. So it becomes A, B, C, D, E, copying these five and then adding, and then adding the new A, B, C, D, E. And then this thing that has to be copied. So on the second iteration, we're doing A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, 10 elements. We now copy 10 elements. And now we add uh, the next one, for example, A, B, C, D, E again. And then on the next operation, we're, we need to copy 15 elements. You get where this is going. So it becomes slower and slower on each copy. The solution I proposed was we just create these uh, copies once. So we don't copy into the same object, we just copy into different objects. So we create A, B, C, D, E, then A, B, C, D, E, then A, B, C, D, E, then A, B, C, D, E, and then one more, right? Five operations, A, B, C, D, E. So in total, I allocated 25 elements, whereas the first three iterations of uh, this for loop over here would do 30 operations, right? Five operations the first time, 10 the second time, and 15 the third time. That's just for the first three operations. It does more copies than I do, right? And then I join them. Of course, there are 25 more over here, but this grows as, as quickly as the other one. So uh, the, the larger the word becomes, the slower this code gets and the faster my suggestion gets. But a string builder is even more efficient because it doesn't need to merge them up at the end. It just has them merged up while it gets con constructed. And it's fast because it has a buffer in which it adds instead of creating a new object every time. Okay, so this string builder concatenation works pretty quickly. And you can test it at home. Of course, you're not going to get the exact same values or so because it's not 2018, um, you're not going to get the same result. But if you compare the execution of the string variant and the string builder variant, you're going to notice that the string variant is much slower than the string builder variant. And that's what we really care about in programming, which one of the two, which one is faster because on my computer, computer is going to be one, um, uh, one length of time for string concatenation on your computer is going to be a different length of time, but the, um, uh, the, 
the ratio of the string builder time and the string time is going to be similar between my computer and yours. So uh, as, as quicker it is for a string builder to operate on my computer than a, than a string on my computer, the ratio is going to be similar for your computer too. And that's what we usually care about in programming when we're uh, trying to optimize, we're trying to make code more efficient. We're trying to use methods which allow us uh, allow our code to work much faster than when using other methods okay so that's how you use a string builder to construct strings if you have a loop you just append into the string builder and then you say text dot to string and that gives you a normal string on which you can operate okay so uh this is the append method the append method can accept a string, it can also accept an integer, a double, and so on, and other, a lot of other variables, and it just simply appends to the end of the string builder. It's the equivalent of saying string s equals something, <coughs> and then saying s, equal, s plus equals, for example, hello. So this is the same as having a string builder on which you append hello. It's the same in result, but it's not the same in efficiency, so this one should typically be more efficient. And <clears throat> if you're doing it a lot of times, this is definitely more efficient. Okay, it also has a length, just like the string uh, class, uh, the string objects have a length, and it returns the same thing which uh, a string would uh, return. So if you have an empty string builder, uh, builder and append this string into it, and then ask for the length, the length you're going to get is the length of the string you just appended. If you append multiple strings, it's going to be the sum of all the, the strings you appended. You can also construct a string builder directly from a string. So if you have the string hello, instead of appending it um, as a single append operation, you can provide it over here as a parameter for the string builder, and you can initialize a string builder directly from some text. So you don't need to create a string builder and then append the text to it. You can di directly initialize it with the text. You can also uh, give it a hint about capacity. So if you're not, if you don't have a text yet, but you kind of know how many elements there are going to be, you can add them over here. So if you know that there are going to be, let's say, at least 100 elements, well, you can tell the string builder to initialize with a buffer of 100. So it doesn't have to reallocate. It, it will still do it efficiently, but you're reducing the number of reallocation the reallocations that are going to happen. Again, you do this if you have an idea of how much memory you're going to be needing approximately. You can do this, you can provide this capacity. And then again, it will still reallocate memory if it needs to, but you're reducing the number of times it would need to reallocate memory. Okay, so that's the length method, the append method, and there's a set length method which removes any characters or it cuts off as many characters as you would like. So if you want to um, initialize with this string and then say set length of five, it's going to cut out everything after the hello world. Okay, you can ask it for character at the same way a string uh, you, the same way you can ask a string for a character at a certain position and in addition to that since the string builder is not a string it's not immutable like the string for a string builder you can say again you can say character at which does the same thing as the string does but it, you can also say set character at which is the same as setting a, an index in a list so you provide the index for example you say set index tree to the letter a so you provide an index and a letter for for this set operation so again it's like in the list you can set elements in the string builder you can also set elements unlike uh, the string where you can't set elements okay so that's a character app and there's also an insertion method which allows you to insert a string at a specific index so this does the same thing that inserting in a list does. It places the item which you want at that index and moves everything to the right. So it shifts everything from that index to the right, as many positions as it needs to shift it, so it can accommodate this string. And uh, it in accommodates that string at that index. So that index becomes the index for this substring which you're adding. And if you say index of, that's going to return you this index and all other symbols get moved to the right. Okay, so that's what the uh, 
insert does. There's also index of works the same way as it does for strings. Again, most of these operations are similar to the operations for a string. However, the modifying operations for a string builder actually modify the string builder instead of simply uh, creating a new object. Whereas for strings, they create a new object. Okay, so the other thing you can do is the replace operation. Now, this one's different than for the string. For the string, you provide a string which needs to be replaced and it gets replaced in all places. Here, you provide a start index and an end index, and that range of characters get re gets replaced with a string you provide. That's a common occurrence. For example, if you say, uh, if you have a string builder with this string in it, and you replace symbols from 6 to 11 with George, it's going to replace Peter with George. So it's going to delete all these characters and then insert George at this position and move everything to the right. So it's, bas it's basically a remove operation followed by an insert operation. Okay. And of course, to string does the uh, converting back into a string. So again, the methods are very similar to the ones you have for string with the difference of that replace can't replace by a given string. And if you want to do a replace by a given string, how do you do it? Well, you start a search with an index of, you check uh, whether, let's say you want to replace old string. So you have a parameter old string and you want to replace it with the new string. Well, one option would be to actually get the string call the replace method and then create a string builder with the result of the replace method because that's what replace does on strings. And actually that's a common uh, way to do it because um, if you want to do a string specific operation which uh, works on the entire string, that is optimized for the string. It's not appending to a string. It just, for example, replace will find all occurrences, allocate enough memory for the replacement, and then copy all the items inside the replacement. That's one it's it's one operation for the entire string. So it's uh, it it will not uh, it will not do uh, replace operations multiple times on the string. It will just uh, do a single one uh, one for loop sweep of the entire string and that will give you the um, that will do the uh, replacement for you in a string builder you c you don't have a replace uh, by a string by an old string with a new string exactly for that reason because you don't need it you can do it on a string and then create a string builder with that replaced string that's the idea but you can do replacing of ranges of symbols which you can't do with a normal string and that's why this replace operation is implemented here. Now, if you really want to do a replace operation on a string builder, which accepts a string parameter old string, what do you do? Well, you search for the index of old string, find that old string. So you find its index, you find its starting index. So this is its starting index and you find its ending index, which is its starting index plus its length. So this is its starting index and its ending index is start index plus old string. Let's move it to the next line plus old string dot length. And that gives you the end index. So here we've just implemented replacing by a string by just finding the old string. So index of old string and then that index plus the string's length and you pass those into the replace method of a string builder and you have that replacement. And if you want to replace all of the occurrences of that string, well, you just run a while loop while you can find that index, uh, while you can find that uh, old string, you do this operation which we just described. Okay. And again, the string converts that back into a string. But I wouldn't uh, do replace operations on a string builder by an old string, replace operations of the type replace an old string with a new string, because I don't really need to do that, right? I have a string class which can do that and I can convert, if I need to do it on a string builder, well, I convert the string builder into a string, then I do the replace, then I convert the string back into a string builder by saying new string builder and passing in the replaced string. And that's it. It's not super efficient doing it, doing it this way, but writing a for loop which replaces uh, each iteration and uh, each, each uh, substring until there's no more occurrences isn't much faster either. There is a way to implement it quickly by running a for loop and copying symbols uh, directly. 
but that's too much hassle for most of the tasks we're, tasks we're going to be solving now. So for average running time operations, when you're not really uh, chasing super efficient code, it's uh, okay enough for you to just copy back into a string, do the replace, and then copy back into the string builder and do whatever operations you need. Okay, so we covered this lecture. I showed you the string builder again. Avoid any, if, if at some position you have a for loop, which is appending to a string, replace that string with the string builder and use the append method of that string builder. Do not do for loops like this one over here. Do not do for loops like the one in this solution because they are slow. If you replace, if you use the same code, but replace this with string builder and it gets initialized with a new string builder and this method becomes not plus equals, but it becomes rather dot append word. This becomes extremely faster, a lot faster than string concatenation. So anytime you have this type of string concatenation, just change it into a string builder appending and then just have this result printed as dot to string. That converts it back into a normal string, which you can print on the console, save into a variable and so on. That's that's probably the main takeaway from this lecture. Do not use strings for multiple concatenations. Use a string builder for that. Okay, so what else did we learn from this lecture? We learned that strings in Java are immutable, meaning that any operations like replace, substrings, uh, and so on, will just create a new string which contains the result. Uh, otherwise, you cannot change characters of a string. You cannot uh, split a string itself. You cannot change the content of a string. But you can create a new uh, string, which is the split string or the string with something removed or something replaced and so on. And it, can, and it supports any type of, um, of language which you can think of. So you can have pretty much all languages on the planet can be represented in Java strings. Now, we saw concat, which is the same thing as plus equals is, uh, actually as plus is. So concat is the same thing as just saying one string plus another string. We saw index of, which gave us the index of a substring inside the string. And I showed you additionally how you can search from, not from the start of the string, but from a certain position in the string. And we also saw last index of. We saw contains, which is the equivalent of doing index of and checking whether that index of returns minus one. Uh, we saw substring, which gave us a part of a string. We saw split, which gave us multiple strings split by, um, by some separator and we saw replace which replaced some string in a string with another string and we saw that string builder is the efficient way of um, appending to a string of concatenating strings so never concatenate strings in a loop uh, multiple times onto the same variable instead use a string builder for that okay so i hope this was useful for you uh, as always if you have any questions please ask them in all the channels we have provided you and see you next time in this lesson, your instructor George will explain the concepts of associative arrays or maps, which hold key to value mappings. He will demonstrate through live coding examples how to use standard API classes such as map, hash map, and tree map to work with maps in Java. Just after the maps, the instructor will explain the concepts of lambda expressions and how to define and use lambda functions in Java through the arrow operator. Lambda expressions are important in Java programming because they enable processing and querying Java collections using the Java Stream API. In this lesson, the instructor will demonstrate the power of the Stream API and how to map, filter and sort sequences of elements such as arrays, distant maps and how to extract subsequences, how to convert a sequence to array or list, and many other operations over sequences. Let's learn maps, lambda functions, and the stream API in Java through live coding examples and later solve some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Are you ready? Let's start!
Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer and today we will be talking about associative containers like maps and sets and other, other types of data structures which we will be using quite often actually. Pretty much 80% of the time you're going to be a programmer, you're going to be using some of these collections. And then we're going to talk about Lambda expressions and the stream API in Java. So let's get on with it. Our first subject is again associative arrays or associative containers or dictionaries or maps. There are a lot of terms for these uh, data structures, but they're used in pretty much ev every place in programming you're going to encounter. And not only that, you're going to encounter them a lot because they're very useful uh, both for fast operations on large sets of data when you have some uh, intrinsic characteristic by which you categorize that data. And Additionally, because uh, these associative container, containers are very useful when you want to um, work even with small amounts of data which need to be organized in some way. So they're pretty much a multi-tool for a lot of stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk about the hash map, the linked hash map, and the tree map. Those are the three, the three most common uh, uses of associative arrays or containers or maps or dictionaries or whatever you like to call them. And you might have noticed that Java prefers the terminology map, but associative arrays is a bit more general, general and even associative, associative containers is the most general term you're going to see in computer science. But map is pretty close up with that one too. So you're going to see these containers in a lot of programming languages, not just in Java. Okay, so these are the three most common, or at least the ones we will be using most often in this course. So uh, we will be talking about that today. Then we're going to talk about Lambda expressions and we're going to tie those in with the stream API in Java, talking about filtering, mapping, sorting data and limiting output and uh, processing items one by one and so on. So this is our table of contents and let's get on with it. Well, what are we going to talk about first? Again, the associative containers I already mentioned and we're going to talk about them as these collections of key and value pairs. So you're going to have keys and values in each item in the collection we're going to talk about. So each item in those collections, the linked hash map, the hash map, the tree map are all in this format. They are keys and values. Now, before we go on with the data structures themselves, let's see an example of how they might be useful. So let's open IntelliJ and let's say we have the following task. Um, we're going to get uh, numbers entered and we're going to get the names of those numbers or even let's say we're going to get um, names of people and the ages of these people. And then what we need to do is when uh, asked about the age of some person, we need to print that age or it could be birthdays even. Maybe we can implement a calendar in which we simply enter the names of people we want uh, to remember the birthdays of, and then we can ask when someone's birthday is. So what we're going to have here is the name of a person followed by some data. Now it doesn't really matter what that data is. So let's go with something simple. Let's say we have uh, the name of the person and we have the age of that person. That's the simplest thing we can do for now. Okay, so we're going to get names of people and ages of ages of people. And let's say we're going to have a fixed number of uh, names and ages we're going to have to read from the console. Uh, and we need to read those and then be able to answer questions of the format name of a person. And we need to print that age, the age of that person. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, let's, let's try. Now, first thing I'm thinking about is, okay, I already know what objects and classes are. So one thing I could do is create an object, name it person, and that person is going to have a name and an, and an age since we're, they're going to be traveling together, right? One thing I mentioned is the person will have an age and that age will be um, something which we need to print when asked about the person's name. So the name and the age are correlated. They have an association between them. So one way to implement that is to, of course, create an object which maintains that association, create a class. Let's call it, it's going to be a static, static class. 
let's call it person and then let's say that this person has a name and let's say that this person has an integer age okay so our person has a name and, and an age okay and what else does our person have well let's enable construction of a person so we can create a person and instead of typing it myself i'm going to press alt and insert wait a bit and then i'll get a uh, generate um, tooltip and then i can pick generate prompt actually uh, and then i can pick a constructor and then say that i want name and age to be included in my uh, constructor so intellij auto generated this code for me and now i'm going to do the same thing for getters and setters as we've uh, discussed before getters and setters are ways to access fields of a of a class so let's insert a getter and a like actually we don't need setters we only need getters because we're not going to be changing the ages of these people we're just going to be um, asking for them okay so let's have a get name and get age uh, getter and setter and let's make these fields private because we've talked about the um the the good practice of keeping fields of a class private and accessing them through the getters okay so now we have an object which maintains this association of a name with an age of a person okay so what are we going to do now? Well, let's say we have a fixed number of people. Let's say we have an integer number n, which is the number of people. And let's say we're going to be reading that, that from the console. So we're going to need a scanner. Let's create a scanner, which reads from system.in. Okay, so this scanner is going to be initialized over here. And then we'll just say, okay, initialize a variable and initialize that with the first integer on the console, which uh, we've, uh, which has been input. Okay, so this is going to be the number of people we're going to have to read. And now we can say, start a for loop from zero to n. So that's exactly n, n times the loop will execute. And then we're, we're going to be reading the next person. So we're going to be reading a name and we're going to be reading an age. And then we'd say, Okay, so the name is now equal to scanner.read the next string, just next. This is going to read a string separated by spaces. So it's going to read, uh, it's going to trim all white, white spaces before the string, any new lines, tabs, spaces, etc. And trim, trim all of these and then it will get the string until it reaches another white space. So until it reach, reaches a space, a tab, a new line, etc. Okay, so it doesn't really matter how they're going to input the name of that person as long as that name is one word. Okay, and then we'll do the same for the age. We're going to read it, however, we're going to read it as an integer directly. We're going to read it as a string and then parse it as an integer. Okay, so we have the name and age now read from the console. And we have this person, the current person, the person at index i. And what are we going to do with them? Well, we said that we want to have this data stored somewhere because we're going to have queries on it. So the user will input a name of a person and then we need to print out the age of that person. Okay, so since we're going to be saving uh, a fixed amount of people, what we can do is create an array since we know the amount of people on uh, the the, the first time we're going we're reading the uh, number of people once we have this uh, integer and we know how many people we're going to be reading so I can just create a person array and see say that these are the people and initialize them with a person array containing exactly n elements and then I'd say people and place the person at position I so the person we're reading currently how are, how are we going to place them? Well, we're just going to initialize a new person and provide the name and age for that person, set that into the array, and now we have an array of people. So once the input has been processed, we're going to have an array of people which we can do operations with. Okay, so now let's say we're just going to have a single query, ju just to make the code easier. So how we're going to uh, write that query? Well, let's say we're going to have a query string, which we're going to be reading from the console. Scanner.next is reading from the console. Okay, so we're reading that query from the console, the first string in the console uh, that's entered after we've read all the people. And now all we need to do is find the person with that age and print uh, the person with that name and print their age. So what we're going to be doing is how do we find that person? Well, there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, let's do it manually. So how do you find uh, value in a data set? So we have a data set over here 
data set just meaning a bunch of data gathered in some variable. So here's our data set. In this case, it's an array uh, of items. These items are person objects. Okay, so how are we going to find the person we're looking for, the person which has a name matching this query? Well, let's just iterate these people. So we're going to say people iterate. We're going to access each person in these people. And then we do what? Well, we check if the query matches the person which we're uh, getting here, but not the person themselves because the query is just a string, right? So the query is just a string. We don't want to match against the person. We want to match against the person's name because the person isn't a string. The person is a combination of a string and an age. Okay, so we're going to get the name over here and compare that name to the query. So if the query matches the name, then we found our person and otherwise we need to continue on. Okay, so if we find the person, we don't need to look anymore unless uh, the task is to print all people which have that age, but let's uh, simplify it to just the first person which has that age needs to be printed on the console. Okay, so now, now what we're going to do, well, since we're breaking the loop here and since we're inside the case where the current person which we're iterating on is the person we're looking for, we just need to print that person's age out on the console. Okay, so what we're going to print is person person dot get age that will give me the age of this person object over here and I know that this person object is the correct object because otherwise I wouldn't have entered this part of code this uh, line of code which is only entered when the query matches my person's name okay so this little program over here will just read a bunch of people from the console and then operate on them by finding the one with the name which matches and then we're going to print that back on the console. Okay, so let's say that we have two people. One of them is George and George is 27. And let's say we have another person, which is any candidates from you guys. <laughs> okay, so the other person will be Peter because I know a guy named Peter and Peter is, I don't really know how old he is, but uh, let's go for 35. Okay, so George and Peter, and now it's waiting for me to enter the uh, name of the person which, for which we want to print the age. Okay, so let's say we want to print the age for Peter. Okay, so what did we get printed? Well, 35. So that's the solution to this program. Now, uh, to, this, to this problem, this program is the solution to this problem. Now, of course this works and it works reasonably well. So it's, it, in the worst case, it's going to do as, as many iterations on the person list as there are people in that list. So in the worst case, in this case, when I entered two people and I entered Peter, well, it had to first check George, see that it isn't George, and then had to go to the next item, the last item in the list, check, see that it matches and then print that out. Okay, so we might actually want to have a, uh, a check over here, which uh, checks if we found the person if it, and if it doesn't, it prints uh, no such person found and, and so on. Okay, so something you might have noticed if you're uh, watching carefully is that in this case, I need to walk over all of the people in my list, in my array or whatever data structure I have uh, of the ones we've uh, studied so far. I need to walk through all of them, regardless of what I'm looking for, I need to loop through all of them and check for that thing. If that thing matches, then I found the thing I'm looking for. Okay, however, let's imagine that we weren't searching uh, ages of people, but people's ages. So uh, let's say we're going to be reading not the name of a person, we're going to be reading a number, the age of the person, and we need to print the person with that age. Okay, so if you're uh, thinking carefully, you might have noticed that there's a sort of a quicker way to do this, right? So if we're storing, instead of uh, looking for people by their name, printing ages by a name, if instead we're printing a name by an age, and since the ages are relatively low values, people, people usually have an age somewhere between 0 and 150 years, okay, so 150, so that's a very small range of values. So let's turn this task around. Let's say that we don't want to be checking for 
a person's name. I, we don't want to be looking for the person by their name. We want to be looking for the person by their age. <coughs> okay, so how would we do that? Well, instead of saving people in a person array, what we're going to do is create... Uh, actually, we're still going to have a person array, but instead of saving the person on the next item in that array, we're going to create an array of, let's say, 150 elements. Now, that's a bit of overkill, but you see where, where I'm going with this. An array of 150 elements, because we expect no person to be older than 150. Okay? And now what we're going to do is instead of placing the person at the next position in the array, we're going to place them in their, at their age position in the array. Right? So what we're doing is instead of having the first person at index 0 and the next person, so index 0, this is George, of, uh, which is 27, and index 1, this is Peter, which is 35. Instead of having this data structure, we're having the following data structure. We're having an entire array over here, and we're saying, let's use a different color, an entire array, and we're saying, okay, so place George at index 27. So index 27 is going to be George, which is 27 years old. So we're saving George of 27 years old, this person object, we're saving at index 27. And then we're saving Peter at index 35. Now notice what we can be doing now if, if the task requires us to enter an age instead of a name. So if this is int age, which we're reading from the console, what can we do? Do we need to loop around through all of the elements in the array? Well, no, we don't no longer, no longer need to because what we've done is indexed, that's uh, the root of that word. We've placed our items at specific indices and we've coded that so it's fast to access. So if we're reading an H from the console and we've ordered our items like this, directly as items in the array at the position um, of their field which we're indexing. So in this case, the field which we're indexing is the age field. So we're creating an index by this field, the same way like uh, the same way that books have indices by their page numbers, right? So you can see what uh, content is on page number 35, for example. Okay, so, so they're indexed by their page numbers. In this case, we're indexing by our, um, by our ages. So we're placing the item instead of on the next position in the list or array or whatever it is, we're placing it in a specific position that matches one of its fields in some way. So in this case, we're placing it at the specific position, George, we're placing George at the specific position 27 in the array because 27 in the array matches the 27 years of age which George has. Okay, so now what we can do is we can just say int h equals scanner.next, actually it's going to be next integer. And now instead of looping around through our items, we just need to do system.out.println um, the person's name. So where is the person? Well, the person is at position h and we need their name. So we're accessing the person which we've put at position h when we've read the input. And then we're getting the name of that person. So starting this code, what we're going to get is, of course, the input is going to be different in this case. We're still going to have two people. They're still going to be George of 27 years old and Peter of 35 years old. But here we're not going to be in inputting a name of a person. We're going to be inputting an age of a person and see if that age is uh, answered correctly. So if I input 35, I should get Peter, right? Okay. So I ended my program after entering 35 and I got Peter on the output. Okay, that's exactly what I wanted, right? Now, you might have noticed that this is pretty much uh, a, a single operation, right? So you just, yeah, sure, the printing is one operation and the access of the element is one operation and the getting of its name is another operation. So this entire line is three operations, but the number of operations I needed to access my element is exactly one. So one operation of accessing an element 
at an index of an array. So this is a very fast operation. Accessing items in an array by their index is very fast. It's just like writing to an array at, a, at an index is very fast because an array index is just an address in memory. So the computer just finds that address and writes. It, it has random access to that address in memory. That's why your RAM is called RAM because it's random access memory. It takes the same time to access the first element as it takes to access the 50th element. Okay, so you might have noticed where I'm going with this. Where I'm going is, okay, so we can do it for age, but we can't do it for a name because the name is a string and ages can be integers in a, uh, can be indices in arrays because indices in arrays are just numbers and ages are just numbers. So you can have an integer which you're mapping onto an array. So you're mapping the age onto the array. You're indexing uh, the, the people we have here by their age. You can say it uh, a lot of different ways. Uh, I have uh, a habit of using different terminology so you know what to search for when you're Googling something. Terminology is important because we Google with terminology. Okay, so what we've done here is indexed the people we have, our data set of people, we've indexed them by their age, meaning we've put them at indexes ma matching their age. But we can't do that for their names. So let's say we wanted to go back to the original task which we were solving. We were solving the task of reading a name and answering with an age. So let's say we want to index our people with their names, not with their ages. Can I do this? Can I place name over here? Well, no, I can't because the name is a string and the index in people should be an integer. Okay, so I can't do that. Or can I? Well, what I'm looking for here, instead of saving uh, people at index i and then looping through all of them. Now, let's go back to the number of operations. The array access was the single access, right? So if I index them by age, I only had to search for, I only had to access that age index. In this case, I have to index, I have to access all indices, right? So I'm looking, I'm looping through the people and I'm accessing every single element, every single index. Now this should have been n over here once I changed it back to the initial task. So I'm looping through all n of the elements, all of them, in order to find my person. And that's not optimal because I'm doing n operations at the worst case. Sure, in some situations I'm going to have the person uh, be the first item in the list, but uh, it's equally probable that the person I'm looking for is the last item in the list or the array or whatever. Uh, so it, in the average case, it's n divided by two operations. In the worst case, it's n operations. In programming, you're usually concerned about the average and the worst case. And the worst case really shouldn't be much worse than the average. So uh, because otherwise it's, your program is going to lag once you get enough data in it. Okay. So uh, what are we, what can we do? So this is n operations, whereas the previous uh, solution, the, the solution which uh, looked by age, which indexed by age, was one operation. So one operation versus n operations. The, la the larger amount of data we have, the, the slower this solution is going to work based on the person's name. Uh, and the faster, actually, the, the age uh, task, the, the one which, which we're looking for a name by an age, is always one operation. It doesn't really matter how, how much data items we have. Sure, it matters for reading the data, but that's always the case. It doesn't matter for accessing the data. So once we've indexed the items, it doesn't matter how many items there are. Uh, we just need to search at that index. Whereas for our current case where, where, where we have names, we can't index by name in an array because arrays have integer values and names are strings. So how do we do that? Well, there are data structures in programming which allow you to do that, to index by things that aren't indices, to index by things that are strings or objects or people or whatever. So there are data structures which allow you to do that. And actually, they also allow you to do it for double values. Let's say uh, the ages over here, if my previous task in which I'm looking for a person by their age, well, that wouldn't work if the age was a double number, right? So if I had a person of 3.5 years old, like, um, you know, little kids are usually asked uh, how old they are and they 
often answer with uh, 3.5 or because when you're little 0.5 years is actually a lot it's, it's a big portion of your of your life so if years could be entered like that well our array uh, option doesn't really work anymore because uh, if we just save at that index in the array well 3.1 and 3.2 and 3.5 and 3.9 will all fall into the same index the index 3 in the array so again indexing indexing for now with arrays only works if your indexes are integers and if your indexes indices are small enough numbers because if you have uh, all the integers let's say from 0 to 2 to 2 billion let's say you're counting age by seconds of your lifetime that's about 2 billion for the average person in that case allocating an array of 2 billion 2 billion elements really isn't very practical is it so 2 billion elements that's a lot of memory that's 2 gigabytes of memory if you're just saving single byte values and we're not saving single byte values we're saving a lot more so what can we do well we can we can you're probably thinking of something right now like okay can't we convert the string into a number somehow so each name let's convert it somehow into a number let's for example count the number of letters in it or uh, use uh, the ascii codes of the letters in it and sum them up and get a number and use that number as the index and if you're thinking that you're thinking about hashing that's called hashing that's a, a process by which you convert a series of bytes into a smaller series of bytes but it's very important in that case to make sure that your hash function the thing the thing that does that converting is uh very rarely creates uh, collisions so if you just use the ascii codes of the uh, letters in the name well in that case um in that case george and george in reverse so e-r-g-o-e-g -E -E will have the exact same hash and that they're going to collide on the same index they're going to be on the same index so creating a hash function for this is a very actually hard job and there are people which do that very hard job and uh, compute optimal hash functions for different data types anyway uh there are data structures which allow us to do that automatically. So instead of our, uh, instead of writing that hash function by ourselves, we can use one of the data structures, one of the associative containers in Java to do that. So now instead of having a person array, we're going to have a people map. So I'm going to create a map and this map is going to contain, of course, people, so a person, and in addition to that, it's asking me for something else. What is it asking me about? Well, well, when we began the lecture, I told you that our associative containers are going to have items which are, which consist of a key and a value. So the person is the value. The key is the index. The key is the thing by which we're going to be looking, by which we're going to be searching for a person. So in this case, we want to save people by their names because we're going to be searching by their names. So whatever you're going to be searching uh, true and you want to search with that fast search by that field fast well that's your key so that that's where the name comes from the key is what you're searching for so you you say you i want this item and you name the item by that key and then when you name the item by that key well the map knows how to search by that key so let's say that this in this case since the name is a string well the map will be a string map so a map containing strings, string keys, and each of these string keys will match to a person. So we'll have for each name, we're going to have a person object, which is indexed by that name. The same way we had for each index in an array, we had the person object, which has that age, right? So we use the age as the indexer. And here we're going to be using the string, the name as the indexer. Now I need to initialize this map with an actual implementation of a map. Just like when we're creating a list, we're actually using some specific type of list. And in most cases, we're using an array list. Well, in this case, from a map, for a map, I'm going to use the specific map type, a hash map. Now, remember when I said that what we're trying to do is achieve a hash function? Well, that's what this hash map does. 
It uses the key, in this case the string, and converts it into a number in some way. We don't really care how it does that, but it converts it, converts it into a number in some way and uses that number to quickly find um, the person which matches that number. Now it also, also has ways of handling collisions should they occur, so don't worry about that. Uh, you just need to know that if you're saving a person as uh, if you're saving into a hash map and you're saving strings, well, that hash map will take care of hashing that those strings into numbers so it can search by index. And you don't care about what that map actually does inside. All you care about is saving items in that hash map and then looking for items in that hash map. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to say people, the same way we access the array and set place the person at index i. Well, in this case, so we had this code, place the, the person at index i. Well, in this case, we're saying people dot put, put this person, put this person. And the first thing we need to say is at which index do we need to put them? Uh, similar like how in a list you say dot set and that sets an item to some index. So you provide the index and then you provide the item. In this case, it's the same thing. You put the person at their index. What's their index? Their index is their name. So we type in name over here. And now our people map after this loop has executed will contain the people mapped by their name, indexed by their name. So indexed is a term you're, you're going to be hearing more often and more often when you're uh, developing code. So in this people map, we have now people mapped by their name. So we have at each place in this map. So this map is still a collection of elements, but the collection of elements isn't just a person element and another person element and another person element. It's a key value pair structure, which has a key, which is the string, which is the name actually, the name and that name points to a person and another name points to another person and another name points to another per person and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is what you have in this map. You have key value pairs. You have something which has a key and a value, a key and a value. And again, a key and a value, a name and a person, a key and a value. Just like in an array, you have elements and elements have indices and values. So you have the element at index something, and then you have that value at that index. However, in the map, the items themselves, the items in the array are these pairs. So if you're trying to iterate an array, you're just getting the values. But if you're iterating a map, if you're walking through all values of a map, you're getting key value pairs. We're going to discuss this in a bit. Okay, so now we have that people map, map which stores our people inside it. Now, when we read the query, instead of looping through all the items in the map, what we can do is just tell the map people, give me the person at the index of their name, right? So this is my name index. Let's call it a name. The, let's call the query a name, the thing which we're looking for. Let's just call it the name. So just like in the array, we access the array at that index, people at index age, where people was an array. In this case, we're going to access people at index name. The same way for a list, you say get and then provide an index. Well, for a map, it's get and then you provide the maps index. But in this case, the maps index is a string. Okay, so what does this give you? Well, if it was a list, this would give you the element stored at that position. Well, in this case, it's exactly the same thing. You get the element, the person with that name, person with that name or just we can just call them the person, the person we're, which we're looking for, the search person or whatever. Okay, and now how do we print that person's information? We just say system.out.println person. We're looking for the name, so let's print the age, get age. Okay, so now if we start this program, and by the way, you can uh, convert this into fewer lines. So this person, we don't need a special variable for them. We can just say, uh, inline that into the print line code, but I won't for a reason. And I'll show you that reason in a bit. Okay. So I got the person I printed them on the console. So now if I enter two people, George, George of 27 years old and Peter who is 35 years old and I enter here and I ask for Peter's age, I'm going to get, what am I going to get? 35. Okay. So I got 35 Peter's age. So the map looked for that person by their name, 
and then printed out their age. Okay, so that's what we got over here. We got uh, people, we got their name, and uh, actually we got a map of people. We read their names and ages. For each person, we created a person object and placed that at index name in the map. So at index, at a string index in the map. So maps work can work with any type of index. They're like arrays in which each element has an index, but that index can be an integer or a string or a double or a float or a character or whatever you want. And the map doesn't need to allocate all possible indices like the array does. So if you're having, if you're going to have 2 billion possible different values for age, and you're just going to be using some of them, well, the map is going to take as much space as needed for that, that, that many values, or approximately that much space. So it doesn't hog up memory the same way an array which is indexed by age does. So when I added the example of creating an array of 150 elements, but entered just two people and placed them at their ages in the array, I actually have had 148 elements which I didn't need. We don't have that issue with the map. It has close to the same amount of elements which you've put into it. It actually does uh, allocate a few uh, additional elements for collision handling and for adding new items, just like the list does, but it's not um, many times, many orders of magnitude larger than the amount of items in it. It's like, say, two or three times larger than the, than the amount of items in it. <coughs> okay, so we saw how we can add items into a map, and we saw how we can search for items inside that map. Now, what happens if we get input which uh, can't be found in the map? So let's say some in, in this example, we enter instead of uh, entering Peter. So instead of entering Peter like this, let's say we enter um, Tony. But well, what we got is a no pointer exception. Why did we get a no pointer exception? Well, let's see where we got it. Okay, so I got a no pointer exception over here. Oh, it couldn't have been in the system .out line code because you can print no. So it's it's got to be this expression person dot get age. Well, what does a no per, no pointer uh, no pointer exception mean? Well, it means one of these items was null, and in this case, it means that person over here was null, and we're trying to call no dot get age, and that obviously can't return anything because null is the indicator of a lack of value. So whenever a map can't find anything, it just returns null. So instead of returning an actual object, it returns a null object. So now you can check if person is different than null then print their age. Otherwise, system dot, system dot out dot print line, no such entry or no such item or no such key or no such person. Okay, so now if we start this and enter Tony like we did before, let's copy this, paste that. I copied it wrongly. Okay, never mind. Two people, George, who is 27, and Peter, who is 35. Okay, and now we enter Tony, press enter, and we got no such person. So now our program works correctly, even if the client, the person using the program, enters information which they haven't stored yet, which is expected from a, a well-implemented program. It should inform the user that they're trying to do something which can't be done. Or maybe uh, that's part of the specification of the program. So check for that person, check if there's such a person, because sometimes you just need to check the client has a database and that's why they have a database to check if a person exists in it. Okay, so this is how you store people in a map and this is how you look for them in the map. Every time you're learning about a data structure, you need to learn about four operations. So getting an item, so accessing an item by its something, then uh, putting a value inside the list or setting, put or set. So adding something to that uh, data structure. Then the other thing you need to know is how to remove something from there. And the other thing is how you can access all the elements. So how you can iterate all the elements. 
So running a for each loop, for example. So we've covered the first few. We've covered getting items and we've covered setting items, adding items to the map. Now, sometimes you can separate put and set into put and add and accessing element by their index because, for example, a list has uh, takes almost zero time to add an item at its end, but it takes a lot of time to add an item at its beginning because it needs to shift all items forward. Uh, and it takes the same time to, uh, and it takes one operation to get an item at an index, just like how an array does. Well, a hash map does, you can think of it as a single operation, meaning the, the number of uh, items in that hash map doesn't determine how fast you're looking for them with this get operation. Because again, just like with the array in which we indexed by age, here you're indexing by something and the Op the searching operation doesn't depend on the number of items in the map. It more so depends on the number of symbols in this string in this case. So it depends on the complexity of the function which creates a, an index from a string. Okay, so but that's a bit more complicated than we need to, to uh, cover right now. All you need to know is that when you're searching for items in a map, it's relative, it's you can think of it as being the same uh, speed as searching for an item in an array. It's a bit slower, not searching, but, but accessing an item at an index of an array. So accessing the people array at position five, at index five. So that's, that's uh, when you think about large sets of data, that's comparable to how fast a map searches. So the map doesn't depend on the number of items it contains. So searching inside the map, getting an item by its index doesn't depend on the item the maps con the items the map contains just like in an array so accessing an item at index 500 or 5 is the same and doesn't matter whether the array is 5 billion elements or 3 elements or 1 element or 100 elements and so on okay so this is a fast operation for a map looking for something by its index by its key okay and that gives you the value started that key. Now, some of you might have noticed that instead of having a person object over here, we can just have a map containing strings and integers, right? So since we're going to be storing uh, people, uh, names of people and ages of people, we don't really need the person object. Although often in programming, what you're going to have is exactly this, a data structure in which you have some type of identity, something by which you're going to be searching and objects ordered by that identity, so indexed by that identity. But for this task, if we want to avoid creating an object, now we can do that by just saying that this people map gets an integer over here. And now instead of saving a person object, we can just save the age. And now instead of getting a person object, we're going to get, and here it's important that we get an integer with capital letters. Why are we getting an integer with, with capital letters? Well, because the integer with capital letters is something which can be no. So if you're searching, imagine that you had a normal integer over here and you had int here. Well, if you're getting that uh, int from the people table, well, what happens if that people uh, that people map doesn't contain that integer? What, what happens if there's no such uh, name index which we're searching for in this map. Well, what it, what is it going to do? It can't tell you the result is zero because there could be a person with age zero. So that's not correct. So what happens it's, is the map returns no. And if you try to save it directly into a small integer like this one, you're going to get an exception. You're going to get a failure, a no pointer exception telling you that it can't convert from, can't convert from no to the small integer type. So that's why here we use the large integer type when when a result can be no, when a result when it's possible for a result not to be found, then we use the capital case for the capital uh, type. This is the boxing type, the so-called box type, the wrapper type of the normal integer value and this boxing type has uh, the ability to be no. This is an object, whereas the int uh, type just is just the primitive variable. Okay, so now we do the same checks. We check if the age is uh, something different than no, and if it is, then we have found a person and we print its integer value. 
the integer value of the age in this case. Otherwise, we print again no such person. So this code is going to do the exact same thing, but without using a person class. Now, again, most commonly in programming in the industry, what you're going to see is collections of data and most of the data in the industry is objects. So persons, students, cars, whatever you have in your business logic and those things saved by some indices and often saved by a lot of indices. For example, you could have a map of strings indexing and indexing the people by their names and then another map of integers indexing the people by their age. So let's say that you have uh, a database which needs to search for people quickly based on their age or their name. And in that case, well, you just check in both maps, see if that uh, input is valid in one of the maps and return that if it is. And otherwise, search in the other map and see if that's valid. So that's an idea for a bonus homework task. Try to implement this task in which you read something, you, you read a string and then check if that's a name of a person, you know, search for the people, search for a person in this map of people. And then if it isn't, check if it's an age of a person, meaning convert that into an integer and search into another map which contains integers. That again is very fast. So you're doing one operation to look in the string map and then one operation to look in the integer map. Whereas if they were arrays or lists, you need to loop, loop once through all of the elements and that those are n operations to find the element you need. And since you're checking for two things, that's n multiplied by two. Whereas in our case, it's just one operation for one thing, one operation for the other thing, and that's it. Granted, they are a bit slower operations than just checking for equality in a loop. But still, when there are n items, which can be 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 100,000, well, then it, starts re it really starts to matter how you're storing your information and how you're looking for it. And again, the maps are not affected by how many items there are. They are just affected by how difficult it is to convert the string, the thing you're looking for into an index, meaning how complex the, the hash function is. Okay, so we discussed associative arrays actually. So that's, now let's see them formally. So associative arrays or maps or dictionaries or tables, there are a lot of uh, different ways you can name them. The most often is probably map dictionary and table. Okay, so these are things indexed by keys. So arrays are indexed by integers 0, 1, 2 and so on until you reach length minus 1. Whereas maps are indexed by their keys and each map holds a sequence, a list actually, of keys and values. So each item in a map is a key value pair. Okay, and how do you work with them? <clears throat> and how do they look in the in memory? Well, they look the following. The, they're represented in the following way. You have keys in the table or the map or the dictionary or whatever you like to call it. You have a key in the map and then you have a value for that map. And each item in the map contains both a key and a value. So these are the items in the maps, which I'm outlining right now. So these are the items in the maps and it is uh, it is the, the operation of searching for an ind so for something in the map uh, by its key is fast. It immediately finds that index. For example, if you're looking for Sam Doe, that's going to be one operation to find Sam Doe in the index. Whereas if it was just a list, you'd need to search and check this one and then this one and then this one. That's, those are three operations. Okay, so there are Three different, three different types of maps which are most commonly used in uh, Java. One of them is a hash map, the one we just use. Keys in this hash map are unique. You can't have, and that actually um, is applied for all of the maps which we're talking about. So keys being unique means that you can't have, in our case, two people with the same name. So you can't have both uh, George of 27 and George of 35 and George of 42. Each time you put a new value into the map, you override the old one at that index, the same way you do for an array. So in an array, you can't have multiple, um, multiple values at the same index. You can have a single value at that index. Well, you can work that around by using a list of values, by having an array in, in which each of the elements is a list of values, and you can do the same in the map actually. Okay, so about that a bit further on. Okay, so 
That's the hash map, unique values, and it uses a hash table to store the information. So the, the hash table is what I told you the hash map does. It calculates an integer from the key you're providing it and places the object in that index in an internal array it uses. Okay, so it, it's nothing special, it's just uh, a, a map of values. Okay, the linked hash map is a bit of uh, an upgrade over the normal hash map in that it keeps its keys in the order of addition, meaning that if you iterate through a linked hash map, you're going to get the items in the order in which you added them. Whereas if you're iterating a normal hash map, you have no guarantees of order, so they can be ordered in any possible way. And they could even change their order between different iterations. That doesn't really happen with the standard hash maps, but it's not a, something that it's guaranteed. So whenever you have a hash map, you can't expect this hash map to be ordered in any understandable way. Okay, and the last thing, which is a bit different, is the tree map. Again, you have unique keys inside the tree map. However, the tree map expects its keys to be comparable. So it expects keys to be, for example, strings, integers, stuff that you can sort. If you can sort them with collections.sort, that means that they can be used inside the tree map as a key. Now, what's the uh, advantage of the tree map? Well, it always keeps its elements sorted by their keys. So if you're going, if we switch over here to a tree map, so if we say that this map is not a hash map, but it's a tree map, then this tree map, we need to import it, of course. This tree map uh, is going to contain the people in their order, in their alph alphabetical order. So if I enter George, then Ada, then Peter, we're going to have the items ordered as Ada, George, Peter, because that's the alphabetical order of those names. Okay, we'll see that in a bit. So that those are the differences. I told you about the put method, it just places an item at some index in the map. Okay, now what I didn't tell you about is the remove method. Now the remove method operates on the same parameters as the get method. So the get method returns the value, whereas the remove method removes the value. So now if we have this, uh, and by the way, the remove method, the put method, the get method uh, are all, uh, they work for any type of map. So it's, it's common for all maps. Now notice how I'm using this just map name here. So the data type is map and I'm instantiating it with an hash map object. That means that if I'm accessing people now, I'm only accessing the methods which the map class has, the base class has. So these are the common methods which all maps have. So since I'm since I can do get on this map, I can do it on any map which is assignable to a map over here. So any tree map, link, hash map, whatever, they all have a get, they all have a, uh, they all have a put, they all have a remove. Okay, so if now I add uh, to these people, if I say people.put and I put George uh, with the age of 27, and then if I put Peter with the age of 35, so I don't have to enter it all the time, and then I say people.remove, and then say remove Peter, then in my map, all I'm going to have left is George. So now if I start this program and I inspect this map, I'm waiting, oh, I have a scanner.nextint over here. I don't really need that. That's why my code is waiting and not stopping at my breakpoint. So now it's going to go over these lines, reach over here and now notice people size is one, but I added two, two people in this. Why, why is the size one? Well, because I removed Peter. I removed by an index, the index Peter. Okay. So now I can examine this map over here in the variables view. And I can see that <clears throat> the first item in that variables view is George and they, that George has a value of 27 attached to it. <clears throat> okay. Now, if I didn't remove Peter, if I didn't have this line, then I'd have both of them in the map. So let's wait a bit to see that. <clears throat> okay, so I have these people over, over here and I have George with the value of 27 and Peter with the value of 35. Okay, so that's what the hash map does. It can remove elements and can it can add elements. And now what we haven't seen yet is how we can iterate these elements. Okay, oh, uh, there are also a few methods which 
give you boolean results for example contains key answers the question whether getting an item will, would result in no right so if i say uh people with this data people don't get ada that's going to give me what result so that's not a person actually since we're saving integers in our case so an integer add a h because that's what we're saving over here in this map that's why i'm telling it that uh, that's why i'm naming it add a h or just maybe h since that's i'm getting ada and that's the h for ada anyway so if I'm getting Ada right now, what I get for H would be no, right? So if I start the debugger again and see what inspect this value, I'm going to get no. Well, if you say people dot contains key H, that's going to return a Boolean value. Boolean uh, contains key Ada. Okay, so has h for adder equals people dot contains key adder what does this do well it does a get operation and then checks whether the result of that operation is null so this is the same as saying has h for adder equals people dot get adder different than null so is this value different than null so contains key is just a short shorthand for this operation okay and there's also contains value which checks for a value and I, now i really don't advise you to use this why well contains value is just as slow as looking for in a list because that's what it does because the items over here are ordered by their index so th this is the index so searching by the index is fast whereas whereas searching by the value just requires you to go through all of the items in the map and check if that value is there so this is a slow operation do it only if you really need to do that slow operation okay so this ch this thing checks the values it doesn't check uh, the keys okay and now we have an illustration of how this operation works so what happens is the object you're adding goes through the hash function more uh, more specifically its key goes through the hash function and then gets placed somewhere in that map and if you add another object it gets into the, that map again now if you're if you say remove you just provide the key which you want to remove and that key is found in the map and that map uh, is uh, reduced by that key the, the key and the value for that key are removed okay now a tree map works differently in that it can instead of running things through a hash function it runs them through a comparator so once you're adding items that comparator checks which item which key should be before which key and moves items around so that they are always ordered okay so how can we see that order well we need to iterate through the maps so you can iterate through maps like say this map which is initialized over here or the map which we initialized over here with george peter and ada that's actually put in ada too so people dot put ada which is let's say 21 okay and now what can we do over here well we can iterate this map Okay, so how do we iterate the loop? Uh, how do we iterate um, a list? We just type in the name of the list and then we say iterate. Um, so we implement a range-based for loop uh, for each loop on that list. How do we do that for a map? Well, the map has a special property, a special getter called entry set. So this is this returns all the entries inside a map. So these are all the items inside the map and you call iterate on this. So you iterate these values. So you type in entry set and then you type in, uh, let's remove the breakpoint so that it doesn't uh, make, make things weird. So you say iterate and what did we get? We, get, we got an auto generated for each loop, which gets each time a map.entry, an entry containing a string and an integer okay and it named it ent string integer entry i would just call it entry okay and now how do i print the values well let's just say system.out.println and what did we say that the entry contains let's use actually print f because we're going to print formatted information so one thing we're going to be printing is the key of the entry and the other thing which we we're going to be printing is the value of the entry which in this case is an integer so a string and a number okay so what are those string and number how can we get them from this entry well we already said that e everything in a map is just a pair of a key and a value so this entry is actually an object 
in, on which I can say dot get key. I can type in dot get key and that gives me the key. So for the first entry George, get key will return George. And for the first entry George, entry dot get value will return 27. So if I start this loop, I will see George, Peter and Ada printed out onto the console in some order. I actually should have added a new line over here so it's a bit more clearer to read. So starting this code, let's print this out. So George, Peter and Ada. Now they are ordered in the way I added them, but this isn't something you can rely on. In this case, that's how they're ordered. In another case, they could be ordered in some different way. So the normal hash map, you can't expect them to be ordered in the order of, ad of addition. Now, if you use a linked hash map, that guarantees that these are going to be in this order. So they're going to be in the order in which you added them to the linked hash map. And the other operations, operations are exactly the same. Nothing else changes, just the internal operations inside this, that, inter, that linked hash map change. Okay, so that's how you uh, iterate a map. Now, if I change this into a tree map and notice that I'm not changing anything else, I'm just changing the internal implementation of a map. I'm just telling it to internally work in a different way. But my put operations, my get operations, and so on, my iterations are implemented in the same way. Now, if I run it, I'm going to see add a first. Why? Well, because add a key is first alphabetically, and this tree map compares items alphabetically if they're strings, or it compares them numerically if they're integers. Okay, so this is how you iterate a map. This is, this is how you get each of the entries inside that map. And each of those entries has a key and a value. The key is what you index by, and the value is whatever you put after that. Okay, so that's iteration on a map, and here's another example of doing that. Okay, so we have a problem over here, and let's solve that problem. We have a list of real numbers, and we need to print them in ascending order. Okay, so that should indicate something to you. Okay, so a list of real numbers, and we need to count their occurrences. So we have 8, 2, 2, 8, 2. So we have 2 3 times, and we have 8 2 times. Okay, so what do we do? Well, if we're following along with the lesson up until this point, we're probably going to figure out that this is going to be a task about maps, right? So how do you solve that? Well, we're going to be using a map. And since they're going to be in ascending order, and since we're printing them like this, so we're saying two is encountered three times and eight is encountered two times, <clears throat> what does that indicate to you? Well, it indicates that we're iterating through values of a map. And since we're iterating in increasing order, so two, then eight, that's what kind of map? What kind of map iterates its items in increasing order? Well, the uh, tree map does that. Okay, and what we're going to be doing? Well, we're going to read an item, read a number, and then see what that number's value is, and then just go to the map and increase the count of that value. So we're going to be mapping the following thing. We're going to be mapping numbers to occurrences. So for each number, we, we're going to be counting how many times it appears. It's pretty much the same as if we were, we were reading words, 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 and we're mapping word to the, to the number of the, of the occurrences of that word, to the count of that word inside uh, the text, for example. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's do it. We need, what do we need? Well, we need to order these, order these items in ascending order, so we're going to need numbers, so, and we're going to be reading them from a single line on the console. So let's read numbers from a single line on the console. We've already done that a lot of times. So we have a scanner, we're going to tell that scanner to read an entire line, then split that line by spaces, and then get that line as a list of items. So actually an array of items. So this is the string array um, item. Let's call it items because they're not exactly numbers since they're not converted to numbers yet. Okay, and now for each item, I need to visit that item and convert it into an integer. So I'd start 
I type in items, I iterate those items, and I'd say for each item, convert that into a number. How? Well, I'm going to use integer dot parse int and enter that item. Okay, so parsing that integer into a number, and then that number, I'm going to what? I need to count how many times this number appears. So this number is actually my identity thing. This is this is what I'm going to be looking for when I'm doing my operations. So what I'll do is make a map, <clears throat> tell that map that it's going to contain integers and integers again. I can do that. It's perfectly fine for the key to be the same as the value, at least for their data types to be the same. Okay, and now I'm counting number occurrences, the number of times a number is seen in the input. And I'm going to initialize that since we're needing ascending order. I'm going to initialize that with a tree map. Okay, so I'm going to be looking for the occurrences of each number by initializing a tree map. And then once I have a number, what, uh, what am I going to do? Well, if I haven't encountered it yet, if it's the first time I'm, I'm finding this number, if, I, if it's the first time I'm seeing this number, then I'm going to place it inside number occurrences as that number with the value one. So what I'm saying here is get number occurrences and put at position number the value one, just as if it was an array. I'm increasing the value at that index by one. I'm setting it to one the first time. Now, if I just leave it like this, every number I encounter is going to have the value one next to it. But I don't want that. I want, if I see it for the first time, I want it to be to become one. But if, if I see it a second time, so like over here, if I say eight for the first time, then I'm going to, in my map, go over here and say, okay, eight, say that this is one time. Now, I see two. Okay, so two, we mark it as one time. But then I see two again. And now what do I want to do? Well, I want to check if two exists in the map. So does two exist? And the answer is yes. And if two exists, well, change its value to the value two, increase its value by one, because I've encountered it another time. I do the same for eight and then again for two, I check, okay, does two exist? Yeah, it does. So since it exists, increase that by one again. So this is going to become three. And meanwhile, eight would have become two. So the number of occurrences for eight would have become two. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, obviously I need to check if the number exists and I need to do that every time because I don't know if the, I don't know at which number I am. So I just check all the time I check, does that number exist? So I say, if, and how am I, how am I going to do that? I could use contains key, but since I'm in, going to be increasing it, if I find it anyway, I'm going to do this, the following. I'm going to create an integer and call that integer um, occurrences. The number of occurrences, is occurrences written with double R or not? Okay, it doesn't matter. So occurrences equals what? Where do I get the occurrences of the current number? Well, I get it from number occurrences dot get number. So give me the occurrences, the count of that number. How many times have I seen this number? Now, if I haven't seen it yet, then occurrences is going to be what? What do we get when we get a key? So, so when we get a value from a, by a key, and if that key hasn't yet been added to the map, what do we get? Well, we get no. So if we get no, if occurrences is no, then we need to place the number one because we obvi obviously haven't met this number yet. So we're adding it as a single occurrence. Otherwise, if occurrences isn't no, so occurrences is an actual value, then we found this item already. Now, how many times it doesn't matter since once we found it one more time, what needs to happen with occurrences? Well, it needs to get increased by one and it needs to get written back into the map. So I'm going to say set at position number, at position number, set the value occurrences plus one, right? So this, I know that this is different than no. And since it's different than now, I can increase it by one. I can calculate this plus one and place that result inside number occurrences. Now, since this is simply an integer, I can't change the value itself inside the map. I need to place a new value in the map. Remember, integers can't be modified directly uh, 
when you have a reference to them. So when you have this integer occurrences, you can't modify it inside the map. This is you can think of it as a copy of the actual value over here. Whereas if it was a person, you could, for example, change their age or something. Okay, so this is going to increase increase the number of occurrences of this value by one inside our map. Okay, anything else we need to do? Well, we need to print these items. Okay, so we need to say items, iterate, uh, not the items, but the well, we already are iterating the items. What do we need to iterate? Well, we need to iterate the occurrences. So we need to say number occurrences, give me the entry set, and then iterate that. And this I'll just call entry. And now what I need to do is simply print this format. So how do I get this format? Well, let's copy this value and say system.out.printf. Print me a formatted line, end it with a new line. And what should that formatted line contain? Well, one number, then space dash uh, greater than dash the other number. So uh, num number, uh, space, arrow, space, the other number. Okay, so I can just copy it actually. Number, space, the arrow, and then the other number. And now I just replace these uh, specific numbers with whatever numbers I'm going to be getting from the format string. So what should I get from the, f the format string? Well, the first, the key is the number itself. What number am I counting the occurrences of? So entry.getKey gives me the number itself, the thing by which I'm indexing. And then entry.getValue gives me the value itself, the, v the value by which I'm, uh, the value which I've stored at this index. So when I start this program, what I'm going to get is a program which reads in numbers, adds them into the tree map, uh, first checks, gets the number at that index. So it reads a number, it gets the occurrences of that number, the count of that number, the, the times I've met this number in the input, gets those times. If there are there is there if there is no such entry for this number, if there are there are zero occurrences, then I'm going to get no because the map couldn't find my number because I haven't added it. Okay? And I just put it back with a value of one. If there are occurrences already, so if I'm counting up something already, well then I just increase the number of occurrences by one and put it back into that number position. So I overwrite this position with occurrences plus one. Okay, so now if I uh, enter my data over here, I should see two is encountered three times and eight is encountered two times. Now, why did I get them ordered two and then eight? Well, I got them ordered that way because I'm using a tree map. If I was using a hash map, I'd get a random order. If I was using a linked hash map, I'd get eight and then two, because that's the order in which I'm creating them. Okay, so this is how you count the number of occurrences of things in some input. Now you can do it for any type of input. If these were instead of uh, numbers, if they were words, well, the code is exactly the same, only you wouldn't be parsing them into integers, you would just be using the strings here in items. So it's the same code and the map would be keyed by string instead of keyed by integer. And that's it. Those are pretty much all the changes you need. Okay, so here we have a solution to this. Again, there are different ways you can solve this. Uh, the slides suggest the usage of contains key. The reason I'm avoiding contains key, even though it's a bit more uh, descriptive of what we're doing, is that contains key needs to do one search and then we need to do another search. Okay. So we then overwrite the value with the new. Um, now there are some uh, details over here. The numbers aren't actually uh, integers like I'm doing in my solution. So I'm using integers over here. You should be using doubles for this task. So the task is called count real numbers and you should print them with some accuracy. So you have real numbers over here instead of just integers. But as I said, it doesn't really matter what data type you're storing, the map works the same way. So the map works both for double, for string, for integer, for whatever you wish. Okay, so we've talked about uh, maps, we've uh, showed you how you can use them, and now since we've discussed that already, let's continue on with the next part of the, le uh, of the lesson. In programming, 
what you're going to see uh, when you see a lambda function, what, you, what it usually means is a shorthand expression, a shorter expression that gives some kind of result, although it's not uh, always necessary for it to return a result in uh, programming. So a shorthand for a function uh, expression. So instead of writing an entire function, you just write an expression which is treated as a function. So what you do is use this arrow operator over here in Java, which you read as goes to. So on the left of that goes to operator, you have the parameters of that lambda, whereas on the right of that goes to operator, you have the method body of that lambda. So instead of writing a function which accepts for example an integer parameter a and then returns whether a is larger than five or not you can just write that like this like this code over here okay so let's uh, um, let's actually see that before we start seeing it in uh, more in the in the further in the slides further on so instead of let's uh, go back to this code over here um, say you want to uh, what can we do something more simple well okay let, let's uh, describe the concept itself so when you write a lambda it's so let's say you have the function boolean um, are ordered correctly so the static boolean function the static boolean method are ordered correctly is going to accept a few parameters, let's say two parameters, and it's going to respond whether these two parameters are ordered correctly, meaning that it's going to respond whether the number A is smaller than the number B. So it's going to return whether A is less than B. So are ordered correctly will return the value whether A is less than B in this uh, in, in its operation so if I say are ordered correctly 4 and 5 then this is going to return true whereas instead instead if it was 5 and 4 it's going to return false so doing this operation will um, will, will execute the this line of code and that's going to return a boolean now instead of me writing this entire uh, method polluting the global namespace, not the global, but the main namespace with it. So main now has a method which isn't really used in other places than this specific uh, place over here. Uh, instead of doing all this, instead of writing all this code, what I can do in places where stuff like a function returning a boolean accepting two variables uh, is required, is I can replace this entire piece of code with a comma b meaning the parameters a and b go into uh, a less than b so this is a shorthand now it won't compile like this uh, if i write it over here even if i do it like this it's not going to create a function and execute it and so on although if i say boolean x equals no still can't make it do it so the point is these, whatever, what I wrote over here is a shorthand for writing a function that accepts two parameters of any type in this case, accepts two parameters of some type, and then returns the result of comparing the first parameter to the second parameter. Okay, so this is a lambda. A lambda is a shorthand for a function, and there are specific places in which you use lambdas. So, for example, in collections.sort, so if you have, let's say we have um, a list of integers and we call these numbers and we initialize them with a new array list and fill that array list with an array treated as a list containing the values 4, 1, 3 and 2. Okay, so now what I can do is tell collections dot sort this numbers list okay so what this does is compares the numbers according to the natural order of these numbers sort them out and let's say we're going to print them now on the console let's run a loop over them and for each number in numbers i'm just going to say system.out.print 
line that number. And now we see these numbers ordered as one, two, three, and four on separate lines on the console printed after this sort operation completes. Now some of my code is formatted badly, so I just pressed Control Alt and L and L to format it correctly. Okay, so. This is a sorting operation and it sorts the numbers over here. Now, how does it know which number to place where? So how does it decide whether uh, one should be before four or after four? Well, it does it by using a comparator. So the second parameter over here of the collections.sort method is a comparator. What does a comparator do? Well, it compares two values, obviously. Now, if you start typing in new and press uh, control and space, you'd get the suggestion for implementing a comparator function. So what does a comparator function do? Well, it simply uh, returns an integer value, which is the result of comparing two existing integers. So now this code over here might seem a bit weird, and it probably does, but it's just a way for sort to call something and to ask it whether O1 is less than O2. And how do you do that? Well, you just say O1 compared to O2. Compared to actually returns an integer value, which if the two numbers are equal, the integer value is zero. And if they are not equal, the integer, if the first one is smaller than the second one, the integer value is larger than or smaller than zero. So it returns actually three possible values, either a value smaller than zero or a value equal to zero or a value larger than zero, depending on whether O1 is larger than O2 or the opposite is true. Okay, so it doesn't really matter when it returns minus one or minus two and so on, and when it returns plus one and plus two and so on. All that matters is that you can use the compare to function to order numbers in their natural order. So if you say compare O1 to O2 like this, so when you need to compare two numbers inside these, this numbers uh, list to order them, just compare them as you would compare the first number to the second number because each object in each comparable object in Java has a compare to method. Then this will sort the numbers in this order in which O1 comes before our O2. So whatever order you uh, call the object, uh, call the method, and provide a parameter in. So if you call the method on the first object and provide the second object as a parameter, then sort we will try to order O1 and O2. We'll try to order objects such that the smaller item is before the larger item. So when you accept parameters like this, the first item is expected to be smaller and if it isn't sort will do something to change that order and the second parameter is expected to be larger so if you say return o1 compared to o2 this will return a result which will tell the sort function whether it should swap these values around or whether it shouldn't that's a sort of a simplistic explanation of what a comparator does it's just used by sort to determine whether these two numbers are in the correct order like like this and if you say that you want these two numbers to be in this order with this code then they are going to be in this order now if you swap these around o2 and o1 then you're going to tell the sort function that these two numbers should be ordered so that o2 become comes before o1 okay so that's a comparator function and now you can see that this it's not actually a function it's a comparator object and now you can see that this is a lot of code so this is a large piece of code which really comes down to just one expression we have the parameter o1 and the parameter o2 and we need to do something with them we need to compare one to the other now instead of writing this whole code i can minimize this with the lambda and say that o1 and o2 the parameters which i got need to uh, Using them, I need to evaluate this expression, compare the second to the first, meaning that now sorting the numbers will sort them by uh, in reverse order. So when I start this, I'm going to get 4, 3, 2, 1 printed on the console. Okay, so here we have 4, 3, 2, 1 printed on the console. So a lambda is just a shorthand for a function. Instead of writing an entire function, for instead of writing an entire method, you just write the part of that method which matters to whoever is going to be using that method. So in this case, you're telling sort, how do I compare two numbers? Well, 
these two numbers need to be in this order only if uh, this comparison returns a, a result that is appropriate for that case. Now, if you want to play around with what that result really means, you can just do um, integer dot compare one and two and see it, what it prints out. So let's say system dot out dot print line compare one with two and see what that prints out. And that's going to print out an integer which is either smaller than or greater than zero because one and two aren't equal. So what did we get? Minus one. Well, guess what integer dot compare does and that's the same thing that compare two does. Well, it subtracts this no the second number from the first number. And if it gets a negative value, if sort sees a negative value, then it says, says, okay, these two need to be in this order. Otherwise, it decides that it needs to swap them if the, if the value is positive. So now if I compare um, seven to two, guess what's going to, guess what you're going to get as a result? Well, let's see it. We got one, a number larger than uh, zero. So it subtracted seven and, and two, it got a number larger than zero and it returned one. So it returns one, one in when the first is larger than the second. And again, you can think of it like subtraction. So compare is just like add a minus over here and see whether the value is positive or negative. That's what it does. If it's a positive value, then it's going to return one. If it's a negative value, it's going to return minus one. And if they are equal, so seven and seven, what is this going to do? Well, seven minus seven is zero. So that's what you're going to get from compare. So what does sort do? Well, it checks whether it got a negative value. So if you see, if, if it checks two numbers, so if, if it comes over here and says four and one, and compares them what if it gets a negative value so if it gets a negative value it's going to say okay they are correctly ordered but since in this case it's not going to get uh minus one it's going to get one because four minus one is three that's a positive value so it's going to get one then it's going to swap them around so it's going to swap around one and four it's not exactly going to do that but it's going to know that these two values aren't ordered correctly and it's going to need to find a way to order them, order them correctly. So that's what sort does. It just accepts a comparator information which, which tells it how to compare. Now, since we've provided it the other way around over here, so it gets four and one, it gets four and one over here, but we're comparing one with four, it's going to decide, okay, so these are the, in the correct order. So four is before one, and that's what I'm getting from this compare function, from this compare lambda. Then I'll keep them ordered that way. Well, of course, there could be more items inside over here. So it's going to continue and swap around until it reaches uh, a situation in which all items uh, get a minus one when compared like this. But you get the point. It, it just executes this operation to decide whether to sw swap around two numbers or not, whether two numbers order is correct or whether it isn't correct. Okay. So instead of writing the, that entire long function, which you saw previously, you can just write that like so. So this is a Lambda function and Lambda functions are made to be provided as parameters to other functions and you and be used to describe what those other functions should do uh, in their operations. OK, so that's what a Lambda function is. And for example, this lambda function is the equivalent of a function that returns an integer, accepts an integer, like a single integer, and it returns a single integer by dividing it by two. This is another lambda function, which guess what? Re accepts an integer and returns, what's this operation? A Boolean. So depending on the expression type, well, that's what function gets generated. That's what method gets generated. And here's another example of a lambda. This lambda accepts no parameters. If you want to accept no parameters, you just type in empty brackets and that means no parameters. If you want multiple parameters, you type in brackets and you enumerate those parameters with commas. And if you want a single parameter, you can still put, place it inside uh, brackets, but uh, it's preferable you just use that parameter name. Okay, so this is a function that always returns 42. And that's all you need to know about lambdas for now, further on in uh, other lessons, we will see uh, more advanced usages of lambdas. But before we see that, we're going to talk about the Stream API. Now, the Stream API is a special API added to Java, which allows you to do operations like this. Instead, and we've seen them already 
uh, short uh, for a brief example but now we're going to study what she, what each of those examples actually does and see what how we can use them to improve our code writing okay so what does the stream API do? Well, it handles collections of elements, whether they are arrays or lists or maps or whatever, collections of elements and does operations on them instead of you having to uh, do operations yourself. So, for example, what this code would do is find the minimum value of this, arrays of, of this array of integers and return it as an integer which you can use instead of writing a for loop that search for the minimum searches for the minimum value. So what's actually important about these uh, streams? Well, um, Java 8 added the streams library so you can use streams not just to shorten the way you write code because that's not the that's not usually something you uh, care about too much when you're coding. What you're coding is not how fast you're coding. What you care about is how fast you can read code that's already been written. That's Code gets written usually once, but it gets read a lot of times before it gets re rewritten. So the Streams API isn't just a shortcut for creating uh, short code. The main reason it was actually added was to um, allow easier coding of parallel operations. So uh, modern computers have a lot of uh, CPUs, a lot of cores, and these cores do can do different operations. So uh, Working on large chunks of data is actually more optimal if you split those large chunks of data into specific operations which need to be parallelized by the processors. So the Stream API, is the, the reason it exists is mostly to parallelize operations. However, we're not going to be using it for parallelizing operations. What we're going to be using it for is just doing one-liners, one-line uh, operations on lists and arrays instead of having to write uh, loops with indices and for each loops to operate on our data. Now, that in no way does that mean that uh, you should not use for loops for uh, simple operations when you need to process data. Actually, it's it's sort of preferable to use for loops instead of using the stream API when it's clear enough what your code does. So if, you're, if, if you've structured your code into methods, each of those methods has an appropriate name and that name indicates what that method does and that method uh, is called and then provided as a parameter to another method and so on, that's completely fine and you don't need to use the stream API if you write your code like that. Now, it's still a nice tool to have at your disposal, so we're going to see how we can use them. But again, my advice is don't overuse this stuff. It, re it could really allow you to write very difficult to read code. So don't overuse it. Use it just for one-liners that uh, are going to save you time from writing loops which you've written a hundred times already. So without further ado, let's discuss what streams are. Now, there are two Let's call them two types of streams. One type of streams works on arrays. Another type of streams works on collections like lists, um, um, maps, and so on. Now, they aren't really two different types, but working, working with arrays, especially arrays of primitive values, is a bit different. You remember that if you're creating a list, that list needs to be a capital case integer, whereas if you're creating an array, it can be an array of uh, lowercase integer or capital case integer. So this other, the, the second type of array, this lowercase integer, this primitive integer is the, it's sort of the odd one out. It, it doesn't really match with uh, Java's way of uh, using collections. So these primitive arrays, which we create over here, uh, need some special handling when you're using the stream API. So you're going to see differences of uh, how we're using the stream API based on whether we're uh, streaming over a list or we're streaming over an array. So that those are the two different uh, categories of stream API operations you're going to be doing. Okay, so what does a stream do? A stream simply uh, operates on a bunch of data with shorthand operations and it does that lazily, meaning that it only does the actual operations when it gets to a so-called uh, finalizer or terminator uh, stream operation. So min, for example, is a terminator stream operation. Why is it a terminator operation? Because 
in order to get the minimum value, you actually have to traverse the values inside the stream and get a result. And after you get the minimum value, you can't convert that back into a stream because the minimum, minimum value is just the minimum value. Whereas if you're doing filtering, for example, if you're removing any number that's say not uh, an even number, that operation will not be executed until you reach a terminating operation like for example min. So let's actually play around with that. So let's get rid of these numbers and then just create an array and play around with that. So let's create an array. So let's create an integer array and call it numbers and initialize it with the numbers, let's say one, two, three, and four. Okay. So we have an integer array of numbers. Now let's say I want to, hmm, don't know. What do I want to do with this uh, array? Well, let's say I want to leave in only the elements. I want to get only the elements which are even. So how do I do that? Well, one option is to write a for loop. So let's say numbers, iterate the numbers and check if number percent two equals zero. The, and for example, print that number. So say system.out.print line that number. So print only the even numbers. Okay, so what can I do instead of writing this for loop? Well, I can create a stream from these numbers. Now, since they're an integer array, a special a primitive type integer array, I need the special construction of streams, meaning I need to say arrays, please construct a stream from these numbers, from these numbers over here. And then what can I do from here on out? Well, I want only the numbers which are divisible by two. And one of the intermediate operations on a stream is filtering. So now I can say filter these numbers. And how do I want to filter them? Well, how do I tell uh, a stream to execute a piece of code? So how would, does it decide which number to keep and which number not to keep? So how can, what do I need to write over here? What am I writing in the for loop? Well, I'm writing an expression, right? So this is an expression. Well, I can't really copy this expression directly over here because what's number over here? But what I can do is, so this is a piece of code, a piece of code that accepts what's this? It's a parameter, right? So this is actually a method. This is a method which I can extract uh, as a, a static method and call it is even, right? So if the number is even, then I'm going to process it. Okay, so this is actually a method. Well, what I can say over here is provide the is even method, though I'd need to say main uh, double, uh, double column is even. Now what I'm doing is telling filter to use this is even method to filter out numbers. So this code over here, will have the, the same effective result for uh, our data, which we've initialized, the same effective result as this code over here, except uh, the printing part. So this will, after this filter operation completes, anything I get after that filter operation is only going to contain the even numbers inside this array. Okay, so it's not even an array anymore. So we've created a stream from these numbers and now this is a stream. This stream is independent from the array, from the array itself. So this is a new piece of data on which I'm working. So I'm filtering out the numbers from this new stream object, which I've created. And now I'm saying, okay, I want this uh, number, this stream, which I've created to only, uh, to only leave in elements, which are, which match this expression. Now, this might be a bit confusing, so I'll roll it back to what we did a few moments ago, which was use a lambda expression. So how would I do this as a lambda expression? Let's return the is even method. Let's uh, return the expression. So now I have an expression, right? So how do I give an expression to a method to use? Well, I provide a lambda. So here's the expression. It's the same expression. However, I just need to say, okay, so this is a lambda, which receives a number parameter and it returns whether that number parameter is an even number. So filter 
expects me to provide the lambda over here the same way that collections.sort expect me to provide a second parameter actually i can do it without a second parameter but if i do provide a second parameter that second parameter ex is expected to be a lambda which describes how in the in the case of collections.sort it describes how to compare two numbers in filter it describes whether a number should remain in the stream. So if this expression returns true, then this number for which filter is being called at this point, so once, fil so once filter is going to be called for one, so number is going to be one, and the result will be what? It will be false, right? Because 1% 2 equals one. So the remainder of one divided by two is one, so that's not equal to zero, so that, that's not going to uh, be included in the result. So one is, skipped then i'm going to get two okay so two goes into two percent two equals zero well yes it does equal zero so this is going to be included then i'm going to get three so three percent two equals zero well that's false so this isn't going to be included and then i'm going to get four so number is going to be four four percent two is zero so this is going to be included so from here on out any operation i chain up over here is going to work over that uh, remaining sequence of two and four, which I got remain, which I got. Okay, so I need to do something about this at some point. So let's say I want to find the minimum even number from this list instead of printing them all. Actually, let's print them all first. So I can convert this. Now this is a stream. If I create a variable, let's call it x that variable will be created as a stream more specifically as an int stream int streams uh instead what's the difference between just a stream and an int stream well int stream and double stream and float stream and so on are streams specifically designed for working with this primitive type array so if it's a list of integers then it's going to just be a stream but if it's an integer array it's going to be an int stream and int streams have some special functionality which is uh, specific to these primitive data types okay so an int stream and how do i print this int stream well i need to collect this int stream so a stream is just a sequence of values and those values aren't calculated until someone needs them so when i write this code nothing will actually happen so none of these operations will actually execute so this filter operation will not execute these numbers will not be filtered because nobody has asked for the data in order in order for me to ask for the data and now look i'm going to add a breakpoint whoops add a breakpoint over here and it's going to ask me whether i want the breakpoint to be added inside the lambda or on the line and i'm going to say add it inside the lambda and now when I start this code, you're going to notice that this lambda will not execute, even though I've added a breakpoint in it. Look, I directly got onto the for loop, even though this filter operation is written before my for loop. Okay, so let's stop it and let's make it, uh, let's write it out again. Now, lambdas, you can uh, type in on several different lines. So instead of writing a single line like this, you can make it look more like a method, add a method body and place a return, return statement and pray, press a semicolon after that. So notice that uh, this is already looking a lot like a method, only that this method doesn't mention its uh, parameter data types, but it still has a return, it still has a body, you can have as many functions here as you like. So let's place another breakpoint over here so you notice that this breakpoint is inside this method over here. But again, notice that this method will not be executed because nobody has asked for the data inside this int stream. We directly jumped onto the printing over here. Okay, so this code is not executed unless someone asks for it. So let's ask for it. What I'm going to do is say x dot, so this is my stream, x dot min. This is going to give me the minimum value of the stream. Now, in order for it to give me the minimum value, it now has to execute this code over here. So min, what does min return? Well, it returns a so-called, let's say this is min, and a so-called optional int. What does optional int mean? Well, it means that this either contains an integer value or contains no. Because when can it contain no? Well, if this array was empty, there's no such thing as a minimum element, right? Or if this array only contained two, uh, if only if it only contained three and one, well, again, 
after the filter operation x is going the stream x is going to be empty and let's call it at least stream so it's a bit more uh, clear what it is so if this array only contains one and three after i filter it and do the min operation well after filtering it the stream is empty right so because neither three nor uh, one are even numbers so an optional int because the stream doesn't know what it really contains meaning actually that the min value doesn't really know what the stream contains it can't guarantee that there is actually going to be a minimum value because if the stream is empty well then it can't give me a minimum value because there are no values okay so that's why it gives me an optional int and that optional int i can ask for a value so i can say system.out.println min dot and now if i say get as integer this is going to return the minimum value and if there isn't a minimum value well it's just going to uh, throw an exception so it's going to fail now what i can uh, what i can do to check is uh, or uh, or else and that's going to now if i type in let's say minus one here what's going to happen is it's going to try to return a minimum value but if there isn't a minimum value it's going to return minus one so let's see how that works now i'm going to place a breakpoint over here and now you're going to notice that we're going to reach men we haven't stepped inside this code yet right okay and i'm now i'm placing a breakpoint at the next position but however because I'm doing a min operation, and this is a so-called terminating operation. Since I'm doing a terminating operation, the rest of the stream needs to be calculated so I can get my minimum value. I can't get the minimum value before I do the filtering, right? Because the minimum value over here is done after we've done the filtering. Okay, so now when I press F9, we're going to enter this filter operation. Okay, so now you notice that we're filtering the number one, and then we're filtering the number three, and now what did we get for the min? Well, it's empty. Why is it empty? Because we only have one and three here and we filtered those out. So now what's going to be printed on the console is the value minus one because we said or else. So if this value has a value, print that or else return this value, which is minus one. Now let's add back the even numbers, two and four. And let's start it like that. Now again, we're going to reach this part. And when we ask for minimum, then the filtering is going to happen. Okay, so the filtering happens, it says one, two, three, and four. And once I get over here, now I'm going to see that this op optional int has the value of two written inside it. So now when I press F9, I'm going to get the value of two instead of the value of minus one. And I can ask it if I want to do conditional logic based on whether it found the value or not, I can ask stuff like if min dot is present meaning if there is a value then do something otherwise do something else okay so that's why it's an optional int and there is just optional over here too when it's not a primitive integer data type so optional int is specifically for in the primitive integer data type and primitive interrays otherwise you're go just going to get optional which also has is present and stuff like that okay so this is what streams do they operate on some piece of data and now the way you actually do this would be you'd print this entire operation so you say print uh, dot min or else minus one so what did we do now now let's fold this back into a single expression um, I, i'm replacing it with a lambda now what did i do I wrote a single line which says, treat this as a stream of values. Filter those values so that, and I'll remove the breakpoint from here. Filter those values so only even numbers remain. How do I say that? Well, I just say filter and then provide an expression which determines whether a number should be included in the result or not. In this case, it re will return true for even numbers and it will return false for odd numbers so this expression if it returns true for a certain number for a certain parameter that number will be included in the stream from there on out and then i say calculate the minimum on that and then with that minimum if there is a minimum print the minimum otherwise print minus one oh meaning not print minus one but actually return minus one and this entire expression we're saving we're printing onto the console now if i extract this into a variable this is going to be the min result so 
I'm getting a result, which is uh, the numbers converted into a stream, then filtered so that only even numbers remain, then the minimum of those, and if there is no minimum, meaning that if there are no items in the stream remaining, then it's minus one. Otherwise, it's the minimum. So, or else returns the minimum, uh, returns the optional thing if, if it is present, otherwise it returns minus one. Okay, so starting this, we will see two printed on the console, because that's the minimum from the filtered uh, data. Otherwise, one would be the minimum if we, if we weren't doing filtering. But since we are doing filtering and only two and four will remain, only those will be considered for the minimum operation. So that's how you do a, a stream operations on arrays. It's, it's a simple syntax once, once you get used to it. Now, if I had used get as integer instead of or else, well, in that case, if the data was empty, I would get an exception. So if I say get a synth, this is also valid. And for this case, it's going to print two again. So no difference. Let's see it. So if you're certain that you're going to get a result, you just call get a synth. However, if you're not certain, if the data could be, for example, one and three, this is going to crash. So if we start it, it's going to throw an exception. Let's wait a bit. Okay, so we got a no such element exception. Where did we get that? We get that we got that from get a synth. So that throws a no such element exception when it, it throws an error when it can't return a result. Okay, so you use get a synth if you're confident that there's always going to be a value, and you use or else if you're not confident. Or you might want to actually save the optional value, and in one case, so if it has a value, do something, and if it doesn't, do another thing. Okay, so these both in this case will return 15, whereas in this case for an empty array they will return 2. Okay, so max is the opposite of min, it just does the, it's the same concept but it finds the maximum value. Okay, so there are other neat things you can do with integer streams. So again, this is an int stream. If you save this into a variable, this is going to be an int stream. And int streams have some special functionality. Uh, unlike other streams. For example, if you have a stream of people, if you have a stream of the, the person object, it's not going to have stuff like directly calculating the minimum, because what's a minimum for a person? You'd need to supply a way to um, calculate what minimum for people means. You'd need to supply a comparator like you did for the sort operation. Okay, so this integer stream has other neat stuff, like for example, you can say sum. So dot sum. Now notice that I'm doing the sum over the filtered data. So if I do the sum now, that's sum. Now notice that get a synth got uh, false here. So sum directly returns an integer. Why does it directly return an integer? Well, because since this is an inter integer array, it knows that it can sum integers. And there's no such thing as no value. The sum of an empty list is zero, right? right? So no sum, zero. The sum starts from zero and every item gets added into the sum. So the sum has no option of being, uh, of lacking a value, unlike min, which does have an option of lacking a value. So sum just returns that sum. So it doesn't return an optional int, it returns an actual int. So if I start this, the result I'm going to get is zero because I'm filtering out all non-even numbers. However, if I add back the even numbers over here, I'm going to get the result of six. And again, the filtering operation only gets triggered once I actually start the sum operation. Up until that point, nothing gets done. We only get the operation once we reach the sum over here. That's a very important feature of streams. They delay the execution un until you actually need the data. Okay, so this is sum. You can guess what average does. And by the way, there's a neat function called uh, summary statistics, and this returns a stats element. And that summary statistics has a lot of info. So for example, you can say stats.getAverage. You can say stats get sum, get min, get max, and so on. So if you need several of these values, you just return the stats object instead of just the average or the minimum or whatever, and then call the methods you need on them. Okay, so uh, average would return you a value. So let's see what average does actually. So if you say dot average, notice what it returns. It returns an optional double. 
Why is it an optional double? Well, because you can't have an average of zero values because that's not a number, right? So a sum of zero values is just the value zero, but uh, an average is the sum of the values divided by the number of the values. But if there are no values, well, what are you going to divide by zero? That's going to give you a weird number. So that's why average returns an optional double instead of the directly returning a result. And that optional double, guess what, has the same concepts as the optional integer. So you can say get as double if you're sure that you're going to get a result, or you can say or else, and that's going to return you a value, an actual value. So if there is no average, then you can return, let's say, minus one, or you can return zero and so on, whatever you decide to do. Or you can get the average into an optional uh, into an optional double. So you can say optional equals uh, this thing dot average and then say if optional is present, is present, if we manage to calculate the value, otherwise, and then Either print if, if it is present, then you can print the value system dot out dot print line um, and print out the optional dot get as double. Otherwise, you'd print out system dot out dot print line option. Uh, you'd print uh, no numbers uh, or uh, the array is empty after filtering or whatever it is you need to print in your task. So if you don't have a value to print, you just detect that in the else case of the optional is present check and say whatever message you need to say, indicating that there is no information. Okay, so that's what average does. Now, how do we do how do you do this for collections? Well, you use pretty much the same logic. Now, here you're you're going to see a sort of an it's a bit of an anti-pattern. Don't initialize lists like this. You can do it, but it's, there are a few reasons it's not good to do this. And you're going to learn about this when you get to the point of lessons about object-oriented programming. But in short, this just goes inside the array list class, creates a new array list class, and then tells it that it, when it gets initialized, it should add uh, 15, 25, and 35 to its values, meaning that this add gets called directly on this numbers object. I'd suggest that you just do nums.add15, nums.add25, nums.add35. It's, it's, better, it's better style. Okay, so what uh, can we do on uh, a list of numbers? Well, it's pretty much the same that you can do on a list of integers. So let's get these integers over here. And instead of having uh, an array of integers, so instead of creating arrays.stream, what you can have is you can create a list of integer, let's call them numbers again, which is a new array list of integers, and then add to these numbers one, then two, then three, then four. So one, two, three, four. And of course you could just do initialize an array list through the arrays.asList uh, constructor option. So you pass in an array list, uh, which, is which is constructed from a sequence of values. Okay. So we now have these numbers and now for arrays, it was specifically, you had to say arrays.stream and then pass in the array. For lists, it's just numbers.stream, so create a stream from this, and then you can do operations. Now, you also have minim minimum over here and maximum over here and so on. However, you need to provide parameters to minimum and maximum over here. So if you say min, calculate the minimum value, you need to provide the comparator which tells um, the stream how to calculate the minimum value. So since this is an integer uh, class, it's the integer box type, you need to specifically provide uh, something which tells the compiler how to compare. So one way you can do it is provide the same type of lambda you provided for uh, collections.sort. So you did say a and b go into a dot compare to b. Okay, so, so you basically say compare the numbers according to their natural order. Why? Well, because minimum now, since this is not just the primitive integer type, but it's an object and this could have been person. Now the stream can't know if this is a person or an integer or whatever. And that's why the minimum uh, operation over here just expects you to always tell it how to compare. 
So now if you say calculate the minimum, where do I get the minimum from? Well, you get it by uh, comparing the A and B value the way you would compare two A and B integer values. Okay, and now this returns guess what? Want to guess what it returns? Let's call it x equals this. It returns an optional integer. Remember that optional int, right? So this is like that. However, it's for the bigger type. It's not for the primitive int type. It's for the integer box type. So guess what this optional has? So if you say if x is present, it's the same method which you had on optional int, right? So if x is present, system.out.println uh, x and you uh, x dot get this returns the value this returns an integer object okay otherwise what would you do well you'd say otherwise print uh, for example no uh, items remaining and in this case if i start this code it's going to return one However, if I do a filtering over here, and let's do that in a bit, okay, so it told me the result is one. So uh, the only thing I had to do was say, okay, so take this, uh, when you want to find the minimum of these numbers, in order to find out what a minimum is, to, to find out whether one number is less than another, if you have the number A and the number B, then treat them, they're going uh, treat that A, treat them like A smaller than B, if uh, they're ordered in this way. Okay. So this actually can be really replaced with comparator.natural order. So someone has coded this lambda into a static method, comparator.natural order, which just tells the min uh, operation to use the natural order of numbers. And if you don't want the natural order, but you want the reverse order, guess what? You have that as well. Okay. Or if you want to compare something else, you can say comparator.comparing and then you provide what you want to compare. So for each number, for example, compare the number uh, percent three. So compare its remainder when divided by three with uh, the other number. So you're saying when you're doing comparisons, use this value as an integer comparison value. That's what that's basically what you're uh, doing when you're saying comparator.comparing. This is more useful if you're having an array of people and then you'd say if this was an array of person, then you'd say, for example, if you want to find the person with the least age, what you'd be doing is uh, comparator.comparing person person goes into person dot get age and that would find the minimum person by age and it would return not an option of integer but an option of what of a person okay so this is re this returns an option of person and, and if my data was correct i'm initializing it with integers now but if this was initialized by uh, a list of people then this optional person over here x is going to contain the minimum person by their age so the person with the least age and you can even shorten this even more by doing like so comparing call get h on the person object but this might be a bit weird for you so let's leave the lambda in so compa comparator which compares people by what well by their age okay so there are other comparing uh, functions and you can play around with all of them. We won't be uh, showing all of them now because it's going to take too much time, but that's how you do it on lists. So on lists, you just say dot stream again. There are a few details like minimum needs a comparator which to use. The shortest way to do that is, let's go back to the integer option. The shortest way to do that is to just, let's convert this into an integer again. If you want the numbers compared if you want the smallest number well you need to compare them by the natural order so you you want the first item in the list to be the one uh, the first item the, the the item that minimum finds you want it to be uh comparator dot the natural order so it's going to find the smallest item according to the natural order so the one that's closest to zero or the ones that that whose value is the least if there are negative elements is going to uh return the uh, the, the leftmost negative element, whereas in leftmost, I mean on the numerical axis, where on the left you have the negative numbers and on the right you have the positive ones. 
Okay, so natural order just means give me the smallest number. Now, you could say also max, which does the same thing, or you can play around and say minimum with the reverse order, and that's equivalent to maximum, right? So if you're looking them in reverse, if you're doing the reverse of the minimum, that's the maximum, right? And if you're doing the reverse of the maximum, that's the minimum. But I don't advise uh, you do this. You just use the natural order and min if you want the minimum and the natural order and max if you want the maximum. Okay, so starting this code, what it will do is print out the value of this optional because it will be present and that value will be 4. However, if we filter it and if we say, I want the stream to remove everything except values that are so how do we uh, put that in? Well, we have a number here and that number goes into, let's say, values that are larger than five or four. Well, this filter operation will actually leave my stream empty, right? Because no numbers of these are larger than five. And now when I start this code, I will get no items remaining because I filter out, filtered out everything from this list. So here we go, no items remaining. Okay, so that's what min does and that's what max does. Now, one, one other thing you can do is just map the stream to an integer and just use that integer mapping to uh, use the old operations we used. So if you say map to int, this creates an int stream. Like, okay, let's see that. When, you, when we had an arrays.stream of an integer array, let's say this new integer of array of one, two, three, what we got here what well, this stream, what we got for this stream was an int stream, right? Okay, so if we tell these numbers to get converted into a stream, that's going to give me a normal stream, right? So if I create a local variable, the stream one is going to be a stream of integers. It's not an integer stream, it's not a specific stream for the integer uh, primitive type. It's a type for the capital case integer. Okay, so Instead, of, and I don't want this stream, what I want is an integer stream so I can do the operations I saw when um, we were talking about arrays because there it was easier to use minimum and maximum. Okay, so what I do here is I say map to, and there are several map to options. Map to int will convert it into an integer, primitive integer array. Map to double will convert it into a primitive double array. And map to long will convert it to a primitive long array. So any type of primitive array you can create, you can do over here. And you're probably thinking, well, I can't do a character array, right? Well, yeah, but characters are just a subset of integers, right? So characters are just smaller variables, variables smaller than int. Okay, so what I do is map to int. And it's going to ask me how I want it mapped. And what I'm going to say is each number map it to an integer by just using that number. So use the, the number as it is to convert it into an integer because it's going to ask me how should I convert it into an integer and, then, and I say just use the number itself. Or if I want the numbers multiplied by two, I do two multiplies number, right? So for each number multiplied by two and map that into an integer stream. So this stream now, if I, if I create a local variable, this is going to be an int stream, not just a stream. So I got an int stream again from my list stream, from my normal stream, I got back into an int stream. And you know how to calculate minimum and maximum and so on for an int stream, because we showed that uh, a few slides ago. Okay, so this is another way to use integer stream. So this is uh, another way to use maximum. I showed you now you both have the option of using the slides uh, uh, variant and you have the option of using what I did over here. I provided uh, for max, I provided com a comparator so that it can do the uh, search operations. So you could use this and I'd actually advise you to use this syntax if you're using something that isn't primitive integers because it's going to allow you to change the data type into, for example, a person like we did a while back and the code is going to remain the same, whereas here it won't remain the same because you can't convert people into integers. Or you can, but then you wouldn't get person results, you'd get integer results. Okay. So there are many ways, and by the way, if this seems a bit like Voodoo right now, well, it kind of is because we're just learning different functionalities of the Streams API. If this seems difficult, you don't really need to learn this right now. It's something that you could play around with 
but nothing prevents you from just implementing minimum, maximum and so on as methods you just wrote, which work on arrays or lists and call them on your own. You don't need to use the stream API for all of this. We're just showing you this, these methods so that you can use them if you want to. Okay, so mapping to int, this map to int uh, method just converts, ignore the map part, it doesn't really create a map, it just does something for each of the values. And mapping to int, in this case, will just convert into all of these to int, to double, to long, will create an int stream, double stream, long stream, which are the primitive streams, streams for primitive arrays, special streams, which work with the primitive arrays. Okay, so what does map actually do? Well, map, ignoring the map to int part, well, it obviously converts into an int stream. But if you have a normal stream, any type of stream actually, but let's use this one. If you say map, so filter removes items, whereas map changes items. So if you say map each number to, what can we map it to? Well, if I just say map number to number, that's just going to uh, leave the result as it is. So this running it now, we'll find the maximum value using the natural order of these numbers mapped to themselves. So one will become one, two will become two, three will become three. So the maximum will be four. Okay. However, if I say map them like so, uh, multiply each number by four, then the maximum is going to be 16 because one will become four, two will become eight, three will become uh, 12 and four will become 16 and it will be the maximum. So you can chain operations like this. For example, we can map them um, through this multiplication uh, and then filter out the ones that are less than five. So I can say map them like so, map them so that each number becomes itself multiplied by four and then filter any numbers that are less than 10. How do I say that? Well, I say number goes into if number is larger than or equal to 10, then leave it in filter. If the expression is true, leave this value in. So now only numbers that are larger than or equal to 10 will remain. So what's going to happen? Well, one multiplied by four is four, two multiplied by four is eight, three multiplied by four is 12, and four multiplied by four is 16. So only 12 and 16 will remain in my stream. And the maximum will still be, um, will still be, uh, 16. So let's change that to min so that you see that there's actually a change over here. So that's what streams do for you. They, they just allow you to write single liners for, uh, for processing data. And it's really easy to, to chain them one after the other. So uh, one way you can type them out is like this. It's a bit easier to read. So what am I doing? I'm creating a stream. Then on that stream, on each item in that stream, I'm multiplying that item by four. And then from the result, I'm getting only those numbers which are larger than 10. And then from that, I'm getting the minimum value according to the natural order of elements. So pretty neat, kind of right? Four lines for doing something that you would otherwise do with four loops. And again, the, the biggest uh, upside of this is, is that each of these operations will be executed only once the min operation is called. So you can prepare this data as a stream. So up until this point, this is a stream. So you can use this stream, pass it on somewhere. And whenever the data is needed, then someone can call minimum on it. And only then will that data be calculated. It won't be calculated on each step. So if you have a very large amount of data, you can actually uh, reduce the number of operations you're going to be doing on it that way. Okay. Or at least postpone them until something, uh, uh, until something happens where a result is expected. Okay, so that's what map does. Map to int is just a shorthand that creates an int stream from a normal stream. So int streams and normal streams are different in the, in the fact that int streams work with the primitive integer arrays and the primitive integer arrays have stuff like uh, find the minimum value without having to provide the comparator, for example. Okay, so here we're just mapping each word into that word with triple I appended to the end of it. Okay. Now we've reached the part of how we can convert a stream into a collection. And before we talk about that, we're going to do a break and then finish up with what, what else we have from this lecture. So what else we have, we have, how can we convert these results for which we've only used uh, aggregation. So minimum is an aggregation, right? So minimum means get the minimum value, not uh, 
we're not getting the entire list, we're just getting the minimum value. So now continuing with the last part of our lecture, we already saw how we can use streams to filter out data. We saw how we can reduce that data to a single variable, for example, the minimum, the maximum, the average, and so on. Uh, now let's see how we can get a collection from the stream which we're using. So in many cases, you won't be reducing to a single value. You'd just be filtering out data, for example, filtering out all people with an age less than 18. So you don't uh, get them into the bar, for example, or filtering out all people which don't have enough money to pay the entrance for the bar or whatever it is uh, you're operating. So uh, in that case, you get a result which isn't a single person you'd, or hopefully um, you, you'd get a list of values. So you'd still need to do the filtering, you'd maybe sort them, for example, you'd sort them by the ones that, uh, let's say, have the most money, and then you'd serve them first. But still, you'd still, after filtering and sorting and whatever you, you're doing with them, you're still going to get a result, which is uh, a list of values, a sequence of values. So up until this point, we've only seen how we can uh, get a single value. Now, let's do it again by playing around first with uh, an array and then with a list because as we saw the primitive arrays are handled a bit differently than uh, list streams okay so let's create an array and let's say that it's a person array so it's a bit more fun using the data so it's a person array and we'll call it people um, no actually let's start with the integer the primitive integer arrays because they're different whereas a person array isn't really different from the normal streams okay so let's create an integer array and let's call it numbers again and let's initialize it with a new integer array containing the numbers one two and three okay so what do we do from here well uh, let's uh, Let's say we want to filter out any numbers which are not uh, even, just like we did previously. So how did we do that? Well, well, we say arrays create a stream out of this numbers array and then filter that numbers array in what way? Well, I want for each number in that numbers array to for you to keep that number only if the number is even, meaning that the division of the number by two gives a remainder of zero. And if we get that result, well, then the, that the number that number gets to remain in the stream. Again, we're now working on this stream, not on the array itself. The stream is just a copy of this data and it works on the copy of the data. So at least it's the copy of the numbers. OK, so we have these uh, numbers over here. And now what do we do? Well, uh, we want to get the remainder so we want to get the remaining number so let's make this one two three and four like we did before okay so how do we convert this back into an array since we had an array initially and we want a new array which only contains the filtered elements well we say to array now there are several ways to do this uh, conversion to an array um, and this is just one of them but since you have an integer stream like this one because arrays.stream creates an int stream you remember that right so this is an int stream okay now on an int stream you can uh, say dot to array and that will just generate an array from this int stream so these are int filtered so filtered numbers or even I could call them even numbers and now if I want to print these numbers out, I could just say even alt enter iterate for each integer and even just system dot out dot print it out. So print that integer number on the console. So that's one way to do it. You just call the to array method if you have an int stream. Only int streams have the to array method. Now notice that this is a cool way to parse the input. We've done this before. So what are we doing? So we have to infer for this input. Now, if this input was strings, so let's convert these into strings. So these are strings. And what are we doing with these strings? Well, we need to parse them into numbers. So let's say that this is a string array numbers, a new string array of numbers. Okay. And now how do we uh, filter them? Well, we in order to filter them by whether they're uh, um, whether they are even or not, we need to first parse them into integers, right? But how do we parse them? Well, each of these values is a string, and I want each of these values to be converted into an integer. So how do I do it? Well, I want to do an operation on each value. So I'd say map 
okay so i'd say and if and since i'm going to be using an integer array so i'm starting with an integer array and i want to continue using an integer array because i'm con converting it back to an integer array i'd say instead of just map because that would return a stream not an int stream if i say map to int that will return an int stream so i'd say for each number in these numbers uh, for each number string, so since this is a number string, right? So at this point, the numbers are just strings. These strings, one, two, three, and four. Now mapping them to int will get me a string, and I want to convert this string to a what? I want to convert it to a number. So I'd say integer dot parse int of this number string. Okay, so let's separate them on separate lines again. Okay, and then I'd filter out the non-even ones, and then I'd convert it to an array. Now, IntelliJ is uh, suggesting that I change this into a method reference. So if you say map to int, instead of, if you're doing just one thing, you're just calling, calling parse int over a number, you can replace it with a method reference like so. You can just say call parse int, and Java handles what, how it should call it and what parameters it should supply. But the, uh, if this is confusing to you, just use the lambda. So map to int. How do we map it to int? Well, we take the string and we parse it into an integer and use that value into, in the mapping to int. And we use the to int instead of just map <clears throat> because when we just map, we're going to receive um, a stream of the integer object, not the primitive int. And we want to remain with the primitive int so we can get the array. Okay. So map to int does that for us, and to array converts this back into an array. Now, if I just used map, let's do that. If I just used map instead of map to int, I can still convert this into an array, but notice what result I'm going to get. Even uh, boxed. Uh, there's a reason I'm calling them boxed. Okay, so notice what I'm getting. I'm getting an object array because it... I've done the mapping to integer over here, but how can it know what type of uh, object I'm getting? So how can it know that this continues to be an integer array? It can't. Now, one way to do that is to provide a generator over here. And now I can say, okay, so this even box thing isn't just uh, an integer. It's an integer array and call it new. Now, what's this going to do? Well, this is going to create an integer array of this boxed type. So this isn't the primitive type, it's the box type. How did I do that? I said, I want an integer array. That's how you create an integer array, right? So this is the non-primitive integer array. And I wanted it to call the new operator of that integer array. So this is just like how here we can rep replace integer.parsint with integer uh, column column parsing so call this method in the same way I tell it to call the new method of integer array meaning initialize an integer array so if this seems a lot weird to you not just a little weird to you I can I can understand that that's because you're seeing it for the first time and it's a bit unusual for syntax um, and you're going to understand it better once you know more about classes ob uh, classes objects interfaces and so on so if this is too weird for you, you can just use the first option. So if you want to stick with array streams, you just say map to int or map to double or map to whatever that stream is. Okay, so, and again, this is not the primitive type. This is the boxed type, which can contain nodes in it. It won't in this case because we're just doing parsing operations, but again, it can. Okay, so let's start this and we're going, we're going to see two and four printed out on the console because they have been parsed into integers and then checked for being even and only they have remained. So two and four over here. Okay, so you can now use this code to read a line of integers from the console. How would you do that? Well, here's the string array. Well, how do you read a line of uh, integers from the console? Well, you read a string line. So you have a scanner, you say dot next dot next line and then split that into spaces. I won't be initializing the scanner now because that would waste a bit of time, but you get the idea. You just split this, you get the string list, like this one over here, and you just pass it on to the stream and then start converting the numbers. And you can filter them out too. Now, if you don't want to filter them out, well, of course, this line will not be there. Okay, so that's how you convert an array stream back into an array. Now, if you want to convert a normal stream back into a list, you use the dot collect method and you tell it how you want to collect it. And there are a few collectors which uh, are implemented for you. For example, you can say collectors collect collectors dot to list 
what, what does this do? Well, it produces a list. So same thing like you did for the arrays. For example, over here, when we, um, when we added this even box, if I wanted this to be a list of integers instead of an array of integers, I could have set dot collect, collect the, the job of collect, unless, uh, un, uh, unlike map and filter, which are intermediate operations, which just do operations on the data at some point when the data is requested, collect like minimum and like to array and maximum and average and so on are terminating methods, terminating stream operations, which put an end to the stream and extract the values from it. So collect will extract the values from the stream in some way. And one way you can use to extract the values from the stream is using the collectors, collectors dot to list. And that will tell the data to be converted into a list. And now you're get, going to get an, a list of integers instead of uh, just a collection, uh, instead of a stream of integers or instead of an array of integers. By the way, you can't assume what list you're getting over here. You're, you're getting some list, but what list is going to be, you can't know. So if you want to convert this into an array list for which you're certain that you can do add operations and remove operations and so on, you just pass all of this into the array list constructor. So from this point on, once you've wrapped this into an array list, this can add elements, remove elements and so on. Before that, you're not guaranteed that you can. It could fail if you do such operations. So this is how you convert it into a list. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I already saw, uh, I already told you how you can do filtering operations, so we're not going to be discussing those. You, the filtering operation just accepts a lambda, which determines whether the item should remain in the stream or not. And if it shouldn't, it just doesn't remain in the stream. So it's a pretty simple operation, but we're going to solve this task. We're reading a string array and we're printing only words which have an even length. So we, all, we want a resulting list for which the length is even. Okay, so Kiwi has four letters, uh, Orange has six letters, so it's included also. Banana has uh, how many? Six letters again, so it's included also. However, Apple is not included because this is three plus five, which is five let uh, three plus three plus two, which is five letters. So that's not an even number. So we're not going to get that into the resulting list, and we need to print that out on the console. Okay, how do we do that? Well, let's read. A line of strings and split it into the words it contains. So let's create a scanner. We're going to remove this list this, uh, array of numbers. So let's create a scanner and call it scanner and initialize it by telling it to read from, from system.in. Okay. And tell the scanner to read the next line. And that line we want split into an array of strings by spaces. Okay, so we got the array of strings into uh, by spaces. We're not going to be parsing it into an integer. We're just getting a stream from this array. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, we want this thing to only leave in the strings which have a length of two. So we're filtering not by numbers, we're filtering by words. And we want only the words for which what? For which the length percent two equals zero. So only the words with even length. Okay. And what are we going to convert this into? Well, since this is an array, let's convert it back into an array. So let, what are we going to get here? Let's say that these are the uh, words. Initialize it with this. Whoops, we got an object uh, array. Now, if we want to convert this into a non-object array, what do we want to provide in here? Well, if we want a string array of words, then we just copy this string array and then write column, column, new. And this would initialize a new string array. And if we want it into a list, we just say dot collect and say, we want to collect, we want you to collect it using the to list operation. And that will return a list of string words. So both are good enough in our, in our case, we don't really care what the data is going to be since we're just going to be printing it. So we're just going to say, for these words over here, iterate them. And for each of those words, system.out.print that word on the console. Okay, so that's how you get a list from another list or from another array and uh, filter out some of its data and print it on the console. Okay, so let's get some of this input and test that this 
uh, code actually works correctly. So pasting this in, we got kiwi, orange and banana, which are the expected output. Okay, so we got this uh, done. Now, what do we want to do from here on out? Well, let's see the other functions which we haven't yet seen. Now, this is the solution. One of the solutions would be to use the string new to array com uh, conversion. The other one, which I implemented, was to use the list conversion. Okay. Now, one other thing you can do with collections like this is to sort them. So you can say dot sorted on a collection of strings. So these words, let's say we want not just to print out the words with which are of even length. We want those words to be sorted in some way. What you can do is just say sorted. Now, what does sorted do? Well, it sorts based on the natural order of the object. So if I start this, we're going to get banana first and then, which is L-M-N, K-L-M-N. So banana, kiwi, and orange. That's what we're going to get printed out on the console. Uh, kiwi, banana, and orange, banana, kiwi, and orange. So sorted uses the natural sorting order. So sorted does, it's again an intermediate operation. It will not calculate anything until someone collects the data or finds the minimum or um, finds the maximum or converts it into an array and so on. It's an intermediate operation just like filter is. By the way, notice that first I'm filtering and then I'm sorting. Why? Well, because it's easier to sort less items. So it will take less time to sort uh, less items than, uh, than all of them. And sorting is a slower operation than filtering. So if I can remove some of the items with the faster operation, then I should do that and then only sort. Okay, so that's how I sort uh, with sorted. Now, this is the default sort, just like we get the default sort from collections.sort. So that's the, the, the default sorting operation. And you provide in, for example, words. Just like in the default sorting, just like in collections.sort, you can provide a comparator which says how sorting should be done. For example, let's say we want to sort the words not by their natural order, but by their reverse order. How would we do that? Well, we'd say comparator dot, if we wanted the natural order, well, that's what we supply and that's the default. And if we want the reverse order, well, we type in reverse order and now we'll get um, orange, kiwi and banana. Let's see that. Pasting in orange, kiwi, and banana printed out in the reverse order. So sorted accepts a comparator and you can compare by anything you like. For example, let's um, order them first by their, um, okay, let's just order them by their length and see what happens. How did we say we, we could uh, do a comparison by a certain criteria where we can use comparator.comparing meaning we can tell sorted by what to compare. So for each word compared by that word's length, right? So now if I start this, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have the shortest words first. So pasting this, I'm getting kiwi and then orange and then banana because kiwi is the shortest. Now orange and banana have the same length. What if I want to um, compare different, uh, so if the lengths are, equal, how can I then compare by something else? So let's say if uh, the lengths are equal, I want to compare by alphabetical order only then. So I want kiwi and then, o and then banana and then orange because banana and orange are of the same length, but banana has uh, leads lexicographically. Well, now I wouldn't uh, be able to use these uh, fun comparators. I need to write my own comparator. So how did I write the comparator? Well, well, I said A and B are the items you're comparing and compare them in the following way. Now I'm going to need a, a, a bit more space to compare them. So what I do is see if these two are equal because if they're equal, if their lengths are equal, so let's get their lengths int a length equals a dot length and int b length equals b dot length. Okay, so if their lengths are equal, I need to compare the, I need to compare them lexicographically. So if a, if a length equals b length, and actually, now that I think of it, I don't really need these variables, right? So if a length equals b length, then compare those. Now, I can't say a length dot compare to b dot length. And the reason I can't is that length is the primitive integer. So 
for primitive integers, what you use is integer integer dot compare because primitive integers aren't objects and they don't have the dot operator, so you need to use this one a dot length b dot length. Okay, and I return this. I return this comparison if they're uh, sorry, if, if not if they're equal, if they're different. So I only need to compare them if they're different. That's what I'm checking. If they're different, let's compare them. And if they're not different, if they're equal, so in this case, in the else, they're equal, then what do, I, what do I need to return? Well, I need to return whether A is before B lexicographically. So I need to A dot compare to B. So if, I'm, if I have different lengths, I compare the lengths. If I have equal lengths, I compare the words themselves. Okay, so now if I start this, this is comparison by multiple criteria. So you sort the item A and the item B and you say, okay, so if the item A's length is equal to, is different than B's length, then compare A's length to B's length. And you remember that compare just does a subtraction and sort uses that subtraction to decide whether to switch around their places or not. Otherwise, if their lengths are equal, well then, compare them in a different way. Compare A as a string with B as a string. And this comparison operates on a different uh, uh, on a different logic. So it uses the lexico lexicographical ordering of the characters, but it's pretty much the same as integer.compare only done on each character at one at a time on the two strings. Okay, so pasting it in this data. Now I have kiwi first because it has the least amount of characters then i have banana because it has equal characters as orange but it is uh, sooner lexicographically so i've fallen into i've seen that their lengths are equal and i've gone into this comparison meaning compare them by their uh by their values mean compare compare them lexicographically okay so that's what I did there. And that's what sorting actually does. It allows you, so if you say dot sorted, that sorts the results of the stream in some way, which if you don't provide the parameter is the natural order. And I showed you a few ways in which you can provide different parameters. And now here we have another uh, example of this. We have products, which is a map of integer and strings. So the price of the product and the name of the product. Uh, this example would have been better served with a list of a class named product, actually, which has an integer and a string. But this is a different way to implement that, so it's uh, it's still worth uh, checking out. So what they're doing here is we have an integer and a string for each product, and those are so element one and element two have each a key and a value, and the key is the price, and the string is the name. And what do we do? Well, we compare the name. And if the names are equal, then we compare the values. So uh, if their names, if their strings are equal, then we compare the prices of those uh, products. Okay. So now here we have a for each, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, what is the for each? Now, up to this point, we've used, uh, once we've created a result, we've collected it into a string, or we've collected it into uh, an array, or we've collected it into a minimum or maximum. Now, since this isn't always what we want, because imagine you have a huge amount of data, like, like say um, 10,000 elements, creating a list for those 10,000 elements, then placing those elements in the list and then iterating them takes a lot of time. Now, if I just want to do something with those elements, if I don't want to store them for future use, if I just want to do some operations on them, for example, print them on the console, because that's going to be a common enough occurrence, I don't really need to collect them into a list. What I can do is do another terminating operation, which is called for each. Okay, so what does for each do? Well, for each does this for each loop, which I'm doing over here. So. We're saying, just like here, we're saying system.out.println the word. Here, in for each, we get a word or whatever that data item is over here. And we print it out on the console. And now we're not going to be assigning it to a list since it's just an operation on these items. And now we don't need the for each loop. So what did we do? We just replaced the for each loop and the conversion into a list. We, we saved some operations because when you do the for each over here, it iterates each item, so it does your for each loop for you, and it leaves you to write this part of the code, the body of the for each loop, inside the lambda. Okay, 
So that's better. Why is it better? Well, because if you collect it to a list, that's one operation of copying everything into a list. And then you have another operation of iterating the list and printing out each word. Here, if you just do the for each, it just operates on each of the words separately. And you don't need to allocate all of the memory to copy this stream into that, uh, into that memory. Furthermore, this stream could not even have a, uh, a finite end because it's completely possible for this stream to be something that's being read from, let's say, uh, the internet. So you're having a network and you're receiving bytes of information. Let's say you're playing a game and you're receiving information on the state of the game at each moment. So you're getting that as a stream from the web and you need for each part of that information to update the game state. Now, you wouldn't be trying to download all of the information from the web to get the game state, right? Because that's not going to work. Instead, you can just for each the results once once you've done whatever operations you need to for you to, you need to do on those results and then for each each item in the result when it arrives and do the operation on it so for each game state update you update your own game state locally so so that's one pretty theoretic theoretical usage but you get the idea for each does not require you to allocate a huge list or array in which to save all of that data you, on each operation you do just you access just one of the elements. So this allows you to access element by element only a single element from the data instead of having to copy all of it and then uh, iterate all of that. Okay, so that's what for each does. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as a normal for each loop. So in this case, we're just using it to print out the words on the console. It's going to give us the exact same result. So kiwi, orange, banana, and apple, when we put it in, we're just going to get the results printed out. Now you do the for each one, you you only care about one item at a time. If for some reason you need to compare items inside the list or search for the two uh, closest items in the list by value, well then yes, of course you're going to be collecting, collecting that into a list. So if you need a list for something later on, of course you collect that into a list. But if you don't need a list and you just need to print out a result or calculate the sum or something, uh, then you just for each it with this for each terminator of the stream. Okay, so here's an example of uh, all of this in some sort of a weird way. We get, we're get we getting a stream from the entry set of a map and then we're sorting it and then we're doing operations on that sorted uh, array. and that's the product sorting by the way we saw that a few slides ago and then we're doing the for each on each of the items and printing its results so this is the same as a for each on a normal map however it's done through uh, the uh, the lambdas and the stream api in java 8 instead of just with a for each loop which is iterating the entry set of the map now should you do this always instead of a normal for each loop no the only reason you're going to be using these streams, and I repeat myself, but I'll say it again because it's important, you use these streams when you have some simple um, one-liner that you want to write, which is easy to read. Now, this is sort of on the border of whether this is acceptable as, as a um, stream pipeline of operations, because this is a complex sorting operation and this should be a separate method extracted out somewhere. And if that method is uh, extracted out somewhere, then yes, maybe in that case, you could uh, argue that you uh, can use this as a stream pipeline. So if I extract this into a method and say, compare by length then by value so value in the case of the string value then lexicographically compare by length then lexicographically okay so now if i replace this with an expression now this is a clean way to do a stream api pipeline so we get input from the console, we filter out all words that are uh, of uh, non-even size, then we sort it by length and then lexicographically. So this is readable text now. And then for each word I print it on the console. Well, that's much better code than what I had previously. So you, you should try to have your lambdas just a si in, in a single expression. If you can't write a single expression, either don't use lambdas, or meaning uh, write a for loop, or 
extract methods so that your code is readable. So this is pretty readable. It's, it's a bit more readable than uh, using for each loops uh, one after the other because this an answers the question of what happens and now not, not how it happens because when you're coding a for loop you're you're writing how something should happen not what should happen and here we're saying what should happen it's sh there should be a filtering then there should be a sorting by length and then lexicographically and then there should be a printing on the console for each item this is easy to read however the previous code before i extracted the method was not really easy to read so you should when you should only use streams when you can make your code easier to read and make it uh, reflect what its purpose is more clearly. If you're just trying to be fancy with using streams, don't. It, there are a lot of things you will be uh, fancy with once you uh, learn to code a lot more. So this is not really not the place where you should be just trying to impress your colleagues with one-liners. Only do this when you're certain that this is e more easily readable than just having a for each loop. Okay, so that's the functional for each. And we have one more task over uh, ahead of us. We have three numbers and we should print the largest three. And if there are less than three, well, print all of them. Okay, let's, so how can we do that? Well, there is one more method we need to learn, which is pretty important when we're using streams. Let's first read our numbers. So the first part is going to be the same, right? So we're reading a single line from the console, splitting it by spaces. Then what are we going to be doing with that? Well, I want to convert this into integers. And since it's easier to work with uh, the integer arrays because they have a bit more functionality, let's convert it into those. So how do I create an integer stream from this? Well, I say map to int because I want an, a primitive integer stream. So for each word, I want to get what? I want to get an integer. How do I get that? Well, I say integer int of that word. And that's going to give me, up to this point, I'm getting um, a list of um, uh, a stream of primitive integers. So that's pretty much like an array of primitive integers. So we've parsed our numbers up to this point. And now what do we do? Well, we want the largest tree. And then we need to print all of them. And notice that the largest tree are sorted in reverse order. So we want the largest tree, so the maximum, the next maximum, and the next maximum, and we want those in reverse order. Now we have a few ways to do that, but we'll do the simple um, implementation first. So uh, we're going to print, we're going to get these numbers which we just got over here, and we're going to sort them. But we're not going to sort them normally. We're going to sort them with how? We want them, we want the largest tree, and notice that they're ordered again in reverse order. So. We want all of them sorted in reverse order. We want collections dot sort, uh, not that. Collect um, comparator. How do we want to compare them? Well, we want to be comparing them with the comparator, which uses the reverse order. So we want them in reverse. Now, what doesn't uh, dislike about this? Uh, yeah. So what it doesn't like is this is the reverse order. But reverse order works for comparator and t. Now remember when you have this type of brackets, like for list of t uh, or map of k and k and v and so on, uh, these uh, these operations work on the uh, on the object streams. So the comparator dot reverse order works on the object stream. So and now I here here I have an integer stream, a primitive integer stream. So instead of converting it to a primitive integer stream, I'll just convert it into a normal stream. So I start with an array stream, then I convert it, I map it into an object stream. Each of these objects is an integer parsed from the console. And then I sort them with comparator dot reverse order. Now, of course, I could have remained with the array stream, with the int stream, but that would have required me to implement my reverse order manually, which would, would have looked like so. A and B go into um, integer dot compare B then A, right? So because reverse order just means comparing them in reverse. And then in that case, I could have used map to int and that would have been just as well. Okay. However, I'm not going to be using that now. I'm going to be using comparator.reverse order over a normal stream, over a normally mapped stream, over an object stream. So reverse order, natural order, and so on are usable on uh, on uh, on object streams, whereas 
uh, primitive streams, which are mapped to int, can't use reverse order directly. You need to implement it yourself. Okay, so we've sorted it, and we need to print out all the items, but not not all of them. Just the last, uh, just the three of the three of them, which are the topmost items. So for each number, I'd call it over here. I need to print out that number. Okay, but how do I limit that to just the first three items? Well, there's a limit function, imagine that. Limit just says only take the top three results, the first three results. So let's see what this is going to do. It's going to read a line from the console, split it into space it, map, map each of the words on that line into an integer, meaning convert it into an integer, then sort it in reverse order, whatever it got from over here, then only get the first three items, and then iterate those first three items. Okay, let's see if that works. So let's get this input over here and paste it down below and we got 50, 30, 20. Now in the task we want them on the same line so I'll leave that to you. Guess how we can do that on the same line? Well print line and add a space at the, at the end. Yeah, I just said leave that to you and I did it instead of you but it's a pretty simple task so it's not a big loss that I implemented it instead of you. Okay, so what does limit do? It gives you the first three results. It limits the results to only the, the first three, so you don't have to for each everything. Okay, so that's uh, basically all, in, all, all the basic operations on streams covered. We did a lot of stuff. Uh, again, it might have looked a bit magical. There's another solution here done with a different way. So we're sorting them, then we're collecting them into a list, and then that list we're uh, iterating only the first three elements. Now this is suboptimal because this will copy the entire list and then we'll iterate only the first three items that it's not ideal. Uh, that's why I prefer the limit operation, which will limit it before copying, before doing the for each operations. Now you could also, you could also actually do limit tree and then collect it as a list. Then say, uh, collect this uh, with collectors dot to list. And that will give you a list, right? So this is a list um, top three. So this is the top three list. How do I know that there are three elements? Well, because I limited it to three elements before I converted it into a list. And now I can uh, calmly run a for each loop on these top three and print them all. If there are less than three, we're just going to get the, the less uh, amount of items. So limit takes the top three or however many there are. If there aren't three, it, if there are only two, it's going to get the, the only the two of them. Okay, so we saw a lot of stuff. Some of these things might have seemed magical, but it's just a matter of getting used to the syntax. Again, don't overuse the streams, please. If you're not confident when writing a stream, just use a for each loop. It's perfectly fine, and sometimes it's a bit faster even. Uh, when you get to processing large amounts of data, yes, then you'd need to um, use the, uh, when then you would really need to use uh, streams, but for small amounts of data for these uh, lessons which we're uh, studying now, you don't really need those streams that much, but if you can use them in such a way that your code is easily readable and understandable, then sure, go for it. And we talked about maps, and we've talked about how these maps can hold keys and values inside them, and the, those keys are unique and that you can overwrite them if you uh, try to write to the same key again, and that they're a good way to index something by some of its fields, any of those fields. So if you have an integer array, you can only index by integers. However, for maps, you can index by anything you want, and then you can quickly search for anything you want by that index. And we showed you the streams API. And again, please don't overuse it. Uh, I'm happy to have de delivered this lesson to you. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the uh, channels which we have provided for you. And well, until, until next time, see ya. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain the concepts of objects and classes and will give you real world examples with wife Java coding. In programming, objects hold a set of data fields. For example, uh, the Peter's birthday object could hold a date 27 plus a month 11, which is November, plus a year 1996. In Java, developers can define classes to describe a particular structure of an 
object. For example, a datetime class could contain a day, plus a month, plus a year, all of which are integers. Classes in Java typically hold fields to keep objects data, plus constructors to create and initialize objects, and methods to implement functionality related to the object's data. Let's learn how to use objects and simple classes in Java through live coding examples and later to solve some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Let's start! Hello everyone, this is George, I'm a technical trainer and today we will be talking about objects and classes. We'll see how to use them, what they are, why do they exist, how do they help us in implementing our programs, how the industry, industry uses them, and so on and so forth. So, what is our table of contents for today? What should we cover? What are our topics? Well, we'll start by talking about what objects are, and we'll see that we have actually used some of those already, but now we will see them more explicitly as uh, a concept in programming and see how that fits in with everything else we've seen up to this point. Then we'll talk about classes, which are basically the data types of objects, just how an integer variable has integer as its data type. In the same way, a string object has string as its class. It's basically the same concept. However, classes can be created by you as a programmer. We'll talk about the built-in classes that you can use in Java and in pretty much all other programming languages that follow the object-oriented programming model. And then we'll talk about how we can create our own classes by defining their fields. We'll talk about how we can create constructors which initialize our objects. And we'll see a few tasks involving using methods on these classes and implementing our own methods. And we'll play around in general with the concept of object-oriented programming. Although this will be just a uh, first step, a venture into the world of object-oriented programming, it won't uh, cover everything. We're just getting started, so bear with us. We, we will have lessons in the future which will cover the more advanced topics of objects, classes, inheritance, polymorphism, and so on and so forth, all those interesting object-oriented pro programming uh, concepts. But for now, we're just talking about how we can create them, how we can use them, and seeing a quick and dirty demonstration of what they look like. So, objects and classes. Now, before we actually start with the material itself, let's see what we can do with what we already know. So, suppose we have uh, a task in which we need to input information for, let's say, a student or, or a lecturer, maybe, uh, or a car, um, or whatever else we want to. Okay, let's, let's uh, settle upon something. Let's use the very classical and very unoriginal example of a student. Okay, so what does a student have? Well, they usually have a name, they sometimes have a student number, and they have, let's say, an average grade. So some information which we can input for our student, save it, and print it out. So let, let our task be read uh, information about the student from the console, and then print it back on the console in a certain format. So let's say we have the information like so. We have the student's name. Let's work with single names only for now. So let's say the student name is um, George. And then we will have the student's ID, like the ID in the, in the university. For example, 123123. Three. Let's say our IDs are always six digit. So we have at the most nine 100,900, you get it, 999 followed by 999 as a number of a student. Okay, so that's our top number, and this is one of the numbers in the, um, uh, in the student uh, log or database. Okay, so what else do we have? We have the average grade of the student. So let's uh, figure out some system in, in which we will be grading the student. Let's say that the minimum value for a grade is 2, and the maximum value for a grade is 6. So if you get a 2, you fail, and if you get a 6, you pass. That's pretty much like in the um, American system, the A is a 6 in our system, and the, the F is a 2 in our system. Okay, so 
let's say that uh, George, your lecturer, has um, the score of 3.0, which should give you a lot of hope about this lecture. And that's what we're going to be reading for our student. Okay, so what do we need to read that? Well, we already can create, inf uh, can create uh, memory in the computer which represents this data, this input. How do we do that? Well, we need a string for the name, and we'll call it name, since that's the student's name. Then we'll have this identifier, the student identifier, or student number, or whatever you want to call it. I'll call it an identifier because it uniquely identifies one of our students. So let's say this is, uh, what is the data type of this thing? Well, it's a six digit integer. So we'd, we'd be okay with using int for it. I was thinking about short, but short won't cover all the possible values because short reaches up to uh, 65,536 values. And we have a lot more than that in these uh, numbers here. So let's go with integer. And usually you would, you would go with integer. In most cases, integer is the preferred data type, even if it uh, covers more than you actually need. Okay, so an integer ID. And what else do we need? We have the average grade for the student, i.e. the sum of all his uh, grades divided by the number of those grades. So that will be a double and we'll call it grade or average grade. Okay, let's go with average grade, a bit more descriptive. Okay, so how do we read those things from the console? Well, let's create a scanner. We've done this a hundred times already. That's reading from system.in and I'll save it in a new scanner over here. By the way, you might have noticed that I'm keeping the parse numbers method from the pre previous lesson. Why am I keeping it? Because if, I, if we need it in this lesson, I don't want to write it again. And since it's separated in a separate method, it doesn't really interfere with the code we have in main. Okay, so we have a scanner. So let's read scanner dot next line for reading the name or maybe next string will be enough. But let's say we have all of these on separate lines. So, so reading is easier. Okay, so we're reading a line for the name and we'll, we'll say that the name gets initialized by this line, which we just read, oops, which we just read from the console. And then we'll have the ID read from the scanner again. We can use next int for this input. And then we do the average grade. Okay, so average grade is scanner.next double. Okay, so that's what we have. And let's say we want to print this. Okay, so how do we print it? Let's say the format should be the student name followed by a bracketed ID. So one, two, three, one, two, three. And then the grade or uh, let's say dash the grade. Let's say this is our format. Okay, so how, do, so how do we do this? How do we print this information? Well, we'll use a system.out.printf, print a formatted string, and the formatted string will be what? Well, let's copy this string which I just entered, and we'll now replace it with the information which we need to add. So let's provide the parameters. Let's say this is the name parameter. This is the ID parameter and this is the average grade parameter and we want these listed over here instead of the string I just entered. So the first parameter is a string, the second parameter is an integer, which means digits, and the third parameter is a floating point number. Okay, so let's print that to percent %f and let's see what happens. Of course we will need to input this data which we just entered. We'll wait a bit. Okay, so up to this point, nothing really out of the order ordinary. Let's input our student name George, it, his ID of 123123, and his grade of 3.0. Okay, so what did we get printed? George, 123123, 3.000, and so on. Why did we get so many digits over here? Because we didn't spec specify how many digits we wanted printed on the output over here when we specified the floating point output. Okay, so Java just prints whatever it uh, can for our uh, floating point number. Okay, we don't care about that that much. The point of uh, doing this 
example here is to illustrate that when you're writing software, the typical case is that you're handling data and, for example, reading that data, printing it out, uh, sorting it or modifying it in some way or doing calculations based on it and so on. And in most cases, that data will be a combination of strings, numbers, floating point numbers, sometimes bytes which you need to parse into something else and so on. So the typical case for a program is actually that it represents objects from the real world. In this case, this over here is the object we're, which we're representing. We're representing it through a few fields, three in this case, and these fields always go together. So we have a name that always goes with the ID, which always goes with the average grade. But in our code over here, we have them separated. So we have three variables, which we need to know that we need to use together, even though which we're always going to be using them together when we're describing a student. And at some point we might uh, decide we can add more fields to that student and so on. So this presents a limitation on what we can do up to this point with our code. So we can do, we can code any program which we want. We can make the computer do anything that is computable with the knowledge up to a race. So once you know about the race and once you know about loops and conditionals and so on, you can do anything. But that doesn't mean it's easy and it usually isn't done with just a race. So let's since we've touched upon the subject of arrays, let's talk about how we can uh, input more than one student. So we want to keep the information of not just George over here, we want to store the information of another student, say Peter, for example. So here's Peter, here's his uh, ID, and let's say Peter is a good student and, and has the grade of 6.0 from all, all his courses. Okay, so how do we store Peter now? Well, we have one option, which is to just create three more variables and store the information for Peter in them. But that wouldn't be ideal because we'd be doing the same thing we're doing for jerks, hence when we're, we'd be repeating code. Okay, so with the knowledge we have right now, how can we handle this situation? And for example, let's say that um, we're, we're going to have another input which says how many students we need to read. So in this case, two students, which are George and Peter. So how do we handle this, this case? And if this number two here can change, if, if it can be larger, a lot larger, for example, 100, 1,000, 100,000, what would we do? Well, we obviously need an array. But how would we store the data in that array since here we have three variables and all, all of them have different data types? We can't push them all into the same array or the same list because if we push them into the same array or the same list, well, they would have to be of the same data type and they aren't. They are different data types which go together. So one solution in this case, in this case, if we don't have the knowledge which we're going to acquire in this lesson, is to create a few so-called parallel arrays or parallel lists, doesn't really matter if they're arrays or lists in this case. Let's use lists since we've uh, talked about them in the last lesson. So we'd, we'd create, instead of three variables, three lists. So a list of integers, a list of strings, and a list of doubles. Okay, so how do we uh, proceed from here on out? Well, we create a new list for each of these, and then we keep these lists parallel. And what do I mean by parallel? Well, I mean that we want the the list name, and it won't be name, it will, it will be names and IDs and average grades, since there are more, multiple of these. Okay, so instead of just uh, adding a single name, a single ID, and a single grade in, a sing, in each of those being a single variable, we'll create a list of names, and then we'll create a list of IDs, and then we'll create a list of grades, and we'll keep the uh, values for a single student on the same index in each of those lists. So we'll get names zero to be uh, the name of the first student and ID zero to be the ID of the first student and average grades to be the grade of the first student again. So we have the same thing in, uh, so we have the same index in those three lists 
representing a single object. Now, this obviously isn't very ideal, but it's one way to handle the situation which we got, we've gotten ourselves into. So let's read the number of students we need to read. So this is two in, the, in our example, scanner.nextInt. And since each of these is going to be a separate line, let's just read them as lines and parse them into whatever we need. So I'd say next line, and I do integer dot parse of that next line. And that will be our number of students. So number of students or students number. OK, so number of students. And what will we be doing with this number of students? Well, we will have to repeat our input. We will have to repeat these lines as many times as there are students. So we'd have to do a for loop, which starts from i equals 0 and continues to number of students. And then we do this code. And we'll create a variable for each of these like we did before. So we read the, the name. Let's create it over here. And then we read the ID. And I do it with uh, scanner.next line and then parse this into an integer. OK. And I do the same thing for the average grade, double dot parse double from the next double from the next line on the input. Again, we're uh, saying that each of these inputs will be on a separate line. And I again do this in the loop. OK, so what do we have from here on out? Well, we have three variables, the name, the ID, and the average grade. And now we put them parallelly in the three lists. So I'd say names, names dot add the name. And then I'd say IDs dot add the ID. And then I'd say average grades dot add the average grade. OK, so we now have the input of our data. So we're reading from the console a multitude of, in, of uh, data types, placing them in different lists, but placing them at the same index in those different lists. Since we're adding on, on each of these lists parallelly, i.e. we're adding on each iteration into each of the lists, we're going to have the same lists having the same L meaning having the same index in those lists describing a single object. OK, so what do I mean by, by, by that? I mean that now we can start a for loop, which goes from index 0 to the number of students, or to names.size, or to ids.size, or to grades.size. Each of these would work because we're keeping them parallel. OK, and now I can print the information for my student for each of these students. So we're iterating each of the students, each of the indices in our three lists, and printing the information from each of the lists. So I'd say names give me the index i, and then I'd say ids give me the index i, and then average grades give me the index i. So we're printing the same index from each of those lists, and we're representing an object with that, and that object is a student. So let's uh, say this is our input. Let's copy this input over here. OK, and we can copy like this, by the way. You hold down, hold down Alt, and then you slide the cursor to wherever you want to copy. But I'll remove this empty line and this empty line so we can copy without empty lines. OK, so let's put in this data. Let's press Enter. And now we would see George printed and then Peter printed. Now I forgot to add a new line between them. So I'd say add a new line into this format at the end. So I can print the each of the students on a separate line. OK, so what did I do there? I just entered some data for, mul for multiple objects from the real world, and I got it printed on the console. So we can do this. We can represent information about the real world through a series of lists, and each of those lists matches its ID which, with each of the other lists in such a way that the index i 
of all these lists represents the object i, object at that position, object in that sequence, in that order. Okay, so this is one way we can represent information about the real world, but it obviously has a lot of uh, non-optimal uh, pieces put into it. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let's say we want to add another item here. Uh, for example, the student would have an address. So in order to add, to add an address to each of our students, well, we need to have a list of strings, which is our addresses. And now, in each of the places which we uh, created our parallel lists or arrays, we need to add information into addresses too. And the problem with this is that we could forget something. Like, for example, we could add it over here, but then we, we could forget to print it over here. Or in another situation, if we want to remove an item, for example, we have uh, an operation which deletes a student, well, what would we do then? We'd have to remove that student's data from each, each of the lists. So that creates a lot of opportunities for uh, making an error in coding the, uh, the logic of our program. And that's not optimal. When you're creating opportunities for errors, you're you're increasing the time you're going to be developing your program because you're going to encounter more errors. Okay, so how do we handle this? Well, instead of creating parallel lists, what Java and other programming languages which support the object-oriented programming model uh, provide us is objects. So instead of, instead of having our data, data scattered out through different lists, we will have an, a custom data type which represents a student. And that data type will have a name, it will have an ID, and it will have an average grade. And then we need just one list of that data type. Now, how do we do that? We'll see in this lesson. So, but, but after all, we saw how we can do it without objects. And we saw what the advantages and disadvantages are. The advantages, we don't, know, don't need to know about objects. The disadvantage is pretty much everything else. You don't want to be writing code like this. Well, in some cases you do, but it's pretty rare that you wouldn't create a special object when you're creating parallel lists. There are situations, but there aren't many of them. Okay, so what are we doing here? We're, go we're going to talk about objects and classes. So an object is pretty much a set of named values. So just like we had here an ID, a name, and an average grade, well, an object is just that. It's a set of such variables which represent something from the real world. For example, if you have a birthday object, that would probably represent a day, a month, and a year of that birthday. Okay, so what would that birthday object look like? Let's say it's called birthday, and its day would be 27, and its month would be 11, and its year would be 1996 for someone born in 1996. Okay, so now we have a data type which represents information about a date. And that data type has several fields inside it which represent information about that date. And all of these travel together. So an object is a bunch of variables that are traveling together that can be treated as one thing even though there are several different uh, variables in the program. Okay, so how would we create that? Well. One way to do that with the existing classes of, uh, of Java, of the Java Development Toolkit, is to use the local date class, which just rep represents a simple date with a year, a month, and a day. And we can create that and print that on the console. And this now is an object which has several fields which are traveling together, traveling as one. Okay, let's do that. Let's hide our code which we uh, had up until this point. We're going to be using it later, so I'll save it somewhere. I'll open a notepad, for example, and place it in there. Okay, so what are we doing? We're creating an existing, uh, an object of an existing so-called class. We'll learn what a class is. We'll do a local date, the date, or let's call it the birthday, since that's what we had in the example over here and we'll create the birthday which we decide to. Okay, let's input my birthday. So my birthday is local date 
local date dot of and I'll input my year 1992 and I'll input my month which is February and I'll input the day of that month which is the first okay so the first of February 1992 okay so that's my birthday and now I can use this birthday as a bunch of variables which are traveling together so I could say give me the year of this birthday so this birthday has a year I just initialized it with and I can get access to that year now I can print this if I want System dot out dot print. let's say print a separate line with that year and if I start this program what I'll see on the console is the year 1992 so I have several fields several variables which are traveling together as part of this birthday object now what I'm calling here is a method like just like the methods we've been creating up until this point only it is a method which is attached to a particular object so the get year for birthday will return the year for birthday of course and if I have another variable for example other birthday and I say other birthday dot get year that will return the value for that other birthday so if I have uh, if I rename this to uh, my birthday and I create another variable which is someone else's birthday someone else's else's birthday and set that to the 2nd of February 1993 someone is bound to have been born there so I'm pretty sure this is a correct initialization of someone else's birthday and if I print this if I print someone else's birthday dot get here I'll get that other birthday printed on the console so this is another pair uh, another sequence of another set of variables which are traveling together which I can access through a common object so this object binds all of these variables together the year the month and the day and for uh, convenience we can just print the birthday entirely and Java will automatically print out the information for that birthday without me having to address each of those variables now how does it do it well the my birthday uh, the, the local date class actually has information inside it which describes how it should be printed on the console but we'll see that later on okay so this is an object the same way by the way that a string is an object so this string we just created this variable of type string is called an object and this its data type is called a class now classes are the same thing as data types like integer double float and so on but we can create our custom classes and we can't create our custom data types and so uh, a class is a subset of a data type so it, it acts like the data type but it actually represent represents several uh, variables of some data type which are bound together in a single object so string is actually a class and this variable which we created the string s containing the text hello is an object of the type string an object of the class string an instance of the class string those are several ways of describing an object all of them are valid and we will be using them with uh, within our uh, lectures from now on okay so this is the string s which is initialized which with the string hello and this is an object and this is its class just like my birthday is an object and local date is its class okay so what do these classes and objects allow us to do well we now can do an example similar to, to the one we had previously where we have multiple students but this time we'll have multiple local dates how would we do that well we'd use a list with these local dates in it and I'd create this list and I'd call it birthdays for example birthdays and initialize it with a new array list okay so what can I do from here on out well I can use these birthdays and I can read them from the console and notice that I only have one list I don't have a separate list for each year each month and each day in these birthdays I have a single list and it contains a data type which bunches together all of these fields or, or all of these variables 
by the way, I'm using the word fields intentionally. We'll be talking about these in a moment, but basically fields are the variables inside an object. So each object in this case has a year, a month and a day. And all of these are so-called fields inside the object. So variables inside an object are called fields. Okay, so let's read these birthdays from the console. Let's say that, like in the previous example, we'll have an integer which represents how many birthdays there are going to be. So let's say uh, create a new scanner and tell that scanner to read from system.in and name it scanner and use the scanner to read a line which contains the integer representing how many birthdays there are going to be. So I'd say this is int birthdays count. And I'll initialize that with the next line. Of course, I can't initialize it directly because the result of this is a string, not an integer. So I need to convert it into an integer by parsing it. By the way, want to guess what scanner is? Well, scanner is a class and the scanner object which we're trying to use to read from the console, well, that's an object like I just said. So this again is an object. And by the way, guess what? The list is also a class and the birthdays variable I create with that data type of list is an object. Okay, and the array list is also a class. Okay, so this birthdays object will contain local date objects which are read to the scanner object from the console okay so i'm reading the birthdays count and now i just need the for loop starting from zero continuing until it reaches birthdays count okay and what will we be doing now with them well let's read the year the day the month and the day so i'd say int year and i'd say scanner dot read me the next line the next line and parse it into an integer. So use the string that's the result of this next line operation and convert it into a number by some algorithm. Okay, so this is the year and this is the month and this is the day. Okay, and what, would, what do we do with these? We add them into the birthdays list. So I'd say birthdays.add, but what do I need to add here? Well, I need to add a local date. So I'd say local date dot of create me a, use the of method inside the local date class to create an object of type local date. So I'd say year here, month and day. Okay, so we initialized an object and we can actually create that object as a variable. So here's the date, the birth day I almost typed it correctly the birthday and that then add that birthday into the list of birthdays now notice that again we're reading three things just like we had in the students example but now these three things are part of a single object and we only need to add them into a single list we don't need to have a list for years a list for months and a list for days okay so now I can print these objects so I can iterate them with a normal uh, for each loop. So I'd say birthdays, alt and enter, iterate. And that will allow IntelliJ to auto create our for each loop. Okay, so this is our birthday in birthdays. For each of these birthdays, do the following. System.out.print, let's say print f, print a formatted string. And that formatted string will be um, the year followed by uh, the day with the space and no followed by the month with the space and then by the day with the space we can play around with this format if we want but it isn't really important in our case okay so the the year will be an integer and then the month will be an integer and then the day will also be an integer so this is a pretty simple example of an object now how do we get each of these values well we say birthday and after birthday we place a dot and the dot on each object allows us to access its so-called public members the things which are available for access from the outside from outside of birthday what is available for access from outside of birthday well the year what else what else is available well the, the month get month 
And what else is available? Well, birthday.get day. Now we can have several options of getting the day. We can get it as a day of the month, like we're probably going to need now, but we can also get it as a day of the week and a day of the year. Now, this is the reason why we have these get something methods over here, because they allow us to have different representation of the data inside the birthday, even though it is just a field, but that field can be interpreted in different ways and that allows us to print different data for that field. Okay, so if we say get day of month, we'll get what we actually want printed. We want the day as it was entered. Okay, so let's see if that works. Now we need an integer, which is the number of dates we're going to be uh, putting in. Let's say again, they will be two. Let's zoom that console. Let's say two dates. The first date will be, um, for example, 2022 or 2024. That's when NASA is supposed to be going to the moon again, or at least so they say. Okay, let's say that that would be in April and that would be April the 1st. So it's more interesting that way. So this is our first date entered and let's use another date, for example, um, 1992, the February the 1st. So 1992, February the 1st. Okay, we read that and something failed. What failed? Okay, so we tried to print something which isn't really a digit. So this is what the format uh, exception tells us. It tells us we got, we, we wanted to print a digit, but instead we got a month. A month isn't a primitive data type like uh, integer or uh, double or char and so on or float. It's actually another object. So this get month thing over here doesn't return a number like get year does, it returns a month. So if we want to get the number of this month, we can say, okay, let's see what we, we have actually over here. We have a get value. Okay, let's see what that get value prints. It returns an int integer so we can play around with it. Starting the program over here, let's enter our input again. So 2024, the April the 1st, and 1992, uh, February the 1st. Okay, what did we get printed? So 2024, April the 1st, again, I forgot to print my new line, so let's add that. And I'll copy my input, by the way, so I don't have to enter it each time. Okay, so a new line over here, and let's start this again. Waiting a bit for the code to start. Okay, here's our input. Pressing enter again. Here are our two dates. Okay, so with a bit of a snag over here where we had to get the value of this month. By the way, what is this month? Well, it's a so-called enumeration. Let's see it. Control B navigates me to the definition of get month, i.e. the description of how get month works. And that returns a month. What is a month? A month is an enumeration. An enumeration is just a series of fixed values which can be represented in an object. Okay, so printing get value after that just returns the number of that month in the year. Okay, so that's about it for creating a local date object. And again, you use it just like you would a normal variable, but if you want to access its inside data, you use the dot operator, which we used over, where did we use it? Over here, and access whatever the birthday date can provide you. Okay, so continuing on. Now, uh, we already saw what an object was. An object is just a bunch of values that are traveling together. Now, a class is what describes what these objects are look like, meaning what values are traveling together. So when you create an object, you're just creating those values that are traveling together. But if you want to describe what those values are going to be, meaning what their names are going to be, what their data types are going to be, and so on, and then create objects of that, well, you need to create a class. So the class is basically the data type of the object. So somewhere 
in the Java libraries, local date is described uh, what in it we have code which describes what fields it contains. It describes this year, this month, and this day field. So if we press control B on this local date, we'll see that this is a so-called class and it has a bunch of information inside it. And somewhere, somewhere over here, we can see an integer year, a short month and a short day. So these represent, as the comments over here say, the year's year, its number in our calendar, its month and its day. Those are three so-called fields inside the local date where did we get get to the local date class so local date is the class and birthday is the object so local date describes what our birthday has inside it so it's what we'd call here the template for the object although i'd avoid the the use of the word template because template means something very specific in programming so to avoid confusion maybe don't use template just Think of a class as a description of what is contained inside each object of that class. It's like a blueprint. Classes are like blueprints for each object. Like when you're building a building or building a machine of some type, you have blueprints. And, each, and th those blueprints say, for example, for a car, how, how many wheels it has, what type of engine it has, and so on and so forth. Well, a class is just that blueprint for each object. Just like you use a blueprint to create multiple cars, which look the same and act the same, you use a class to create multiple objects, which look the same and act the same. Okay, and we'll see how we can create those classes, but for now what we need to know is each class has fields, which is the data of the object, the so-called state of the object the information it stores and the values in that information. So the class defines the fields, the variables, basically the integer day, integer month and integer year, like we had for local date. We have, we could have data uh, and operations on that data, like for example, getting the day, setting the month and so on. And we have actions which change the object in some way. Now, setting the month would also change the object because, because it would change this field over here. But we could have other operations, for example, remove a date from this date, calculate the difference between two dates, and so on. So, typically when you're creating a class, like local date, you're expecting to have multiple objects of that class. So, a single blueprint, like local date, can instantiate multiple objects and you can use those objects and they would behave the same way. Okay, so for example, a local date object could instantiate the uh, a local date class, a local date blueprint could instantiate the objects, the birthday for Peter, the birthday for Anna and so on and so forth. By the way, notice the naming we've used here. Birthday is before Peter, why? Well, we could have just said Peter birthday. Yes, but that could cause a bit of confusion about how you would name this because Peter is obviously a name and typically names are capitalized. But on the other hand, objects aren't capitalized. Like just like I created this birthday over here, I, I didn't capitalize it. I wrote a small letter B over here. So what, uh, why did we use this switching up of the birthday and the name? Well, so we could use a non-capital case over here and use the capital case in the next letter. It's a bit of semantics, but it's one thing which you might notice and you might be wondering, okay, so if I can't do this, how, how do I name my objects? And my suggestion would be to, even if it's a name of someone, use the, the lowercase letter for the object name, because what you're creating is an object name. It, it's not really a name of someone. It's not really, um, text in which you reference someone like you would in a book is just an object in your code. So use lowercase letters for objects in all cases when you're using Java. Okay, so the ob objects we created are just instances of those classes. An instance is just that, an instant creation of a blueprint, which is the class. So in each of these lines where we created a list, where we created the local date, where we created, um, actually those are pretty much all of them, uh, where we created the scanner, 
the scanner, the birthday, and all of these are instances of the class. So an instantiation and uh, away the, the, the blueprint of the class comes into existence. Just like my car is an instance of a certain uh, vehicle brand of cars. Okay, so that process is called instantiation or object creation or construction. You would see these terms uh, used around, so we're introducing you to them, so you're not uh, confused when you're Googling something of this type. Okay, so an instance and an object are pretty much synonyms. So if you say instance or if you say object, it doesn't really matter. Okay, and all of these instances usually have a common behavior which the class describes. So your class describes how your objects behave and we will see how we can uh, create our own classes a bit further on in this lecture. But what you need to keep in mind is that all instances of an object have a similar behavior. So the get year method of the birthday of each and every one of these birthdays over here will behave in exactly the same way. It won't differ in uh, in implementation. So this is the same method, but it gets executed over a different object. And because the data is different, the method returns a different result. Just like when we have a, num a, a method which has a parameter, the change of the data in that parameter allows the, the method to do the same things, but return a different result. So in here, in addition to parameters, which, ca which we can also add into methods of classes, just that this get here method doesn't have parameters, but other methods could have. So just like you can provide parameters to shift the behavior of the method, you can use the object itself. The method here has ac access to the object's fields and that also changes its behavior, but it, but it actually changes its, re its result, not its behavior. It, changes, it, it just changes the result which you get from the uh, operation of this method, but the method is the same. So each instance of an object has the same method it calls, but that method works over different data, meaning different objects from the class. Okay, so this is, these, all of these are instantiations of the date object. We already saw how we can use that. Now, a more typical syntax would be something like new local date and you provide the parameters over here, just like you do for array lists or strings. But local date, that specific class, this specific utility in the Java libraries, doesn't have this type of uh, initialization logic. It has another type, which is this local date dot of. But don't be confused by this local date dot of. This is specifically for the local date class. Other classes we will instantiate in other ways, just like the scanner class over here is instantiated in this way. You say new scanner and you provide a parameter which describes, describes from where the scanner is going to be reading. Okay, so your typical initialization of objects will contain the keyword new and the data type of the thing you're wanting to create. For example, here we have a new array list, which we already know represents an array that can grow in size and it does that optimally. Okay. So the local date.of is just, it actually, if you navigate to local date.of, you would see it does a create and that create somewhere over here, you're going to see, let's see where this is, uh, local that create return new local date. So this is just uh, a simplification of this initialization. You see, this is some, a somewhat complex initialization. It has some logic in it, some checks. Uh, so when you're creating a local date, well, this is what local date dot of does. It eventually reaches new and local date. So every initialization, every instantiation of an object contains the words new and the data type of that object. But some of these classes like local date hide that from you through other methods. Just like you can uh, create a method which is called create array list and that would return a new array list. So it, eventually you get to the point, w point where you say new something, but that new something is sometimes hidden, uh, from, 
hidden from direct access by your code through that method. Okay, so this is the instantiation concept. Objects are created. Each of these objects behaves independently, but their behavior is the same as in the operations they do are the same, the data they hold is the same, but the values of those data types they hold can be different. So different dates can have different information inside them. So as I said, classes just provide the structure for your objects. They're the blueprints. So the local date class has the blueprints which say, well, this should have a date, this should have a month, this should have a year. Okay, and the plus days and minus days uh, methods are behavior of that local date object. Okay, and an object is an instance of these things. So each object is just these fields described in the class, copied into new parts of memory, having different values, and having the same methods which operate on them. So if you have Peter's birthday as an example, that would have a day which has a specific value, whereas in the class you just name the data type, and the object which represents that birthday will fill in that data type with a specific value and that will fill in the month too and the year too and so on. Okay, so this is a brief overview of what objects look like and what classes look like and how we use them. Now we already did some usage of these objects and I described, described a bit of the concepts behind how you, uh, how these classes are created, how, the, how they are described and so on. Now, from here on out, we're, we'll try to use objects which exist in Java. We'll play around with a few classes, some of which we have and some of which we haven't seen up to this point. And then we'll start creating our own classes. Okay, continuing on, we already saw how we can use objects and classes. Now let's practice that a bit by using the built-in API classes from Java, like math, like random, like big integer, and so on. Now, there's a lot of stuff in Java which is already implemented and you don't need to do it yourself. For example, a class that represents very big numbers. You already know that uh, int and long are integer types and long has the uh, highest amount of values, but it's still limited. Java has a thing called big integer, which isn't really limited. It's only limited by the amount of uh, memory you have on your system. Well, that's not exactly true. It's limited by about 4 billion bytes. Uh, yeah, it's limited of, to up to 4 billion bytes of information, approximately. That's not an exact number. But that's a really, a, a really large number of information to store a number inside. So it's pretty much bigger than uh, it, its highest limit is is bigger than the number of countable elements, uh, ca uh, the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it's not very likely that you'd be needing anything bigger than that. So there is a class which supports those operations. There are also classes which represent math operations, which represent random randomness and so on. And we will try to use them in this lesson. Okay, so what are those classes and how we can find them? Well, Java, has so-called packages. So when you're looking for something, it's usually in some sort of package inside the Java package, the Java general package. So java.util.scanner is where the scanner class, which we use to read from the console is located. And java.utils.list is where the list class is located. So basically Java structures classes in packages and you have a big package called Java and inside it you have a package called util and inside util you have classes like scanner, like list and a lot of others. So that's basically what Java uses for structuring the code you have in the Java libraries. Now this is how you find those classes by importing something from some package. If you open the code, which we were editing a few moments ago, you'd see java.time.localdate is an import and import java.util.star just means import everything from this package. 
Now that's a bit uh, wasteful, we don't need everything, but in our small examples it's not a big deal. Okay, the list is somewhere in java.util.list, but since we have the import for the entire package over here, we don't need to write that down explicitly. Okay, and if you're searching for something, you could do import, let's hide this one, you could do import java dot and then you'll see what packages there are in the java package so for example java dot math and here you have that big integer class i was talking to you about so you can use the autocomplete in intellij idea to uh, traverse through the packages you can see in java or you can just google them okay so let's return our imports the way they were and this is how you access some of that functionality which is already defined in Java. So to use the existing classes, what you do is just you import the package you need. But more often than that, you just write the class you want, for example, big integer, press enter, and IntelliJ automatically imports that into Java. So you typically don't need to write these imports yourself, but it's a good idea to know how to do it. Okay, so this is how you use them from the point of view of how you find them to be included in your program. Okay, so how do you actually use the objects and the classes? Well, this local date time dot now or this local date which we used dot of or if you use math dot max or math dot cosine or math dot dot sine or and so on each of these is, is a so-called static method, just like, just like our main method is, and just like our parse numbers method from the last lesson is. So these are so-called static members. Static members are members which you can access from the class itself. So if you say local date dot of without needing to have an object before that, well, that's a static method. So static methods are not attached to objects. They are independent from objects. They are just located somewhere inside the local date class, but they're not attached to a specific object as part of its behavior. So in this case, local date time today, which equals local date time dot now, this dot now, this now thing is a method which is a static member or a static method in uh, set shorter a static method which is accessible from the local date time class just how the local date time class is accessible from java dot something dot something the same way the of method of local date or the now method of local date time is accessible from the name of the class followed by a dot okay so these are static members static members do not need an object on which they should be called just like the cosine function from math Okay, so non-static uh, members are, for example, on this random object, this random uh, class instantiated object R&D. This method dot next int is an instance method, a non-static method, just like our dot uh, where was it? Our dot get year is an instance method. This is a non-static method. So if you're having if you have an object and you want to execute something over that object if you want to manipulate that object or extract information from it you will typically be using instance methods so methods called over objects you need an object to say get here you can't say local local date dot get year because which year would it return some of the objects you created year or which one of them or should it think about a, a random year which it should return it local date doesn't have value information objects have value information objects have the actual values inside them whereas local date just defines the blueprint so there is a get year method inside the local date class but it can't be called on a local year uh, on a local date just like uh, in the blueprints of a car there are instructions on how to use the steering wheel. You turn it left and right. But you can't turn the steering wheel on the blueprints. You turn the steering wheel on an actual car, on an actual car object. So you need to have a car object and then you can call the turn steering wheel method over that object. So 
Instance methods are the methods which typically manipulate your objects or access their fields or change something on them or do calculations through the object and so on. Just like the scanner over here, which we instantiate, we call over it dot next line that causes the scanner using whatever input we provided it with, in this case the console, that causes the scanner to read a line from that input and return that line to us. Now, we can't call this to just the scanner class. We can't say scanner.nextLine. Why can't we call scanner.nextLine? Because the scanner class is just the blueprint. It doesn't know from where to read like this scanner object does. Why does this scanner object know where to read from? Well, because we've instantiated it by passing in the system.in, the system standard input stream, which system standard input stream contains the data for uh, for the scanner, the, the necessary data that describes where the input comes from. And that's why this scanner can read from the console, whereas the scanner class can't. The scanner class is just a blueprint. Now, th those are instance methods. And back to static methods, the local date dot of method is just a description of how to build a local date. It doesn't access an actual date it builds a new date from given parameters. Okay, so let's say you have a blueprint and the blueprint says how you create a car. It doesn't uh, need a car to exist to create that car. It just says how that car is created. But once that car is created, operations on that car are done through the car object you just created, like uh, flipping the ignition switch, for example. Okay, so instance methods non-static methods are methods which you call over objects where you have an object and then you say dot and then you say the name of the method or the or another member it could also be just a field depending on the field access rights okay so these are non-static methods or otherwise called instance methods whereas the methods which you access directly from the class name are called static methods and you don't need an existing object to call a static method. Why? Well, for example, in this cosine method example, cosine doesn't really need an object to calculate cosine with. Cosine is just a mathematical function and is, it is just calculated like a series of operations. The same way over here in parse numbers, we don't really need anything. We just need a parameter which provides the input string from which we parse our numbers. We don't need to call this on an existing object, but we could. We could create an object which gets instantiated through the string line. It, get, it takes it in its constructor. We'll talk about constructor, constructors at the end of this lecture. It takes it as a parameter of its constructor and it, it initializes its fields with that string line. And then it just has a parse numbers method which doesn't accept parameters because it already got its parameters during its creation. Okay, so there are very uh, th th there are a, a whole lot of ways to uh, write code and create objects and instantiate them, and for now we're just seeing the different ways to do that. And from here on out, we'll be incorporating these different ways in tasks, which will we we will be solving through these uh, different methodologies which we're seeing. Okay, so. This is how you use static methods and this is how you use instance, met instance methods, that, methods that, would, that should have been clear by now. By the way, the list methods, which you already know and love, for example, birthdays.size is an what? It's an instance method. And birthdays.set at this index, this value, is again an instance method because it changes the birthdays list. It accesses that list, that specific object, and changes just that, not any other object. So this is an instance method. It is attached to an instance. Okay, so that's what are uh, what are use that that's what our ways for accessing functionality from Java classes uh, looks like. And now let's solve some tasks using what we already know about Java and the classes it contains. So we have a list of words over here and we have to randomize that list of words and print it on a separate line. So for A space B, we have to print B 
or A or A and B. Again, this is randomization. So this is just an example of how the output would look like. It's not the only way the output could be uh, printed. Okay, so this over here is another example of how it should look like. We have three strings in the input separated by spaces. We need to split them by those spaces and then randomize the order. Now, how we do that randomization? Well, we can use the random class, which Java supports. And let's actually do that before we see what we have in the slides as a solution. So let's get rid of this code, which reads dates. And let's read a list of strings. So we will have multiple strings entered on the console. Actually, do we need a list? We have a single line. We have a single line of text and we need to split it by the, by the spaces it contains. So we kind of can manage with just an array. So let's create an array of strings, a string array uh, words, and initialize that as what? Where, where are we going to get these words? Well, let's create a scanner and tell it to instantiate itself using the system.in, the standard input, by the way, system.in is also a static member. .in in, is a static member of system. It is accessible without needing to create an object of type system. The system class is just a general representation of the system we're working on, of the PC we're working on. So this system, which we are accessing, has an in field, which uh, redirects to the standard input of the computer. And we pass that on to the constructor of a scanner and that initializes a scanner object which has access to this system.in stream. This is a so-called stream. Okay, so how do we get these words? Well, we'll need to call the scanner and read the next line and we can directly split that next line into spaces. And that will give us an array of words. Okay, so how now do we do randomize these words? Well, we need to swap around their places. Now, how can we swap around randomly? Notice that everything we have used up to this point is pretty deterministic. It, it can't be random. Even if you write a random number here, for example, you s decide to randomly switch the places of words zero and words one, although this isn't really a, a correct swapping, but let's say this. If you, even if you randomly decide zero and one or zero and 42, this isn't really random because if you start the program again, it will do the same stuff. And even if you do some weird calculation, it will be the same calculation. So when you're uh, coding, uh, your code is generally and should generally be deterministic. It should do the same thing for the same input, uh, and meaning it should have the same output, the same result for the same input. Okay, so how do we randomize this? Well you might have thought about using the current time because that is something that changes. So in order to uh, have non-deterministic output, it, it's still going to be deterministic, but its conditions will not be deterministic because if you start this program twice, it, the only thing that changes, the, the, the only thing that really changes is the time, the date of your execution. And then you can use that date to do some weird calculation some complex calculation which isn't obvious as a result uh, and use that to swap around indexes. Now instead of doing that on your own, you can use the random class which is uh, present in Java and instantiate a random object. For example, let's call this RNG, random number generator, like it's often referred to in gaming because that's exactly what it is. It's a random number generator. It generates random numbers. How random? Well, it uses the current date and based on that date, it generates a sequence of random numbers, which you get by how? By saying RNG dot next, and you can say next integer, next Boolean, next double. It just creates a number. Okay, so uh, how do we use this random uh, object? And keep in mind that you need to instantiate the object and then start using the integers, the, the random numbers it generates. You shouldn't instantiate a random generator all the time. You should instantiate it once and use it from every, everywhere in your program. That's the typical case at least. Why? Because as I said, this uses the current date. 
if you create a lot of these in a loop, well, the loop runs pretty quickly. So the current date won't have changed really. You could have a lot of executions of the loop inside the same millisecond, which is the resolution of this random number generator. So if you have 10 random number generators instantiated in the same millisecond, they will all generate the same random number sequence. So you instantiate a single random number generator and then use that random number generator object, RNG, this RNG here, you use that to generate your random indexes. And how would we uh, reorder these words? Well, what I do is actually I'd create a list of a list of words, a list of strings, of string, and I'd say that this is arrays dot as list. Convert this list into uh, this array into a list, like we did last time. Convert it into a list, and now convert that into an array list. Okay. And what am I going to be doing with this array list? Well. How do I randomize words? The simplest thing I can think of, well, one of the ways I can do it is actually swap around two indexes, right? So I get this index, I save it into a temporary variable, then I get this index of Java, I replace PHP with Java, and then I use that temporary variable which contains PHP and place it in, in Java's position. And I do the, that n times, for example, the number of times, uh, <coughs> the number of items there are in the list, that's one way to do it. I do it the number of, uh, I do it as many times as there are items in the list, and then I have a somewhat randomized list. Now, we don't have real requirements of how random our random list should be. So we're fine with just doing some shuffling. We don't need to be perfect in the shuffling. But another way to do that, and I'll use the other way, uh, because the the shuffling, the the swapping around way is present in the presentation. So let's solve it in another way. So you can see another example of this code. I do the following thing: I traverse words. I do a for loop. So I'd say for from i equals zero to words dot size. And now I'll do the following. Um, this is just an iteration of words, it's not really, we're not really walking over words. We're not going to be accessing items in order. We're just going to be executing this that many times. We don't really care about the indexes of the words themselves. We just care about executing that many times. And now what we're going to do is say, random number generator, please give me an integer. And one of the options of give me an integer because this can give you any integer from minus 2 billion to plus 2 billion. So what I'll tell it is I'll give it an upper bound. The upper bound is words.size. So give me an integer that is less than words.size. And that would provide me with an integer which I'd call index. And then I will use that index to remove the item from that index and place it in the first position. So I will remove that from the index it is located at and place it as the first item in the list because that's one way to randomize. If I'm picking random indexes which I place into the first position, the first position will be randomized each time. So I'd be inserting at the first position every time a new item. Or if I want to optimize that even more, I wouldn't be inserting in the first position, I'd be inserting in the last position because lists work faster if you insert at the last position. So I just need to insert somewhere. I need to remove the item and insert it somewhere. So what I'd be doing is um, I'd say words.remove this index, remove the item at this index, and place it, the, the item we just got, string word, equals words.remove, because remove returns the item which we have removed. And remove, by the way, is also uh, an instance method, which we call over the words list. OK, so we got the word. We removed it from the list and now I'll add it, words.add, at the end of the list. Okay, so I removed it from where it was and I set it at the end of the list. And because I took it randomly from somewhere, I don't know which index I took it from, uh, this will randomize our list. Now, occasionally, I'd remove the last word and place it in the same spot, but that's randomness for you. Randomness doesn't mean that everything changes its place. 
It just means that some items change their, their place and some items don't randomly. Okay, so that would reshuffle our words. And now if we write a for loop that prints them, meaning if we say words alt enter iterate, that would create a for each loop for us. And, then, and we can say system.out.print line that word, print that word. And if we start this program and enter a few words, we will see them randomized on the output. Okay, so let's input our words. Let's use the example we have here, PHP, Java, C sharp. Press enter, Java, then C sharp, then PHP. You can ignore this uh, bluish output. It's part of the Java runtime. It's not really in your uh, program. It is just displayed in the IntelliJ console as information for the developer. You don't really care about this at this point. So we got Java, C Sharp and PHP. They are randomized. They aren't in the same order they were. Although they are now, I, I would have said they are in reverse order, but that they're not exactly in reverse order because you, you have initially Java and then you have C Sharp, which is the last item. And then you have PHP, which is the first item, but Java is the middle item. So we haven't messed up and reversed them instead of randomizing them. This is a randomization, but each randomization has some pattern in it. Uh, if you look, if you have a lot of data and, or if you have too few data uh, and you look closely enough, you can always find the pattern. Patterns are easy to find for pattern matching creatures like us. Okay, so this isn't really a strict task. It, it's not really a strict expectation for, uh, we don't have a strict expectation for the output. Um, it's just the way you can use the random class. It's, it's a demonstration of how you can use the random class as a random number generator. Now, if I start this program again and enter the same input again, PHP, Java, C sharp, it's pretty likely for me to receive other output. Although in this case, I received the same output. Uh, it's pretty likely to for me to receive uh, other output. But if I place this random number generator inside the loop, if I initialize it every time, this is not a very good randomization. Why? Because this random number generator gets initialized with the same so-called seed, that seed is the timestamp of the current moment. So if it gets initialized with the same seed, it will always give the same index for uh, swapping around. So don't place a random number generator initialization inside the loop. Keep it, keep one or two random number generators, meaning initialize them once and use them multiple times. So, because otherwise, if you initialize them multiple times inside the loop, which runs quickly, it's pretty likely that those random number generators will have the same sequence in them. Now, if you want truly random number generation, there are websites which provide that trend, truly random number generation by using, um, for example, the uh, amount of uh, static in, Earth at, in Earth's atmosphere at some point in time at some location on the Earth's globe or stuff like that. So uh, casinos, online casinos, online gambling sites uh, and other um, uh, other places where you really need randomness, non-deterministicity. Uh, in such uh, situations, you need to use some outside physical output which randomizes your operations. Otherwise, even this random number generator operates on some algorithm. If you navigate to the next end, you will see the logic it uses. And if you know the seed of the random number generator, you know the random number sequence because you can do these same operations and, uh, and know what random, what random sequence was generated. So this is the so-called pseudo-random, pseudo-random, uh, random number generation. And actually random number generation would depend on some non-deterministic input from an out outside system. Like I said, the amount of static in Earth's atmosphere at some point in some location. Okay, but in our, for our case, it's completely sufficient to use a simple random number generator for this. Okay, so the solution we have here in the, the, the slides is a bit more optimal because we're just swapping around two positions in a list or an, in an array, which is faster than removing items and inserting them. Because in this situation, you just access two items. 
Whereas when you're removing an item from the middle of the list, all of the elements after that item need to be shifted into its position, shifted left by one position. So removing items is a lot slower than just swapping around two positions, but I wanted to show you another solution of this task. Okay, another task we have here is calculating a big factorial. So calculating the factorial of a large number. Now, you know that factorial grows pretty quickly. So one times two is two, one times two times three is uh, six. And then one times two times three times four is 24. And then it's 120 and then it's a thousand and something. And then it uh, exceeds 10,000 and so on. It, it, it grows very quickly. This is what we call exponential growth of the data. So in this case, the number is the data and calculating for a large number n, it gives us a very large number. So if you're multiplied, multiplying 1000 by 999, that's pretty close to multiplying 1000 by 1000, which is already 1 million. And then you have by 998, which is already pr pretty close to 1000. So it's another, you get to uh, billions and so on, you, you, you're, numbers grow really fast. You can't place this inside an integer or even inside a long. Long can't contain the factorial of 1000. So what you can do is use the big integer class from Java, which I already mentioned, for calculating this large factorial. So how do we use that? Well, let's keep the scanner because we're, we'll be reading n, like in this case, five, we return 120. Okay, so we'd be reading something and we'd be initializing a big integer object which will create, which will contain our factorial. So big integer, big integer, let's call it factorial simply. Okay, and we initialize it by again saying the, uh, placing the keyword new and saying big integer. So placing the name of the class, the name of the data type over here. Okay, what does it want over here? It wants an initial value. Okay, let's call it. Yeah, what does it what does it not like in our uh, Oh, we can just say big integer dot value of one. Okay, so initialization of big integer, we could have said new big integer. And then placed and notice what type of initialization we can do. If we want to initialize a big integer by a string, we just provide that string value inside the brackets over here. So if we're going to be reading this uh, number from the console, we can just use, um, if we want to read it from the console, we can just use scanner.nextline. So this code is equivalent to integer.parsint. Now, if this doesn't click right now, why in some cases it's new big integer and in other cases it's big integer dot value of and in some cases it's a new string or new array list, in other cases it's local date dot of and so on. These are just, uh, there is no rule. There are, these are just different versions of classes. So different ways in which you can implement classes. Just like uh, there is no fixed way in which you need to name your variables and there is no fixed way in which you need to read from the console. You can use the scanner, but you can use either next int or next line and then parse it into an integer. So these here are different because they have been coded differently and your classes, once you start creating them, well, they will be coded differently too. So the, don't get bothered by the fact that all of these are different and uh, don't get bothered by the fact that you can't remember how each of them is initialized. I don't remember them either. When I need to create a big integer, I just try around the different methods it has. So I first, you saw what I did. I just say set new big integer. And I saw what I can pass in here. How did I do that? I placed the cursor between the brackets. I pressed control and P and that listed the types of initializations I can do. So I see here's a byte array. I don't really know how to input that. Well, I do, but let's say I don't know how to use that. Uh, then I'll try another one. So sign num and byte magnitude. Okay, this seems complex too. I won't use that. I just need to in initialize a number. Okay, string value and the radix. Radix means numeral system. So radix 10 means parse it in our numeral system, whereas radix uh, 
two means the binary numeral system. Okay, so do I really need to provide the radix though? Oh, I have an option here which doesn't accept the radix. It just the, it it probably assumes this uh, the decimal numeral system. Okay, so I use that. And there are a lot of other options I, which I can use. And if I don't know how to use them, I will just open Google and search for them. I don't try to remember all of them. I just type in, okay, create big integer from number. If I type that into Google, so if I say create big, in, big integer from int or from long or from string, well, I'll get a result which tells me how I can do that. Programming isn't, isn't about remembering stuff. Programming is about knowing where to find something and being good at searching. Okay, so after all, we're programmers. Remembering stuff is the job of computers. Our stuff, our, our job is to know how to create that stuff or how to use a computer to find that stuff. Okay, so don't worry if you don't uh, figure out immediately what to use. It, it takes time and practice and I know all of, I know some of these methods, I don't know all of them. I know that big integer will pro probably get have a value of, big integer dot value of, it will have a static method which accepts a parameter and that parameter initializes the big integer with that value. Why do I know? Well, because I've tried it a lot of times and I kind of remember. But if I don't remember, I'll just Google it. Okay, so big integer dot value of, and now what do I provide as a value? Well, the first value of the factorial, if I look it up on Google, I know that the, the factorial of zero is one, and the factorial of one is one, and the factorial, factorial of two is one times two. So I always start from one. Okay, so my factorial is going to be big integer dot value of one. And now, what do I do? Well, I want to uh, read n, I have my scanner, I want to read n and multiply big factorial by the next number in the sequence of numbers so until, I, until I reach n. So I'll read from the scanner a new, I'll just read the integer directly, I'll read an integer and I'll say this is n. Why do I call it n? Well, because that's what they call it in the problem. Okay, so n is my number and from here what will I do? Well, I'll start a for loop, I'll think about whether it should be from zero or not and I'll continue that loop until I reach n, but I, until I reach n inclusively. So I'm reading up to n inclusive, not uh, just uh, before n, because n factorial includes n in the multiplication. And now what would I do? Well, I don't want to actually multiply by zero because that will give me zero from here on out, whatever else I multiply in. And I don't really care about multiply multiplying from one either because one multiplied by anything is just that thing. So I'll start from two. So from two to n, I'll multiply into factorial. So how do I do that? I'll call factorial dot let's see multiply okay so i can multiply by something what do i multiply by another big integer well i already know how to uh, create a big integer i say value of and i place i over here okay so what does this do well be careful when you're using such methods study them and see in the documentation online what they do because this doesn't modify the factorial method and actually um, result dot big integer here uh, is highlighted by uh, I mean multiply here is highlighted by IntelliJ that we're losing the result of multiply oh a result of multiply so what does this do it actually returns a new big integer so it creates another big integer which can contains the multiplication it's not the it's not a modif f modification of this factorial which we have here it's a creation of a new object so since this factorial will remain the same and this multiplication will create a new object, well, I'll just assign it back to the object I'm using for the multiplication. So I say factorial equals factorial multiply by i. It's pretty much the same as if factorial was a normal integer. I'd say factorial equals factorial multiplied by i, right? But since factorial isn't a normal integer, it's an object, 
it's it represents an integer but it is an object and that object can't be multiplied directly only numbers can be multiplied directly in java so in that case what i do is use the functions which the big integer class provides me which in this case is the multiply function i need okay so i have the factorial multiplied into itself and now i just need to print it on the output okay how do i print it system dot out dot print line let's print that factorial factorial okay but uh, is that factorial can that factorial be printed directly on the console well let's see when you wonder whether or not something can be printed directly on the console what you do is place a dot here and say to string and when you add this to string here this is a description of where the logic for converting this thing to something that can be printed to the console is located this by the way, is also an instance method. And now you go over here and press Control B. And if it navigates you to the class, which you're using, in this case, biginteger.java, you can pretty much bet that this can be printed directly on the console and it will have a meaningful value. Now, why this is, it's, it's based on something called inheritance and, uh, and polymorphism and overriding methods. Basically what happens is big integer describes how it wants to look on the console in itself. Now if this had navigated you to object.java or something other than the class you're using, it's not guaranteed, uh, if, it, if it navigates you to object.java, it's guaranteed that you won't see anything reasonable on the console. You just see the type of the object you're printing, not the value of that object. But if you see something else, there is a chance that uh, it will be printed automatically on the console and you don't need to worry about it. Okay, so in this case, we just print to string. Now, if, if you arrive in a situation in which you can't print directly, well, you would have to print the, if this big integer didn't have uh, a way to be printed on the console directly, well, what would we have done? Well, we just start dividing it by 10 to get its last digit and print that or add it into a string and then print that into a re in reverse because if we're taking the last digit we need to uh, print that in last position okay so there are a lot of ways to do this but since big integer has a two string implementation it it has its own description of how it wants to be printed on the console we're fine by just doing this okay let's start the code now and see what it does now for five i'd expect 120 and I got 120. Okay, so I have a mid case. Let's try the border cases. Let's try zero. And I got one. This is the correct uh, value, the correct result for a factorial of zero, at least according to what mathematics say. So I'll accept that as a true result. One, it returns one. Okay, so now I've tried with the border cases of zero and one. I've tried with an average value of five. Let's try with something that we, do, we know won't fit in uh, integer or won't fit in long. Let's try with something large. Okay, so we have an example here for 10. It's going to be a lot. Let's see if there's a bigger example. 88. Okay, let's see if we can use 88. And we got this huge result. Now, how do you check that? Well, a lot of ways, but what I do is copy this value, open PowerPoint, press Control F and paste it over here and see if it matches. Okay, so it seemed that it seems it matched with this, well, maybe not with all of the zeros, but it could be the case that these zeros here don't match completely or that PowerPoint didn't match completely. Another way to do it is by using some sort of diff tool online. So you just Google diff tool uh, or compare strings or something like that and paste the value which is expected and then paste the value which you have and see what happens. Okay, so we got a pretty big value and we're assuming that this should be the correct factorial for uh, this uh, operation. Now, I could have missed something and what I should do is really go around and check all of this, but we won't be uh, concerning ourselves with that. I'll leave this debugging up to you. See if this really is correct, meaning how could you see it? Well, you could go on the internet and find a factorial calculator online and see if the results it gives match the results we calculate. And if it doesn't, well, 
figure out why it doesn't. Where, where, where's the problem exactly? What causes it to not print correctly? Okay, so play around with this code and at the same time you will see, you, you can, for example, play around with how you want this big integer to be initialized. Like I said, you can also do it like this, new big integer and place one in uh, a string literal. This would parse this number into a big integer. So play around with this code. The, the point of this lecture is that you get yourself introduced to these types of classes and these types of uh, code. So just play around with them. Okay, so here's a solution for this uh, task. We have it written over here. It's pretty much the same that I already wrote. It's just a big integer parsed, uh, initialized from the, va the value of one, although they do it in another, another way. And then we have a loop that continues from two until it reaches n inclusively, and we multiply the number by the value of the integer, although this is a pretty large, a, a pretty roundabout way of achieving it. You can just say value of the integer i. Okay, so try to compress this. Try to not uh, use too many initializations inside initializations. Find the shortest way you can create a big integer and use that. That should be your go-to move in any case, not just for big integers, but for everything else. Okay, so we've reached defining classes and let's actually play around with this a bit before we continue to the break. So we'll do a break in just a moment, but let's play around a bit with defining classes before we do the break and then finish up the lecture with this thing again. So we already said that classes are pretty much specifications, blueprints for objects. And these objects are usually objects from the real world, or at least from the business logic of, logic of the application. So if the application should represent birthdays, it would probably have a birthday class. If it uh, represents, and that birthday class will contain a date and the name of the person who has a birthday. Um, or if it represents automobiles, well, it will have classes that represent automobiles, cars or other, uh, other types of vehicles. It will probably have a vehicle class in general. Okay, so classes define that specification. And here is how you create a class. You just say class, and you do this outside of the main method, outside of any method, actually. Then you type, the, type in the name of your class. For example, in this case, we would have a class named dice. And then you open brackets like you open for a method, but you don't place the parameter brackets, you just open the body brackets, the, the scope brackets. And then inside, you place the fields of your object. So let's start with this and then we'll have a break, but we, I want you to see this before you uh, get the break so you can uh, keep it uh, worrying around in your mind. Okay, so you could place your class pretty much anywhere, but in Java, there is a requirement that there only be one class inside one file. So in our case, we have this class main, which is in the file main.java, and the file name and the class name should match in, when you're writing Java code. So how do we create two classes since we only have one file? Well, one option would be to actually, you know, create uh, more files. But since we haven't done that yet, we'll just add our classes inside the main uh, class. Since we're just stepping into object-oriented programming, we'll, we'll have a lot of separate lessons which cover that and creating multiple files and compiling the whole solution and so on. But for now, we're just going to write everything inside the main class. So you can have as many classes nested inside main as you want, but you can't have them on the top level. On the top level, there should only be main. Okay, so what did I have a while back? I had a student, a student which had a name, it had an ID and an average grade. And we'll have a similar task at the end of the lesson, but let's play around with this one for now. Okay, so I have a name, I have an ID, and I have an average grade. And those were a string, an integer, and a double. So how do I compress these three lists into a list containing a single object, which in turn contains these three fields? Just like, so how, meaning the question is, how do I do what local date does when containing several fields? Well, 
I come over here inside main and I say class you don't need to write public even though main has one you don't need to write it because you're inside the scope which uh, you're going to be accessing this class from your, from your main method and that main method can see anything inside main so you don't need this public thing again this is one of the things we will need to discuss further on okay so what these public identifiers mean public private protected and so on so uh, what will our class be named well it represents information about the student so let's call it student okay so what will it have inside it and now inside these brackets you write uh, variables just like you would when you're initializing them so let's create a variable for the name you just type in string name and you place this uh, semicolon over here that indicates that this is one field and here we're going to list another field uh, what's the other field it's the ID and that was an integer okay this is the ID and then we have a double which is the average grade so just like you would be doing in main so this code would compile successfully in main with the same pretty much the same result one difference is you don't initialize them or you don't need to initialize them. You actually can initialize them over here, but let's not initialize them because this is just the blue pl blueprint for our student. It just says what data types it has and what the names of those fields are. So this is a so-called field and this also is a field and this also is a field. Okay, so we have the name id and average grade fields in our student and now i can create a variable of type student so i can say student and i can say student george for example equals new student so create a student object and add it into the student george uh, variable now it uh, hmm, uh okay so i need this to be a static class i'll explain this in a bit when we continue after the break now what it wasn't happy about when i wrote this uh, class student is that this uh, student notice how the main method is static so this is static static methods can only access other static methods because it, they're not part of an instance and since i didn't write st static in front of my class that static class student became uh, an, an instance member and static members uh, static yeah static members can't access instance members which look like this so for now let's place static in front of our classes and further on we will explain why we do that for now what you can remember is since main is static it can only access other static stuff now how does this static class affect uh, the usage of the student we will see further on okay so we have a student class over here which is the class student which contains the fields name id and average grade of the type string integer and double and we initialize an object of that class over here in main so now i have a student george object and that student george object has an, a name it has an id and it has an average grade all of which i can access the way i've written it at this point uh, up to here so I can say average grade equals 3.0 just like I had previously when we started the lesson in which we uh, talked about how we can describe the information for the student well here is a way in which we can bunch, bunch that information together and access it but before we see how we should really be accessing these uh, objects and playing around with them we'll do a break and after the break after I've let your minds uh, play around with this a bit and after I've given you a bit of time for you to play around with this code while you're, while you're resting. After that, we'll continue with actually studying how we should be using these uh, classes, what this thing is called, how we can modify it, how we can write our own methods like the to string one or the value of one or the dot size one that the list has and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is initialization of a student class. Uh, this is the description of a student class. And this is the initialization of an object called student George, which is a, which is a, mem which is 
an instance of that student class. Okay, we got to the point of creating some simple classes and we actually defined some things, uh, but we definitely didn't place everything inside our student class which we wanted to, but that was part that was by design. We wanted that to remain unfinished so you can play around with it in the break. And now let's finish that one up actually because it's interesting what we can do with it before we can get to the actual actual usage of uh, classes and all of their features. Okay, so let's get back to our task where we had to uh, read students from the console and print them out uh, on the console and we used a few lists to do that. Okay, so let's keep the scanner we have here and let's remove everything else. And here's our student over here that we created. Now, by describing our student like this, we have access to all of these fields. We have access to the name, to the ID, and to the average grade of our student. So we have a student object, meaning we can create student objects by using the new student brackets syntax, and we can access their fields, those, these things here, variables inside an a class inside the objects of a class are called fields. So this is a field and this down here is also a field and average grade is also a field. All of these are fields. So variables inside a class are, are called fields. And methods inside our class are called methods. Actually functions inside the class are called methods and that's why previously you've heard me say um, we create this function because functions are func functions are these things which we're writing here, this thing we're calling a method. It's actually a function and the reason we're calling it a method is because it's located inside the main class. So a function located inside a uh, class is called a method. Uh, but in Java everything is located in some class or other, so everything is a method. So every function is a method. There are no freestanding functions. If main could have been outside the main class, it would have been called a function, not a method. Generally, that's the rule in programming, although that's a bit semantical. It, is, it really isn't that important, but I figured it would be a good idea for you to know why there is a difference in terminology. Okay, so what are we going to do with our student object student George over here well well we aren't actually going to use that one because what we wanted to do is read a multiple of students a lot of students by using the scanner and saying give me the next line and parse that into an integer integer dot percent of that next line so here is our array of students or list of students or here is at least the count of the students so students count or students number okay so this is the number of students that are going to be entered uh, on the console for us. Okay, so how do we read them? Well, we do pretty much, pretty much the same thing we did previously. So we start a for loop, start from i equals zero and continue until we reach students count. And this time we only need one list in which we will be adding elements. That list will be the student list. So we'll call this students and we'll instantiate it with the new array list. Okay, so now we have a list which contains students. Now, we of course need to read the fields for these students from the console again. So we need to read a string name, which we'll, we will get from scanner.nextline. We will need an integer ID, which we will get from scanner.nextline, but we will parse that into an integer. Okay, and finally, we're going to be needing a double, which is average grade, which we will parse as a double from the next line in the scanner. So we're reading line by line and parsing stuff from the console, and we have our ID, our name, and our grade. Okay, but we can't add these directly into the students list. Previously, we had what? We had a separate list for each of these uh, fields which we had in our students. We didn't really have objects back then. We just had different fields, uh, I'm meaning different lists. And each of these lists were synchronized with each other so that parallel indexes in them represented an object. Okay, in our cases, we have a single list which contains students. 
So what we need to add into that list is we'd say create a new student, student equals new student. Okay. And we need to set the values of the fields for that student. So I'd say student student dot name and set that to the name which we just read from the console and do the same for the ID and do the same for the average grade. Of course, we need to provide the appropriate values. Okay, so now we have instantiated our student and we have initialized its values. So we have given it values for the fields it contains. Okay. And how do we add it to the list? Well, the same way we add anything else to a list, we just say the list, which is students dot add the student, which we just created. And now after this for loop completes, it will contain all the students we have input into the console and those students will be accessible and their fields will be accessible from the rest of our code. So now we have objects which bunch together fields which represent information about the actual world. Okay, so how do we print these? Well, let's start the for loop and now I can iterate instead of using uh, an indexed for loop like I did here, where I had to keep the index in mind so I could print the appropriate fields, I can do a for each loop. So I can do students, alt and enter iterate. For each student in students, do the following. Get this printing code. So I will reuse the format and I will reuse the way I, um, I print these students, but I now don't have the names list. I just have the current student dot his name and the current student dot their ID and the current student dot their average grade. And that's all I need to do. So this iteration is much simpler than using an indexed loop that relies on those lists being parallel. All of the data is contained inside our student object. And if I decide to add other fields to that student object, I just add them here to the class and then use them over here. Now up to this point, this isn't very different from uh, what we've already created. But let's say that I want to filter out any students uh, which don't have a name for which the name is empty. How would I do that? Well, I do the following. Uh, I do an iteration of this student list and I do it with a while loop and I'd say int index equals zero and while index is less than students dot size, we've done something similar in the previous lesson, right? We did, uh, we had a list and we had to remove certain items from it. In that case, it was remove the negative values from the list. In this case, I'll, I'll say remove all students which don't have a name, for which the name is an empty string. So which have been input on the console like an empty line without any contents in it. Okay, so for each index in students.size, if students give me the student at this index, if their name is empty, so if I've initialized an empty name for this student, then students.remove this index. We don't need that index anymore. Otherwise, increase the index and continue on to the next student. So if the student's name isn't empty, we just continue on to the next student. And that would happen until we reach the end of the list or until we've removed everyone from the list if no student has a non-empty name. Okay, so let's play around with this one. Now, why am I showing you this part? It really, it isn't really connected to our student class or at least it isn't connected directly. So notice that here I'm just working with a single list. I intentionally mentioned the previous exercise in which we removed values, negative values from a list. Now it's the same logic. So it's the same thing. We're, we're iter iterating a single list and removing values from it. Yeah, the condition is different, but the code is the same. So we're doing the same operations. We're just using a different condition. Now, if this weren't a, a list of students, if it were several parallel lists, 
So if we had uh, like here a list of string names and a list of integer IDs and a list of double average grades, I need to remove from each of those lists the appropriate index. And that makes the code more complicated. And each time I need to add another field, well, I need to remove from even more lists. So I have even more options to fail, even more options to miss something. Whereas this code here doesn't really care what fields I have in my students list, uh, except for the name, which I'm checking based off of. But everything else we don't care about. So this code is abstracted away from the student object. It doesn't really care what the student object contains. Whereas this code over here with uh, the parallel lists, if I add a removal of uh, students which have empty names, well, I'd, uh, the, the removal would need to know about the IDs list, about the average grades list, and so on and so forth. So any field I add, it would need to know about because it would need to remove from that list. Whereas here I have a single list and I work only with that list and I don't care about anything else. Okay, let's see if our code is correct. We may have uh, made a mistake somewhere. So let's wait a bit uh, and let's enter our input. So I'd say the first student's name is Peter and their ID is, whoops, something failed. So we have a number format exception for the input string Peter. Why do we have that? Well, because we try to parse the number of students. So our, first, uh, our input was incorrect. We should have entered the number of students. Okay, start it again. And I'd say, let's say three students. So first student is Peter and their ID is 42, 42, 42. And their average grade is, let's say six, the best grade we have currently. And here I'll enter an empty student. So my cursor is on the line. I haven't input anything and I'll just press enter. This student's name will be empty. And let's place an ID for that student. For example, let's that, let that ID be zeros. And I'd say their grade is 4.5. Okay, and now I need to add the third student. Let's say that's me, George. And George's ID is one, two, three, one, two, three. And my grade is 2.0 because I'm not a good student for some reason. And now when I press enter, this program will finish and it will print only Peter and George. Why did it print only Peter and George? Because the middle student, the one over here, has an empty name. Notice how this line is empty and that's what I told my program to do. I wanted it to filter out students for which the name is empty. And I did this with pretty much the same amount of code I did previously. And that's because I've barely scraped the surface of what classes offer me. So this is a very rudimentary class. It only has fields and I'm directly accessing those fields. Now you notice that the classes I, I already used could initialize with some parameters over here and they didn't access the fields directly. They used stuff like get name, not just name. And there's a reason for that and we'll see it in a bit. Uh, we'll start upgrading this class to match an actual proper class that is to be used in uh, a program. Okay, so this is how a class would normally work. You need the class keyword. Now, until we start adding classes in different files you and using them from places other than main, you would need to also add static. So it would be static class dice and then open these brackets and enter the fields you wish into your class. So static until we start adding multiple files. You can play around with that, by the way. You can add another file to your project and add it as a class. IntelliJ has that support. You can just say, right click on your project, add new class, and IntelliJ will do all the heavy lifting for you. And then you could use your class in your main file without having to write static in front of it. But that's something for another time. And for this uh, part of the course, we'll, we're just talking about single file programs. So the other stuff you can play around with, but for now, keep your code uh, and your exercise code in a single file. Okay, so this is the class. This is its name and the body is whatever you write between these brackets. Okay, so usually you should name your classes like this. So your class should be descriptive. It should describe what it contains, the object it contains, the object from the real world, in most cases, which it contains. And you should name it with a capital letter at the start. And each every word, uh, 
every next word inside this class name should start with a capital letter. So it's similar to how you name methods and variables, but you also capitalize the first letter in addition to all others in the word. Okay, now try to avoid abbreviations unless they are really popular, pop, popular abbreviations. For example, URL is popular enough and HTTP is popular enough in uh, computing uh, in the computing industry that you don't need to type them out uh, fully. But TPMF, unless your code is very specialized and very well documented, don't don't use names like this. It's best to just write out the full name of the class. And don't use lowercase for the uh, word start letters. And don't try to uh, compress the class names too much. For now, try to name your classes like so. This is much more readable than trying to abbreviate or trying to uh, shorten their names. Uh, just use longer names for now. Okay, F further on you will learn where you need to um, use longer names and where you need to use shorter names, but that's something that comes with experience. So you'll learn it, but you'll learn it by writing a lot of code and seeing what works well and what doesn't. Okay, so a class it describes a state and a behavior of objects instantiated from that class. So the state is just the fields. So this, these variables, these are the structure, the fields of the class. Each object of that class has a state. The state is just the, value, the values of these fields. So whatever values your fields have, well, those values are the state of your class. So the com combination of fields and values gives you the state of the class. And the class also has behavior. Basically, the objects have behavior. Each object can do stuff. For, ex for example, our objects right now only store data, but we can cause them to operate uh, autonomously and we can make them do operations which uh, they currently do not support. Let's see that in a bit. So here's an example of our dice class and here are examples of the fields it has and the state it represents. This is the state that our uh, dice class represents, the fields sites, uh, the field sites and the field type, whatever that would contain. The values of these are the state of our class. This is the state. So changing any value inside a class is changing the state of that, I mean, changing a value inside an object is changing the state of that object. So. A class has fields, while objects have the state of those fields. Each object has a state of its fields, and that's terminology that you will often meet when you're googling around for something. Okay, so these are the fields, and we created some of these fields. Now, something that we haven't done yet is create methods. So, we have here an, a description of a method and this method looks the same way that our methods, our static methods do, but this one isn't static. It's just, it says public void row. So for our case, void row would be enough. And this is a method which can do something with our uh, dice. Now let's play uh, around with that for our student class. So uh, our student class has a name and it has an ID and it has an average grade. Okay. So let's, um, let's create a method which print, which returns a string containing the information of our student. How would we call that method? <coughs> well, let's call it to string. Now, notice that IntelliJ offered a suggestion for the to string method, and it also almost crashed. Uh, IntelliJ offered a suggestion for the to string method because the to string method, as I said previously, is something that is common for all objects in Java. So if an object in Java has a to string method implemented on it, if its class has a to string method implemented, then objects of that class can be, for example, directly printed on the console with meaningful results. Okay, so we could overwrite this one. So we could use this to string method, which IntelliJ generated for us to represent our student object. 
Now, notice that I deleted this super dot to string. This is something that we will see in other lectures. But since I want to demonstrate something useful for you, uh, I'm showing you this concept of overriding methods. Although, if you just want to create, okay, let's let's just play around with a normal method and ignore the overrides. So ignore what we just got inserted into our class by IntelliJ. Let's let's just create a method that converts our uh, student into a string. So it gives us the name, the ID, and the average grade in the format that we wanted to uh, get it. So let's name this method. It will return a string, and let's name it. Uh, get string or as string. Let's say as string. So this will convert our student into a string. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's get the printing code we just had over here and convert it into not a system.out.printf. So let's not make the student print itself. Let's just say string.format this way and return that as a result. So this is a method. It is located inside our student class, meaning that it can be called from each and every one of the objects from the student class. So now instead of using system.out.printf, I just say print a line, and that line will contain the student dot as string. So, I'm, I'm creating a string from this student object and providing it to the print line method. Okay, how do I implement the code inside this as string? Well, we know how string.format works. It does the same as system.out.printf, but it returns a string instead of printing it to, to the console. Otherwise, the parameters are the same and the behavior of creating the symbol sequence is the same. Now, where do I get the student.name and student.id and student.average grade, which I uh, used previously? Well, I already have them. I am inside the student class. So this method, as string is being executed over a student object. And that student object has a name, an ID, and a grade. So these are the fields I'm accessing. The, these are the, the bunched up... Uh, properties of our string which travel with, uh, with our stu of our student which travel always with the student object and each student object has them so i can just say in our as string method use that name and that id and that average grade which are present inside the student class meaning that when as string is executed over a certain instance of where where is it a certain instance of a class. So if it is executed over this student instance uh, inside the students list, as string will execute for the name, ID, and average grade of specifically this student. So when the student changes, as string will have access to different name, ID, and average age than when it executes for another object. So each object's as string execution will print a different res will return a different result because the name, the ID and the average grade will change from object to object. Okay, so this is why it's called an instance method because it uses the instance data, the data of the specific in the instance and meaning the fields of the specific instance and in our case, its name, its ID and average grade. So if we have an instance with the name George, Printing here will print George, whereas if we have another instance with the name Peter, printing here will print Peter, and so on. Okay, so, so this is what we wanted written. We wanted to simplify our printing of students by creating a so-called method, which gets information from the student and returns it in a certain way. The same way our local date class that we used, actually the java.utils local date class, which we used in the previous examples, it had a get month method, which actually returned something different than just a number. It returned an object which contained more information. So in this case, we're doing something similar. We're converting our student object to a string using a so-called method, which works on the fields of the current object. Okay, so would this code work? Well, I guess it would, but let's test it out. 
copying this input, starting the program and pasting it back in, we'll see what happens. So I press enter here and I got two, the only difference is I got an empty line over here. Why did I get an empty line? Well, because inside the formatting of the student, I have a new line symbol added and I add one more over here where I print them. So I print it as a separate line. Whereas previously I just had printf. So this is the difference of the implementation. Now my preference would be that printing, that formatting a student just returns a string. We don't know if this would be used on the same line or on a different line or whatever. So let's not assume that from the as string method. We'll just implement the simplest code that formats a string with the meaningful information for our student. Okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well, we now know how to create methods for our classes. Now, another example here would be with the dice class, which has sides and a type. It has a row method, and that row method would just call, uh, would just force the dice to return um, a new value, which is the result of the row. For example, that would be done with mat.random. Okay, so now that we've created a method which returns information and when we've seen what other methods can be created, our next step is to talk about getters and setters. Now, what are getters and setters? These are just, again, just methods, nothing special about them, but there are a certain subset of methods which generally start with the get and set keywords and modify our, meaning the set methods modify our object state whereas the get methods return our object's state. Now, all, of, all that these do is just the get method returns the field to which it corresponds. So get sides would be just, would just contain the code return this dot sides. So for our student, a getter for the name would look like this. String get name, and IntelliJ even suggests that to us. So get name, would return this dot name or just return name. Now, every time you type in this, it references the object in which you are currently. If you don't write this, it still means the current object, but there are some cases and I will show you, uh, show them to you. There are some cases where this, where the, this keyword is actually required. So it's a good idea to start by using it every time, but further on out, you will learn where you can avoid it. Okay, so let's keep it simple. Let's say get name returns name. And let's say int get ID returns ID. And let's say that double get average grade returns average grade. Okay, so I just implemented three so-called getters. And now uh, when I, uh, convert our object to a string, I can say get name instead of just name, and I can say get ID instead of just ID, and get average grade instead of just average grade. Now, from inside the object, like we have here, it usually doesn't matter whether you're using the method or you're using the field. It's pretty much uh, equivalent. There are some cases in which you want to use the getters, and in general, in programming, you typically use the getters instead of using the field directly and there are reasons for that and we will cover them in a bit. So this is one thing I can do and now you're probably wondering well why do I need this? Like I can already access the field through the uh, field name. I don't need a method that returns the value of the field that just wastes time for me to write it. Okay and you would be correct in this situation however there are reasons you don't want external code accessing the fields of your objects. For example, uh, a typical case for students is that they have a number and they can change their name and they should probably change their average grade with each exam they take. However, their student number shouldn't really change. So you can change your name, you can change your average grade, but the university typically doesn't want you to be changing their, your ID because everything related to you in that university is referenced by that ID. So you don't want this ID to change. So what do you do in that case? Well, one thing you can do 
is ensure, and there are other ways to do this too, but is to ensure that this ID isn't accessible from the outside. So outside code can't access this ID. And a general good practice is to make every field in your object to prefix it with this private keyword. Private means that only methods inside student, like get name, get ID, uh, as string, and so on, can access these fields. External code can't. So here, after we've, yeah, the, the, after we've created these fields as private, external code typically can't access them. So getters and setters are written in order to allow you to access these fields from the external uh, from external places, uh, even though the, the fields themselves are private. So what you do is make the, the getters public. So you make this public and this public, and you make this public too, and you make the as string public too. And all of these public things are usable from anywhere, whereas the private things are only accessible from the student class itself. Now, there is an exception over here since even though this is private, it's inside the main class. And since it's the in, inside the main class, we can still access those fields over here. We're not getting compilation errors over here because these two classes are inside one another. So the student class is inside the main class and the main class, since it contains the student class, can access absolutely everything it wants from the student class, even though the fields of the student class are private. However, if we move this class to another another file and start using them it from the other file, then the private access will kick into effect and we won't be able to use these fields which have private access. And now you're probably thinking, okay, why do I want to limit the access? Well, if you're limiting the access, you're controlling what values these fields can take. So if you limit the access to all of them, none of them can be changed, correct? Again, in our case, this isn't exactly true because this class is inside main. But if I move it outside of main, if I say uh, Alt and R, refactor, move, and I pick move inner class to upper level, that will move my class to another file. And once it moves it to another file, these lines over here will stop compiling. And typically in programming, that's what you want to happen because you don't want external code to be accessing your internal data of your objects. The same way as uh, when you have a laptop or when you have a clock, when you have a clock, that clock has external public uh, functionality. So the public functionality is the display. And this display shows me what the time is. However, I don't have access to the battery inside this clock. And I don't have access to the CPU inside this clock, which calculates the time. And I don't have access to the machinery inside this clock, which moves the, the arrows, which display the time. So, and that's on purpose. That's an, a principle of object-oriented programming and of engineering in general called encapsulation. Anything you, want, you don't want the user to be accessing directly, you encapsulate, you put in a box, so they can't access directly. So in my case, making these things private, I ensure that external users of this code, of this student code, can't change the name and can't change the ID and can't change the average grade. And now if I want to allow them to change some of those things, I can just say, create a setter. For example, I said that I want the name to be changeable and the average grade to be changeable. So I can say uh, void set name, which accepts a string name and sets to this name, sets the name that was supplied as a parameter. Now, why am I doing this here? Well, because now name is not obvious what it refers to. So name can refer to the parameter or it can refer to the field. Now using the this dot prefix, I'm disambiguating between the field and the parameter. So I'm saying that the field should take the value of the parameter. Okay, so this way I allow my code to set the name. And if I want to allow external code to also set the grade, set average grade. I can supply a setter for that and set it 
to the average grade field. Now, what happens is that now I have getters for everything. So everything can be parsed from my student class, but I only have setters for name and for average grade, meaning that I can only change name and average grade, but I can't change ID. This is what getters and setters do for you. They allow you to limit access to fields and they also allow you to do checking on the input coming from the parameters of these methods. So you can have a set name which receives a parameter name and if you detect that this name is for example empty you can ignore this object or you can throw an exception or you can uh, otherwise signal to the program that something wasn't correct or uh, if someone enters an average grade outside of the range you've defined for example if in our case the range is between two and six inclusive then you would check if average grade is a valid value over here in this code and only set it if the value was valid. Now this is again another usage for getters and setters. Now we will see this all in great detail in follow-up lessons. For now we just need to know what setters and getters are and how to write them. So setters just are just methods which change the values of fields of an object. And getters are just methods which return the values of fields of an object. So over here, instead of saying student.name equals name, I can say student.setName and initialize the name like, like so. And here I can say student.setAverageGrade and set the grade like so. Okay, so now I don't have a setter for the ID, so I can't say setID because there's no such method. I only have the direct access to the ID. And I don't even want to have this. I don't want to access fields directly. Generally, in object-oriented programming, you don't want to access fields directly. Okay, so how do we solve this? We have setters for name, we have setters for average grade, and we have getters for all of them. But we want to set ID, but we only want to set it once. So we only want to allow external users of the code to set this ID once, and then to allow them to only get this ID. How do we do that? Well, there are a few ways, and one way would be to make this variable final, but we won't discuss that for now. We will see that further on when we dive deeper into object-oriented programming. Another way to do it, and that will tie in nicely with what else we need to do for uh, studying students, uh, students, classes and objects, is constructors. So. What did we say about ID? We want to initialize it exactly once. So we want to make it get a value only when it is being initialized for the first time, for the absolute, absolute first time. So the moment the object is created, we want the ID to be set. And we also want the name to be set and the average grade to be set. So how do we do that? We implement the so-called constructor. So let's continue on. From here, we already saw how we can create objects, so we won't uh, stay around on these slides. And we already saw how we can write methods. Here's, by the way, before we continue to the constructors example. Uh, here's a dice class, and it has sites, and here we have functionality inside the, that dice class. Your methods don't only need to be um, getters and setters and information uh, aggregators like our as string method. They can also be methods which do some operations based on the data and return a value. For example, a dice object can have a row method and that row method can return an integer. And based on the size of that dice, that die, it's single maybe, so based on the, uh, the size of that die, the number of sites on that die, it would generate a random, random number and that random number would be returned from uh, the row method. So methods can do operations on objects, any type of operation, just like uh, the big integer, big integer object had a multiply. It, it had dot multiply by another big integer. So you can write your own numeric cl class. For example, you can write a 2D point class or you can write a complex number class, a complex number class and that complex number class could have a complex number add method, which adds 
calculates the sum of this complex number with another complex number. So this would be a parameter complex number. I won't write the entire thing. And you would be using that parameter inside that method and you would be using the fields of the current complex number to, cal to calculate that sum. Okay, by complex number I mean those numbers which have an imaginary part and a rational part. You've probably heard of them in mathematics. Okay, so the point is that methods inside objects allow you to do behavior. Just like you can write methods inside your main class, you can have methods, same syntax, same operation, same rules for returning values, same rules for uh, passing in parameters. And in addition, these methods have access to the fields of the current object on which they are functioning, unless you mark them static, in which case they don't. But if you miss the static word, which we've been using up until now, if you don't use the static keyword, well, then you can um, access the fields inside the die object in this case. Okay, so I, I said that we'd be talking about constructors so we can finish up our class, which we started implementing. So what are constructors? Constructors are special methods that execute during object creation, meaning when you instantiate an object, so when you say um, create, a, create a student, like we do here, this is actually a call to a constructor. And notice that this looks a lot like a call to a method, right? So this is, it has the brackets and everything, but it doesn't have a return type. Instead, it has a keyword here that says new, and the result of this thing is a student again. So you say new student, and that calls a method which initializes the, ob the student object, and the result of this operation is a new student object which you can use. So this is a constructor. This is the default constructor of this class. So when you haven't added any constructors to a class, like in this case, there are no constructors for the student class added. The student class is just the student class. When you haven't added any constructors, Java automatically generates an empty constructor that does nothing. It just prepares, prepares the memory for your class. Now, if you want to make what we if want if you want to do what we wanted to do initially which was to only set the id when the object was getting initialized this is what you need to do you need to create a constructor so this is something that is called only once during the object's lifetime it creates that object it's the birth of that object so it looks exactly like a method however it doesn't have a return type so that means it doesn't even have a void keyword in front of it, and it matches the name of the class. So for the class student, it would be student, just that. And it can accept as many parameters as you want. Now, this is, the, this is how the default constructor looks like. If you don't add the default constructor, it will look like this. So it, whether I add this code or I don't, that's what the default constructor will be, and that's where it's going to be placed. It, it's just uh, an empty method with empty parameters. But I want I don't want that. I want to create a student which already has an ID and I provide the name and the average grade for that too. So let's say create a student with a string name and an integer ID and a double average grade. So when creating a student I'd require the user of my student class to provide three parameters, the parameter name, the parameter ID, and the parameter average grade. And how do I now initialize the fields of the current student object? Well, I say this object dot the name equals the name that has been passed in, in the constructor. Now, if you just, if you miss the this, notice how uh, this code has been just um, faded away. So this is because the name here, if you, navigate if you click over it and press control b you would be navigated to the parameter so we're assigning the, the parameter to itself because here name hides our name which is the field so in order to access the field you just prefix that with this so now notice how the color changed now if you navigate to the field look where it got us it got us to the field if you navigate from this identifier from this name identifier to where it is declared, it gives us the field. Whereas if you miss the this, it gives you the parameter. So that's what this does. It 
it allows you to access the field if there's a parameter with the same name or any other variable with the same name which hides it okay so this is for the name and we do this for the id as well and we do it for the average grade as well so average grade now equals whatever parameter we've been supplied so this would instantiate the student object and that instance would have a state containing the name we passed in, the ID we passed in, the, and the average grade we passed in. Okay, and now if we navigate back to wherever we were creating our students, notice that we now have a compilation error here. Why? Because we changed this method. Just like when you change the parameters of a normal method, if you change the parameters of the student constructor, well, you can't call it like that, like, like you were calling it previously. So now I just say the student is equal to a new student, con to, I'm, I'm pretty much telling Java, create a new student, construct a new stru student object and construct it with this name, this ID and this average grade. And now I don't need any of these setters. Now we just compressed the code a bit. So instead of having separate lines which initialize our object, we just have a single line which initializes it with all of the fields it needs. We now have the limiting factor of we can't change the ID of the student, so we can't say student set ID. But we can change the name because we have setters for the name. And we can get each of those fields because we have getters for the name, the ID, and everything else. So we have access for reading, but we have access for writing only for name, uh, yeah, only for name and average grade, and we disallow the access for writing for the ID. Now, again, side note, if you just say student.id, this is still accessible, but the only reason this is still accessible is because the student class is inside the main class, and the main class can see everything. If you break off the student class into another file, it won't be able, the main class won't be able to access these private fields. Okay, so now we're creating a student from a single line. We're just reading the input for that student and then initializing it through the constructor. Now this has an additional feature. If we add a new field, for example, if we add, I don't know, let's say string address, string address, we just need to add this address to the parameters we supply over here and initialize the field with it. This address equals the address that was passed in. And now IntelliJ will automatically inform us of all the places where we also need to add this. Whereas with, in the case where we set the fields manually, we could forget some of the places. If we have a lot of places where we initialize students, now in this case, we only have one, but if we had multiple places where we initialize students, it would be a problem. Why? Well, because we'd have to hunt down each and every one of them to add the, the address setter there, to call the address setting, to, to, to get the address from somewhere and set it to the object. Whereas here, once we add something to the constructor, the code stops compiling because it can't do this operation because there is no such, uh, b because we haven't supplied the parameter. And compile time errors are a good thing because you can hunt them down easily. The compiler tells you where they are. So that's another cool thing of constructors. Once you create a constructor, if you change it, the compiler automatically shows you all the places where you need to make a modification. Whereas if you don't have a constructor and you just set field by field and you change something, you have to manually find all places where you need to add that setter to. Okay, so this is what constructors do for, for us. They allow us to initialize an object directly. And you can have multiple constructors for uh, a class. For example, I can say, okay, I want to have a constructor which only accepts an ID, sets that ID and doesn't touch anything else. So this ID equals ID and everything else uh, we leave empty or we leave uh, as no's in this case. This would be a no and this would be the value zero. And then we can set it with uh, the setters. So this is absolutely valid. The same way you can overload methods, you can overload constructors. Also, constructors can call each other. So this to this constructor doesn't need to manually say uh, this dot id equals id. It can just do this, i.e., call itself, call call the call the object, and provide 
an unknown name, the ID which we got, and the average grade, which is zero. Okay, so what does this do? Well, this calls the other constructor. So this tells Java to execute the other constructor and supplies only the parameter we got and leaves all the other ones defaults. Or you can place minus one here, or you can place two, or whatever the default, whatever default value you want. You can make the name, for example, empty, or say this is no name, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So in this case, we're reusing a constructor. Again, this is another variation of the constructor. Now notice that once you've added the constructor, the default constructor disappears. If you, that's why we had an error here. That's why uh, if we try to create, where was it? Let's search for student, okay? If you try to call a constructor with no parameters, you get an error. That's because once you provide a constructor to class, it loses its default constructor. And if you want to for it to have a default constructor, you have to add it manually back. Now, in our case, we don't want one. We just want our students to always have an ID. And that's why we always require an ID. But if you have another class which you can accept to uh, get initialized with empty values, you can just add a default constructor like so. Here's the default constructor and you can do whatever you wish with it. And now, if I leave this code in here, I would be able to create students without providing any parameters. But I don't want to do that now because our task is to create students with specifically these values in them. And this code will do exactly the same as it did previously. However, we've just compacted the code onto a single line, the initialization into a single line. And we've also reduced the probability of uh, committing errors while adding fields because we can't, we now can't miss a field. The only way for us to miss a field is, would be to miss that field inside the constructor. But missing the field inside the constructor is much more unlikely than missing it in seven places where you, uh, where you're creating objects. Okay, so this is what constructors look like. They are just special methods which don't have a return value i.e. you don't write anything before them. They're always the same name as the class name. And from there on out, they follow the same rules as any other method. And they can access the fields of the class, the internal fields of the class and set their values. Okay, and you call them with the new keyword. And if we start this code again, we will receive the exact same result, the exact same output. I won't do it now so that we don't waste time. And we have an example here with the uh, dice class. Here we've modified the default constructor for the dice class to accept no parameters, but initialize the sides of the dice to six because by default dice are six sided. So this is, what, this is how we describe our default dice to be. So if someone creates a dice object, it will have by default six sides, unless someone after that modifies it using the set sides, where was it? The set sites, etc. Okay, so this is how we initialize dice uh, using a constructor. Now, of course, we can add another constructor that accepts a parameter which describes the number of sites. You can play around with this as much as you want. Okay, so uh, as I said, you can have multiple of these constructors in the same class. Uh, you can have one that accepts parameters, one that doesn't. The requir requirements for overloading constructors are exactly the same as the requirements for overloading methods. The signature of the constructors needs to be different. So the signature of the constructor is just the name of the constructor, which is always the same, and the parameters. So either the number of parameters or the type of parameters need to be different. And that's enough for you to have different versions of constructors. Again. This is something we will explore further in uh, lessons to come. But for now, this would be enough for you to create simple objects using constructors like this one and initialize them and use their values and put them into lists and so on. Now, let's see what we can do with our newfound knowledge and solve this problem. We have students in the input and we should read until we receive the string end. Okay, and the format is the following. We have a first name, we have a last name, we have an age, and we have a hometown. 
and these are all on a single line. So on a single line, we get the first name, the last name, the age, and the home down. So pretty similar to our student class, only it isn't just a name string, it's a first name and a last name, and an age, which is probably an integer, and the hometown, which is probably a string. We don't need to be any more specific than that. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we need to create a class student and set these fields inside it. And then if we receive a student that already exists in this input, which ends at the end string, if we receive a student that already exists, we need to overwrite it. So what does it, what do we, how do we consider one student to already be existing? Well, if the student has the first, the same first name and the same last name, then it's the same student. They've just changed their age or their hometown. So this is basically a simple database, uh, a, a simple database program, which stores student in a, some type of database. In our case, it would be easiest to, for it to be a list. Okay, and then modify some of the values inside the data, that database, that list. And at the end, we even have a query to our database. So we will receive a city name, so a string uh, for the hometown, and we should iterate all students and only print those which are of a certain city. So only print the information for those students. So what would we need? So we have, we can pretty much follow whatever uh, description and business logic they have here. So we have a first name, a last name, an age, and a hometown. So we need a student class which has these fields. Let's start by that. I'll remove my student class Im implementation so we don't get confused by it. And I'll now add fields which represent the student's information. So, I, so we said we'd have a first name, we'd have a last name, we'd have, what else? an age and we'd have a hometown okay so we have these four fields how can we initialize them easily for our student class well we can create a constructor which gets these fields as parameters now instead of me writing the constructor would be which would be something like student which accepts string uh, for string first name and then string last name and so on and then saying this dot first name equals first name and this dot last name equals last name and so on instead of writing this manually here's what i can do i can say alt c code this code menu here so alt c we need to wait a bit because our code uh, because our intellij almost crashed again oh and our cursor disappeared great because why not? Anyway, uh, let's hope it gets back. Let's minimize it and yeah. So if your IntelliJ cursor disappears for some reason, minimize IntelliJ and maximize it again. Debugging, that's what we programmers do. Okay, so uh, what do we do here? We want to create a constructor. Now what I can do is either out code generate and here I can say constructor and I can mark which fields I want that constructor to initialize. And I say, okay, and look what it did. It created a public constructor for me, which accepts first name, last name, age, and hometown and sets them automatically to my fields. So IntelliJ is smart and it does stuff for you like that. Although my suggestion would be try to write them on your own for, for a start, make this, uh, make this automatic in your mind. So, you, you need to be able to write a constructor without thinking. So practice them a lot. But if you're in a hurry for some reason, like I am because we have a limited time in the lecture, uh, then in that case, well, just uh, use the generators in IntelliJ. Okay, guess what you can also generate? Uh, you press Alt and Insert, which is the shortcut for code generate. So we come over here and we press Alt and Insert or maybe it won't work. Oh yeah, it works. And now we can generate getters or setters or any of these other combinations. Now I won't generate them now because I'm not sure what I'll be needing yet. For certain I'd be needing the hometown though, right? Because I'd be, I'd have logic which says, okay, so 
if you re receive a city name and that by that city name list all people inside that city and list their first name and their last name and their age well pretty much everything so i need a getter for the hometown and i also need getters for the first name last name and age so let's generate all of them while we're at it so we go over here we press alt and insert we say getters and we want getters for everything and it generated our getters the same way we would have and again i'd suggest that you write this on your own for starters until you have it so automatic in your mind that it's just wasting time to write them manually and then start generating them like this it's good practice to be able to write getters and setters and it's pretty quick to learn so for for starters unless you're at an exam like write them on your own when you're at an exam use the auto generation of code okay so here we have the getters we won't write setters for now we'll think about how we can uh, change our objects and then we'll figure out what we can do so until when should we should we read until we reach end okay so we will have input and that input should be read piece by piece until we reach the string end. Okay, so how do we do that? Let's leave our list of students here because we would need it, but we won't be reading a count. We'd be reading with a while loop because we'd be reading until we reach the string end. Okay, so we would have the following. We would have a string which is um, input and we'd read this input. So I'd say scanner dot next which just gives me the next string i'd read the next string and i'd say while input equals end but i don't want it to be equals i want it to be not equals this is my end condition when it becomes equal to end uh, while this is true while it isn't end and i'd actually need to uh, set it with the scanner the scanner dot next value i need to put into the input uh, string okay so if the input is different than end what do i do well if it's different than end then it's the first name right so since i'm getting the input as first name last name age hometown at some point i'm going to get end so if i reach end as the first symbol and in the input uh, the first part of the input then we've ended Otherwise, it's the first name. If I have not reached the end, I've read, I've just read the first name as that input. Okay, so the first name is the input. So I can directly start creating my student object. What does the, my student object want? It wants its first name. Control P pops out this information about the parameters. So the input is my first name, the input I've just read. And my last name is scanner.next, read the next thing. And the, the age is scanner.next integer. And the hometown is scanner.next, read the next string. So read another string. And this is the student I just read from the input. Okay, now I have, let's do the simple thing. Because I have an additional uh, concept here in which if I receive a student twice, I need to overwrite it. Okay, but instead of overwriting it, I'll just add them all for for starters and then I'll figure out how to start overwriting them. So what do I do with the student? Well, I just say students.add that student. Okay, so I've read this part of the input and there's another part of the, oh, I haven't. What am I missing here? Well, I'm missing reading the input again, the, the first thing in the input again, because I've read it once, then I've read the last name, then I've read the age, then I've read uh, the hometown. And then for this loop to change, the input has to change. So I need to do another input equals scanner dot next. Just next. Next reads the next string to where that, wherever that string reaches. Now, if uh, I have them on different lines, well, that may be a problem, okay? Why, why may it be a problem? Because this next at the end will read the last string, and then after it, what would I have? I'd have a new line, maybe. Let's check it out. I'm not actually completely sure whether next would stop 
uh, add the new line or we'll just uh, read until the next actual thing different than a, uh, different than a separating character. So let's try it. Actually, I can navigate to it probably and see what it does. Uh, finds and returns the next complete token from the scanner. Complete token is preceded and followed by input that matches the delimiter pattern. What is that delimiter pattern? We don't know or we actually might find out by testing it. Okay, let's actually test it. Let's leave the code as it is. I'm not completely sure if it will work the way it is, but so what if it doesn't? Okay, let's now read the next thing from the input, which would be scanner.next, which is the search city, right? That's what they wanted us to uh, do, read a city name for which we have to search. Okay, so this is the string uh, city name for which we have to search. And now we need to print only the students which have that city. Well, that would mean that we need to iterate all of the students. So students iterate for each student in these students. After I've read the city name and know which city I want to print for, I want to print something formatted on the console system dot print f now what's that formatted thing i want to print to the console well i'll mark this code so i want these symbols over here and i want these symbols printed inside inside this formatted string and what parameters are am i going to supply well i'm going to supply student dot get first name and student dot get last name and student dot get age. Okay, so that's my formatted string. Now I just need to replace these symbols here with the appropriate formatting uh, tokens for printing the first name, last name and age. So the first name and the last name are strings. And the age is an integer meaning digits. So this is what I need to print. Now I don't need to print all of these students, I need to print only the students which what? which match the city name. So for which the hometown matches the city name, which I just read. So this is the city name I just read. And where is the hometown? Well, I say if city name, the thing I just read equals the, this students get hometown, then I I'd be printing only these students. I don't want to print any other students except the ones that have m the matching hometown. Okay. Well, now what I'm mis missing is first, let's see if this next thing wor works correctly, because it may not. Uh, I'm not sure what, would, what it would do at the end of the input. And the other thing I'm missing is overwriting existing students. But since I don't want to implement everything at once, I want to implement piece by piece. And then uh, after I'm certain that each piece works correctly, then I want to implement the other pieces, in this case, the overwriting. I'll just start the code up to here and place a breakpoint after the reading. So after the reading, I will examine my students list and see if they contain the correct values. If they don't, then I'll figure out how to fix it. Okay, so starting this, I'll stop the current execution and I'll start this execution. So my format, I can get from here. So I get first name, last name, age and hometown. Okay, so let's get this format and uh, paste it here and ju just change to something realistic. So let's say George, George GF. It's really been hard for me a lot of times to read my name in English, my family name, especially it's a weird, weird pronunciation when you go for English. Okay. So I'm 27 and my hometown is Gabrovo. Okay. So, and I'll even copy this so I can reuse it for another student for which I'll just change the name. Okay, so I press enter and then immediately I'll press end. Okay, so let's see if I read correctly. So the input here got to end. Let's see if the student, if the students list contains me. Okay, first name George Georgiev, age 27, hometown Gabriel. Okay, this looks correct. Okay, let's test it again with two students because two students might mess something up. Uh, starting the code, pasting my information and I'll press uh, and I'll add somewhere else. Peter Peterson. 
and let's say he's 92 from somewhere. No, from uh, the middle of nowhere. And he's named not uh, Peter but Courage. And I won't, I won't name it any further because I'll infringe copyright in some way. But you probably got the idea of what I'm trying to input. Okay, so ending the input here, let's see if the students are correct. So the first student I already know is correct because I saw it in the previous uh, attempt. And in this, uh, whether, let's see whether the first student is correct. Well, first name is Courage, okay, that's correct. Last name is Peterson, that's correct. The age is 92, which is also correct. And the hometown is the middle of nowhere. Okay, that works. Okay, so let's continue on from here. Uh, what does the code want? Well, it expects me to enter a city name. So let's see if I list Gabrovo, Gabrovo, whether it would correctly list all of these uh, students which have Gabrovo, which is in this case only one student. Okay, so I press enter and I see George Georgiev is 27 years old. And I notice that again, I've forgotten the new line here. But otherwise the code is correct. Okay, so I managed to read uh, students from the console. I managed to print the ones of them that have a specific hometown. And what's left is to have logic which replaces uh, the information if a student repeats itself. So if I get myself again, if I get George again, and George changes its uh, city to Sofia, then I need to have George Georgiev change its city to Sofia in the data store, in the list of students. Okay, how do I do that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. I just need to find the student. And if that student exists, then I change them. I, I overwrite them with the new student. So what I do is if, it's actually not an if, it's I want to iterate all the students. And if the student already exists, I need to replace it. Otherwise, I need to add it. So I'll do the following. I can do a loop which sets a Boolean variable, which tells me if the student was found in the list. But then I need to search for them again, because you know searching for them again would yield the index at which they are, so I can overwrite them. Instead of that, I do the following. Int index of the student. So student index equals minus one. So minus one isn't a valid index, right? What I'm doing here is I'll start a for loop starting from i equals zero to i less than uh, students dot size. And now what I'll do is I'll say uh, if the student at this position, let's say uh, this is the check student, the student I'm checking, students dot give me that student students dot give me the student at that index so this is the check student and now i'm checking uh, if the check student uh, if their first name equals the student i just read from the console's first name get first name and the check student's last name equals the student I just read from the console's last name. If those, if both of these are true, then what I do is I'd say the student index equals uh, the index at which I'm at currently. So what am I doing? I'm initializing a student index that is invalid. However, while iterating the existing students, I check whether some of those students has the same first name and last name as the student I just read from the console. And if that's true, then that student index will change to the index. So student index will change from to something from zero to students.size minus one, one of these. So at this point, if my student index is uh, still equal to minus one, then I haven't, haven't found a match. So I just need to add the new student. However, if my student index isn't different, uh, isn't minus one, meaning that the student index is either zero or one or so on until students dot size minus one, 
then I need to replace that student. So I'd say students at that position, so set that position, which is the student index, to the new student that has been read from the console. So I overwrite the existing student with the new student I just read from the console instead of copying the student at the end of the input. Okay, so that's one way to, uh, one way to solve this task and I'll show, an, show you another way before we end this lesson. So let's input the data. Here's George, here's uh, Courage Peterson and now I'll input George again and I'll place end here and I'll uh, ask for it to list uh, the number of students with Gabrovo. If my filtering was correct, uh, I if my checks were correct, that is, I'd only see one George Georgiev in Gabrovo. Okay, so enter now. George Georgiev is 27 years old. Okay, great. So now let's do a change. Let's start it again and see if, if this uh, part of the logic changes. So let's say George Georgiev Gabrovo and now George Georgiev with the age of 28, let's say I had a birthday, which I didn't have yet, luckily, because I don't want to be 28 yet, I'm not ready for that. But uh, in this case, what would happen, what we expect to happen, is when I try to list students in Gabrovo, I'd see George Georgiev 28, not 27. Okay, let's see if that works. And, and now I say Gabrovo, press enter, and yes, George Georgiev got changed to 28 years old. Now, a different solution to this task, instead of using indices, I could do the, the following. I could create a student, which is, um, let's say this is found student, because I found it in the data store, and I'll set it to no. And instead of setting the index, I'd say the found student equals the check student. So this is, and I, I by the way, I need, I need a break here, correct? It's not really necessary, but if I add the break here, that's uh, true for the index search as well. If I add the break here, I'll save some uh, operations which I don't need. I don't need this for loop to run uh, to check all the students. At the moment it sees a student which matches, it needs to stop there because there can't be another student that matches because we always uh, replace matching students. Okay, so notice what I'm doing here. I'm setting a found student which is equal to no any object You've seen this from strings, but any object, uh, student, list, uh, string, uh, local date, and so on, can be set to no. This means it has no value. This means you can't access fields of it or anything. It's just a representation of a lack of value. So nothing exists here. And here I say, okay, if I find, if I, if I find him, make this found student point to the check student, meaning point to whichever student index was in students.size. So now I'm accessing, now I'm pointing to the student itself. Remember that, like we had for methods, there are value types and reference types. Value types are all integers and doubles and floats and so on. However, uh, strings and arrays and lists and other objects like this one are reference types, meaning that when I do this, I'm not getting a copy here, I'm getting the same object. So I'm pointing to the same object. This becomes just an alias of this object, a pseudonym. So this would point to the check student. So the original one that's inside the list. And now what can I do? I can say, okay, if found student equals no, just add the new student, right? Because nothing changes. Okay. So no, not that nothing changes, but no, we haven't found anyone. So this student, which we're, we've just added is unique. However, if the found student isn't no, what we can do is instead of replacing the entire object in the list, we can do the following. We can say the found student dot set name. And now we don't have a setter. So let's add that setter. Let's insert two setters for uh, actually not name. What what do we change? The name and the first name and the last name are the same. So what do we need to change? We need to change the age and the hometown. So I insert setters for both of these, and now I say found student dot set set age, and I get the student I just read's age. 
and I do the same for hometown. Found student set hometown and I use the student I just read from the inputs get hometown. So this will do the exact same thing. Even though we're not replacing an item in the list, we're just accessing an existing item in that list by its reference because it's a reference data type. So this thing points to the original inside students uh, at the appropriate index and this changes that item directly instead of replacing it with a new item. So this is another way you can do this. This is another way you can uh, you can overwrite the values. Instead of overwriting the entire object, you just change the values of the existing object. And this code will do the exact same thing which we had previously. Let's copy the input, start it again, and paste it back into the console. Pasting it here, pressing enter, George Georgiev is 28 years old. As we expected, we changed the object instead of inserting a new one. Okay, so that's the task I wanted to solve with you and I also demonstrated how you can uh, change uh, objects and look for objects in lists. And actually this is something pretty common. Uh, a lot of programming, like pre pretty much 50% of programming in the real, real world, is just looking for objects in some data store or another, like our list, or another data store storage type like a map, a set or something else, looking for objects, finding them as quickly as possible, changing something with, of their values or removing them or um, inserting something in their place or inserting something around them or uh, using their value or changing their value and so on. But a lot of software development is just looking through lists of objects or other data structures of objects and accessing them by some characteristic of that object or another. So this is a basic, a basic overview of what objects are. There's a lot more to learn about object-oriented programming and we've just scratched the surface, but scratching the surface like this allows you to study more about objects and classes at home if you wish, or to practice more of what we uh, did here and practice it again and again until it becomes second nature to you. So you can get comfortable with creating objects and using them and passing them around in methods and so on. So this is just an introduction and we will be using them uh, in the following lectures and we will get to know them a bit better by just seeing them in different contexts. But this should be enough for now for you to uh, use them efficiently. So what do we know up to this point that classes define, I'd call them blueprints for objects. And these blueprints consist of fields, of constructors, of properties, and of methods. Now, properties here is just um, fields combined with their getters and setters. That's what we mean by properties. And these objects, which uh, the classes instantiate, so using the blueprints from a class, we create objects. And these objects have a state. That state is just the value which has the names set by the class. So an object has fields, these fields have values, and that's what we call the object state. That state can change using setters and, uh, and other methods or just by directly accessing the fields of the object. And these objects are just instances of classes the same ways that variables are instances of data types. And that's all we needed to discuss for today. I hope this was useful for you. Don't forget to ask your questions in all the communications ch channels we've offered to you and see you again next time.